Section 13 of The American Book of the Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joshua Dickey. The American Book of the Dog, G. O. Shields, Editor. Section 13 The Russian Wolfhound, or Barzoi, by William Wade. In beginning an article on this breed, the question of a bystander, why, what do you know about that breed, is most pertinent. I really do not know anything about them in the sense that a rider on other breeds is supposed to know of the breed he has under consideration. But the consolation in this case is that, little as I know, nobody else knows much more. The breed has never been, in this country or in England, a regularly recognized one, with points and characteristics well-defined and authoritatively established. It may be aptly said that the Russian wolfhound, or Barzoi, is an immense greyhound in conformation, with all the elegance of contour of that grand animal, but much larger. The chief distinguishing feature of this breed is the coat, which is long, fine, dense, and should be flat although many specimens have a roughness or waviness of coat suggestive of a deerhound cross. That it is true that there is no definite, fixed type of the breed, even in Russia, is incidentally shown by Mr. A. J. Rousseau of St. Petersburg in the London Fancier's Gazette of February 7, 1890. He says that Russian breeders have been trying for 75 years to divide the two types, the long and short-haired dogs, and that in spite of their endeavors, puppies of either type will come in one litter. This is simply confessing the most lamentable incapacity of the Russian breeders, for English breeders have revolutionized pointers, setters, spaniels, and terriers in much less time than this, and have actually created the race of bull terriers from the incongruous elements of the waspish Old English Terrier and the Bulldog. As there is every probability of the Russian wolfhound being taken up in real earnest in England, a few years will doubtless see the development of a recognized fixed type. And until this is done, the only type to be considered is the dog of power, elegance, and beauty, viewed in the light of commonly accepted requirements, which are found, in some degree, in all good breeds of dogs. General features such as size, build, coat, and color seem to be about the extent of the requirements of a specimen. In Russian wolfhounds, therefore, only characteristics applicable to all breeds of dogs are of weight in forming an opinion of any particular specimen. Thus, for a long coat, on a dog that is at all of greyhound type, it is plainly requisite that it be flat. A rough or shaggy coat is evidently incongruous. The same as to head. The dog belongs to the greyhound family and must have a long, clean, narrow head, great strength and arch of loin, depth and capacity of chest, firmness of feet, muscle and forearm and hindquarters, length and carriage of tail. Well-bent hocks and an absence of all useless lumber are plainly requirements of the breed. As to the history of this breed, there seems to be no authentic records. The Book of the Dog by Vero Shaw is the first work in English that mentions them. Their uses seem to be, in general, those of the greyhound. Mr. Rousseau was disposed to resent the application of the name of wolfhound to them, saying that they were used for coursing hares and chasing foxes, and were in no sense wolfhounds. However, the industry of Mr. F. Freeman Lloyd disinterred pictures of the breed showing them in combat with a wolf, with the wolf at bay, a huntsman astride of it, holding it by the ears while an assistant cut its throat. This acrobatic performance was so hard to swallow that it raised a storm of criticism, which resulted in bringing out evidence that the feat was actually practiced. It seems probable that in the more settled districts of Russia, where wolves are extinct, the dog is used for coursing hares only, while in the wilder district, where wolves are still to be found, these dogs are used for hunting them. Certainly it would indicate a lack of judgment on the part of the Russians if they did not use a breed so particularly fitted for wolf hunting in that sport. This dog having the speed, power, and courage for the task. As confirmatory of the opinion that they are so used, I note the report of a coursing match near St. Petersburg 
given in the fancier's gazette of london in december eighteen eighty nine wherein it is stated that after coursing hares for some time the gameness of the dogs was tried on wolves with the result that a single bitch chased caught and threw a dog wolf and with all due respect for the cracks among greyhounds and deerhounds i do not believe that one of them can be produced capable of duplicating the last part of this performance unless russian wolves have degenerated from the standard of power and ferocity with which they were credited in our early days the correspondent of the fancier's gazette arrived at the conclusion however that the russian dogs would stand no chance whatever with an english greyhound in coursing and this has always been the opinion of the most competent and impartial observers in england whether the russian dog be he greyhound or wolfhound is the dog wanted in the far west for hunting wolves or not it is certain that there is one use for which he is preeminently fitted i e as the chien de lieu no other breed combines elegance speed and power to the same degree the mastiff has the power and disposition for an efficient guard and companion but lacks the speed and elegance notwithstanding his distinguished dignity the same is true of the st bernard and also of the newfoundland the boarhound may have the speed and doubtless has the power and the finer drawn specimens have a certain degree of elegance but there is an expression of ferocity on their faces that unfits them for companions especially of ladies with all his elegance and speed the greyhound lacks the appearance of power and the deerhound has such an air of roughness that elegance seems an impossible attribute in each and every one of these particulars the russian dog is super excellent and there is a particularly aristocratic high-bred look about the dog that can be more easily realized than described as the companion of a well-dressed woman in her walks in the park or country or as the finishing off of a handsome span of horses i can imagine nothing to equal this dog a most important qualification to this statement is provided the temper of the particular animal be trustworthy in this matter there is great diversity czar and ivan two well-known specimens in this country are perfect demons in temper toward other dogs while elsie is gentle and peaceable to a fault i fancy that russian breeding tends to develop the savagery in the breed while english breeding will draw out the gentle peaceable traits generally characteristic of all english breeds of dogs the pictures of czar and elsie fairly represent in a general way one type of the breed one that might be called the setter greyhound type czar's being a good likeness of the dog while elsie shows much more bone and less muscle and quarters than she really has neither picture does justice to the coats czar's being much smoother with the commonest grooming and elsie's being scant on account of low condition czar is a powerful well-made dog about twenty-nine or thirty inches at the shoulder but hardly as long in the back as other specimen i have seen in which point elsie shows an extreme development and an undesirable one czar was selected at the jardin de Climachon as an unusually fine specimen and elsie was selected by mr f freeman lloyd in england as the most promising brood bitch he could find either in england paris or brussels in opromiote who was recently illustrated in the american field we have a totally different type the stilty chucked up appearance the absurdly small head and short neck the shaggy coat and drooping nose being most marked and it is simply a matter of taste as to which of these diverse types shall be considered the correct one opromiote being the property of a russian grand duke may be supposed to be the russian ideal of the correct thing but i fancy that occidental taste will scarcely approve this selection this however is a matter for future determination the defects commonly objected to in nearly all specimens of the breed are bad carriage of tail many carrying it in sickle fashion away up in the air most uncharacteristic of the greyhound family wavy and even shaggy coats coarseness of coat it should be the very finest of the fine so that when the dog is in motion it actually waves in the wind and of course the bad hawks quarters and feet that occasionally occur in any breed 
some greyhound men in england have cited that unusual length of body as an objection to some specimens but from all i can gather this is a tolerably common characteristic of the breed if not accompanied with extra muscular strength of loin this extra length is certainly an objection but in most of the specimens I have seen, this muscular development was so marked a feature that no weakness was the result, while it certainly adds to the elegant appearance of the dog. Another decided blemish is the drooping nose, i.e. one not parallel with the general line of head in profile. This fault was conspicuous in the case of Opromote, and was noticeable in the dog rival and bitch Zeri shown at the New York show of 1890. It cannot be a characteristic of the breed in general, as the illustration of Tsar and Elsie show fairly level heads, while the dog Ivan Romanoff, the winner at New York in 1890, was much like Elsie in this respect. The greater elegance of the level line of profile is too obvious to need further remark. It is highly probable that the importation and breeding of these handsome, stately dogs will increase, and that the breed will soon attain the popularity in this country that it so richly deserves. End of section 13. Recording by Joshua Dickey. Section 14 of the American Book of the Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. The American Book of the Dog, G.O. Shields, Editor, Section 14, The Beagle Hound, by Herman F. Schlohas, Pius H. Through a miry swamp and wooded vale, the beagles run the cotton tail. The hounds give tongue, the welkin rings. Tis music fit for lords or kings. The beagle is undoubtedly one of the oldest breeds of dogs in existence. As in the case of most of the old breeds, its origin is unknown. In examining the various prominent works on the dog, we find frequent reference to the beagle. During the times of George IV, and Queen Elizabeth, and in one instance at least, Shakespeare mentions it. This breed is also spoken of in The Sportsman's Cabinet, an old English work published in 1803, and in other old works, and from the descriptions there given it seems to have been in form and character the same as it is today. While, as remarked, the origin of the breed is lost in obscurity, it was unquestionably derived by selection and evolved from the ordinary foxhound, the latter having been bred down until the desired size was obtained. The true beagle is, as designated in the standard, a miniature foxhound. Of all the breeds of field dogs used in this country, the beagle, the most musical of the hound family, has unquestionably advanced the most in favor and standing with the sportsman. This is partly owing to the fact that comparatively few of our sportsmen had seen him at home on the trail of a rabbit, as we commonly call our hares, and as a result his good qualities and value as a field companion were unknown, and consequently could not be appreciated. His having advanced so fast of late in favor and appreciation is partly due to the natural order of events, in that as certain parts of the country become thickly settled, and the feathered game exterminated, lovers of field sports, who have heretofore devoted their time in the field to bird shooting over setters, pointers, and spaniels, finding the game so nearly exterminated as to destroy the pleasure of seeking it, discard their bird dogs in favor of the beagle, for so prolific is the natural game of this hound, the rabbit and hare, that even in the immediate vicinity of the largest cities, one can usually find enough of it to furnish a joyous day's sport afield. The writer can cite several instances where, as stated above, the bird dogs have been discarded and a small pack of beagles taken in their place, for the reasons advanced. He also knows of a place nearly in the heart of the city of Brooklyn 
where some wild hares have found their way and located. He can name several spots within a half hour's walk of the above-mentioned place, where hares are to be found and where, by not hunting them with the gun, but by merely listening to the music of the hounds, he has been able to employ many an hour's sport and to break in his young puppies as at dewy eve. He has sat, watched, and listened to them as with their musically clear and flute-like notes and with ears that sweep away the evening dew and voices matched like bells. They trailed the little cotton tails. It is but a few years since any nondescript mongrel that would run a rabbit was called a beagle, and when we speak of rabbit dogs, we have to admit that popularly considered, that includes all the small mongrel dogs in existence whose owners imagine, or have been told, will trail a hare. While, as remarked above, the beagle is an old breed, it cannot be said that, except in a few instances, we have bred this hound in our country systematically until within the last few years. The lamented late General Richard Rowett a number of years ago developed a strain so well and favorably known, both for their field and show qualities, that they came to be generally known as the Rowett Hound. The imported hounds Sam, Dolly, and Warrior were to the Rowett Hounds what Ponto, Maul, and Pilot were to the famous Laverack Setters, the foundation of the strain. Mr. N. Elmore, a number of years ago, also imported several good beagles, including his famous Ringwood, now dead, from which he bred many of our most prominent hounds. These two strains, together with some other blood to which Mr. Pottinger Dorsey has bred, form the nucleus of the blood we have in our beagle. It remained, however, for the American Beagle Club, formerly the American English Beagle Club, organized in 1884, to create an impetus among the admirers of the breed and bring the merits of the little hound before such of the sportsmen as were not aware of its value. Several of our most prominent beagle breeders met and formed the above-named club. A committee was appointed to draft a standard. Bench shows were requested to provide suitable classes where previously only one or two and perhaps no classes at all had been assigned the breed. Special prizes were offered by the club to stimulate competition and show managers were requested to appoint as judges men who were especially interested in the breed rather than men who perhaps had never seen a beagle at work and consequently could not know from a practical standpoint what is required of one to make it an ideal working hound. The result is that the different shows have adopted the standard of the said club, invites its members to judge, and where the entries at the principal shows had previously consisted of one or two mediocre specimens, and perhaps as many nondescripts, under the plea that they were rabbit dogs, the quality of the classes is now on fully as high a plane as that of any of the other breeds of field dogs exhibited, and our breeders are now breeding them as carefully and as true to type as any other breed of field dogs is bred. The entries at the prominent shows now number in the 30s and 40s, where formerly all types and sizes were represented, the classes now exhibit an evenness heretofore unseen. The scene at the Westminster Kennel Club New York show in 1888, when the open dog class of beagles was being judged, was such that it will not soon be forgotten by the writer, nor many other fanciers of the beagle who witnessed it. The class consisted of some 15 or more hounds, every one of them I believe worthy a mention, and all of them hounds which a few years since would have been capable of winning first prizes or championship honors at any of our shows. They exhibited such a marked similarity of type and size that I remarked to my friend Mr. S. T. Hammond while looking them over that one might well suppose they were representatives of a single pack 
which had been selected by their owner to represent his type, whereas the hounds present represented drafts from several different kennels. The manner in which they appeared is as vivid in the mind of the writer as though the scene was occurring at the present instant, so fascinating was it. It was indeed a beautiful sight, and one long to be remembered. As handsome a pack of beagles as ever graced a show ring, all of working size, and all looking as though thoroughbred workers and fielders, all showing as beautiful hound character as any pack of foxhounds could, in fact they looked and carried themselves like a pack of miniature foxhounds. Such is the style of the beagle one meets nowadays at our shows and in kennels of admirers of the breed, in contrast to the beagles of all sizes and types found a few years since in our shows and kennels. Several of our prominent sportsmen here in the East have packs of various sizes, while a large number have one or more hounds. To show how wonderfully the beagle has increased in popular favor with us during the last few years, it is only necessary to say that the writer has, during the past four years, collected a list of some 900 names of individuals owning beagles. Here follows approximately two and a half pages of the names of breeders and kennels and owners who were prominent at the time of the writing of this book. The writer also prides himself in his own kennel, in which he usually has eight or ten or more beagles. It is scarcely possible to bestow too much praise on this little hound, which has advanced more in popularity during the last few years among sportsmen in this country than has any other breed of field dogs. This is the natural result of our sportsmen becoming familiar by degrees with the value of this hound for field purposes. As civilization encroaches upon the haunts of the fox and the deer, causing them to decrease in numbers, sportsmen, who have heretofore hunted them with large hounds, discover that as this game grows scarce it is better hunted with the beagle. Colonel F. G. Skinner, than whom no more ardent sportsman or hound man is to be found among us, always advocates the beagle in preference to fox or other hounds for foxes and deer in sections where they are scarce or are hunted to the gun and for foxes when hunted with the gun as in the northern and new england states this is owing to the fact that not being so fast as the larger hounds they give better opportunity for shots and particularly where the game is scarce they do not frighten it so as to drive it far away to remain perhaps for days as the larger hounds do dr downey of maryland and his friends always use their beagles in preference to larger hounds when they go on their annual deer hunt to West Virginia. Thus it will be seen that the beagle is not only growing in popularity as we become more intimately acquainted with his value, but it is also in the natural order of events for him to grow in favor with us as game becomes scarcer. Although the beagle is too slow for fox hunting in some parts of the country as, for instance, in the south, it is also used with success for that sport, and preferred by many to a larger hound in localities where the foxes are hunted to the gun, for reasons herein later explained. The writer was some time ago informed by an acquaintance residing in Virginia that in order to satisfy some friends of the ability of his beagles to kill a red fox, he took his pack of hounds under 15 inches in height with an old foxhound to start them on the trail, and soon started a fox. Being stationed himself on a hill, he was able to watch the entire hunt, and after a run of several hours, the beagles caught and killed the fox, while the old foxhound was not in at the death. I cite this instance because many claim that the beagle would be entirely useless in a fox hunt. The beagle is also used for hunting the large white hare, Lepus virginianus, which abounds in some parts of this country. A friend of the writer residing in Rhode Island, who has one of the largest and best packs of beagles in the country, hunted these hares with his pack last winter, 
but says that while the sport is exciting, it is not so much so as hunting the ordinary cottontail, Lepus americanus. This is for the reason that the large hare circles much farther off than the latter, running often miles before returning and consequently taking the hounds a greater part of the time out of the hearing and sight of the hunters. Anyone residing in any of our large cities can, if he have a sufficient amount of the instincts of the backwoodsman to make him worthy of the name of a sportsman, find spots by prospecting, as it were, where he can, almost any day, take his beagles and give them a chance to do some trailing. If such persons will do as the writer does, and not shoot these hares or allow their hounds to kill them, but look upon them in the light of prized jewels. They can have many an hour's sport at dusk or after business hours with their beagles. The writer recently had marked down a small patch of woods within fifty minutes' walk of his home, which had a solitary hare in it nearly the entire season, and which has afforded many an hour's sport for him and his beagles. A few such hares, carefully protected, may afford sport for a whole season. While the customary way of hunting the hare with beagles is for the sportsman to stand at runways or likely places where the hare will come when brought round by the hounds and shoot it as it passes, others again do not use the gun at all, but let the hounds run the hare down and kill it. The beagle is the superior of the basset in that it can get over a rough country much easier and is not so extremely slow as the latter, and, being a smaller dog, does not require the room or amount of food that the latter does. The same amount of room and cooking, the latter no small item as far as inconvenience, work, and expense are concerned, that will keep a couple of foxhounds, will easily keep five or six beagles. Where one has several hounds, the latter points are of no little importance. It will readily be seen that the beagle is undoubtedly the best general utility hound we have. While it is beyond the means of the average American sportsman to keep a large kennel of bird dogs and have them all broken as they should be, it is but comparatively little expense to keep a pack of beagles all broken for field use. In some portions of this country, particularly the South as well as in England, large packs of beagles are to be found owned and maintained by sportsmen for their private enjoyment. One of the greatest pleasures of the practical sportsman is in showing himself a practical breeder, for to possess the knowledge and ability to become such is no small honor. To do this, one must have at least several dogs of the breed he is interested in, in his kennel. And as remarked above, if he have such a kennel, he has use for all his stock in the field. The amount of pleasure derived from his kennel by the writer is in proportion to the number of dogs or hounds in it, and few sportsmen care to have in their kennel more dogs than they have use for. This, as I say, illustrates the advantage of one's being partial to hounds. Outside of his qualities as a field dog, the beagle is a desirable house companion. Not over large, short-coated, and affectionate, he is a most desirable and lovable companion. If educated to it, he is an excellent watchdog. In my kennel I have always found them exceptionally quiet and peaceable. I have always allowed them to remain loose and sleep as they liked, half a dozen or more in one bed, and they were invariably quiet and friendly to one another, while my neighbors, setters, pointers, and other dogs are constantly noisy and frequently quarrelsome. It is claimed by some people who are not fully acquainted with their good qualities that hounds are lacking in affection and are given to fighting. As regards the beagle, I am pleased to state that such is not the case. They are fully as affectionate and companionable as my setters, spaniels, or pointers. As I now write, my chair is surrounded by several of these little hounds, comfortably stretched out in repose. Every few moments, one or another gets up, places its feet on my lap and gazes at me pleadingly as it mutely seeks a kind word or slyly pokes its nose against my elbow as a more efficacious way of attracting attention as some of the singular-looking hieroglyphics on the manuscript 
will allow the printer to attest. At the same time, another one, jealous of the attention shown the former, is sure to come forward and endeavor to push the other one away in order to have all the attention shown itself, and thus throughout the evening they are constantly making their presence known. My melody lies nestled beside me, always insisting on her right to a place, while I am constantly compelled to help the other hounds, including trailer, riot, music, trinket, and others, down time and time again as they claim their right to my attention. As for fighting, while I have known setters to kill one another in a fight in their kennel, I have never known of a single instance where my beagles have fought among themselves. Although they run together all day and sleep together in their kennel at night, unchained. As to breeding, it is generally believed by beagle fanciers that the progeny usually have a tendency to grow larger than their dam. It is therefore considered advisable to breed to a dam smaller than the sire and smaller than the size it is desired to obtain in the progeny. Beagles, generally speaking, require but little training to make them good workers. They take to their work naturally, and if given plenty of patience on game while young, they will, with experience, become self-trained. If kept in the country where they may run loose and roam about by themselves as they grow up, they are liable to wander off from their kennel and to hunt on their own account. They soon become accustomed to the ways and tricks of the bunny and learn to follow and circumvent him. If you do not let your puppies run loose, but wish to train them yourself, you may take them out with one or two steady, well-trained old hounds, and the youngsters will soon learn to follow and imitate them. Go out, if possible, about daylight or dusk when the dew is falling. Then you are more apt to find the hares moving, and as a result warmer trails will then be found than at other times. I lead my puppies to a spot where I think I will be most likely to find the hares, and then quietly take as comfortable a seat as I can find, on a stump or fence rail or elsewhere, and leave the puppies to their own resources. Being thus assured that you have no intention of moving away, and not having their thoughts drawn from what is instinctively bred in them, namely the desire to hunt, they will devote their whole attention to the finding of game. When thus giving the puppies their first experience, allow the older hounds to catch and kill the hare, as an incentive to the youngers to hunt more ambitiously for the next one. After taking your puppies out thus with a good working old dog a few times, they will take readily to the work and will soon develop into efficient workers. It is believed by some breeders of beagles that they are more subject to worms than most breeds. My experience has been that they almost invariably have them. Last year I bred and raised what was probably, without exception, the smallest grown beagle in this country, it standing in height only about seven to eight inches and weighing about four pounds. This beagle was proportionately small before weaning. When some eight weeks old and before weaned, it passed several large bunches of worms, and nearly all the puppies I have ever raised have been afflicted with these pests. I have always considered santonine to be the most efficacious and at the same time the safest remedy for worms in puppies. My mode of administering it is to give a dose each morning a short time before feeding for five days. Dose for a puppy, say, ten weeks old, two grains. It may be given in about a teaspoonful of milk or in a little butter. The former is more convenient and the puppy usually is more sure of swallowing the santonine. After the last dose, I give a physic composed of about one teaspoonful of castor oil, the same amount of syrup, not extract, of buckthorn, with two or three drops of turpentine added. It must be borne in mind that any treatment for worms is useless unless the medicine be administered on an empty stomach. The plan being to have the worms feed on the drug, which is poisonous to them. Regarding preparing beagles for the bench, it should be remembered that as the standard calls for a coarse instead of fine coat in texture, the novice should not endeavor to get the coat as is done with most other breeds, 
in as fine a condition as possible one of the characteristic faults of beagles is their tendency to being too slack in loin therefore if your hound is unduly slack in loin do not have it too low in flesh it would in such a case be better to have it over full in flesh the former condition aggravates in appearance the fault mentioned while the latter tends to cover it up i predict that as the worth of the beagle becomes better and more widely known and appreciated and as the natural order of events causes him to become the field dog best adapted to the circumstances that are sure to exist particularly in the settled localities of the east and the north he will grow greater in popular favor than any of the other breeds of field dogs as the ruffled grouse or partridge the woodcock bob white and the various other game birds become practically exterminated as they do in those parts of the country which become thickly settled our sportsmen find themselves compelled to go hundreds and even thousands of miles to find the amount of good shooting they had previously been accustomed to enjoy this requires a longer purse and a greater amount of leisure than the great majority of them possess and consequently they have to adapt themselves to the circumstances and either forego their sport or seek game which has not as great an antipathy to civilization thick settlements and man as our game birds have the eastern sportsmen will therefore in future have recourse to our little short-legged long-eared friend and will enjoy his outing just as well as erstwhile he did when his setter or pointer led him through the fields in selecting a beagle for field use one should of course look to those points of the most practical value probably the first matter to be considered is the question of size this of course the buyer must decide for himself whether he be governed by experience fancy or the advice of others next to the question of size he should bear in mind that quality more important than speed endurance in order to obviate too great speed in a beagle the standard limits of size of them in height to 15 inches as in hunting the natural game of the beagle the hare only a low rate of speed is desired and when using the beagle for fox and deer hunting the object partly is to avoid the greater speed of the foxhound or deerhound the weak points in the beagle which seem to be characteristic of the breed but which should be overcome by judicious mating and breeding are an inclination to snippiness and to being long cast in the loin the ideal beagle cannot be better described than by quoting from the standard a miniature foxhound solid and big for his inches with the wear and tear look of the dog that can last in the chase and follow his quarry to the death it is needless to say that a short or at least a strong loin is of far more importance in a hound than in a bird dog from the nature of his calling as stated above fully as important a point is the one of selecting a hound having good legs and feet this is very important point in a bird dog and much more so in a hound a beagle should be selected having well arched toes and the same close together with good hard pads underneath a foot after the model of a cat's foot is to be preferred to what is known as a hare foot so called from its similarity to the foot of a hare in noting a beagle's feet and legs it is also very important to get a good short and upright pastern as the same is much stronger and can stand much more wear and tear than a long or sloping one besides the latter is usually indicative of a hare foot or more properly speaking a hare foot from its shape causes the pastern to slope and be comparatively long in a setter or pointer a sloping pastern is desired to avoid the great strain upon it in suddenly stopping on a point and which strain on a straight pastern would cause the same to knuckle over but in a hound the short straight pastern is greatly to be preferred as far stronger and more enduring the hound from the nature of his work not needing to subject himself to such a strain as mentioned regarding the bird dog next in importance i should consider a good coat which is coarse and of good length 
This is the most important factor as, from the nature of his work, the Beagle is compelled to hunt almost entirely in the thickest of underbrush, which, unless he be well coated, will tear his skin and flesh in a cruel manner, and though he possesses the grit and pluck which causes him to apparently not mind it while keeping to his work, the poor faithful servant suffers for days until he recovers, and in the meantime is in no condition to hunt if it is desired of him. To show how thoroughly and comb-like the briars and brush work through a beagle's coat in ordinary hunting, one needs but to notice any beagle with a fair amount of white on him when he starts out to hunt, and no matter how dirty and soiled his coat may be, it requires but a short hunt to make his coat look as neat and clean as though he had a thorough washing. When hunting, I have often practically convinced my friends of the same, using as an illustration a certain hound. This dog, which has a good deal of white on him, keeps his coat always dirty. After hunting some little time, he will have the appearance of having just been washed. I recently received a letter from a gentleman, a stranger who had a short time previously become interested in beagles. He informed me that he had theories of his own in regard to breeding, whereby he thought he could breed a beagle for practical use and at the same time have it show more beauty points than the beagle bred to the standard of the American Beagle Club as given herein. He wanted a short, fine, silky coat and asked for my views in the matter. Regarding the coat, I gave them practically as above stated. A short time afterward, I received another letter from him from which I quote verbatim for the benefit of any such as may be inclined as he was. Dear Sir, I thank you very much for your extended reply to my suggestion about breeding beagles a little finer. My notion was that they could be bred to look more stylish without detracting from their field qualities. But I have no more to say. A hunt I had yesterday demonstrated the absolute correctness of the present standard. I think I shall have to tell you of it. An old hunting friend of mine here in Maryland has a strain of beagles he is very proud of, and we had a pair of them, one rough-coated fellow, and a pair of year-old youngsters hardly broken. He says his are Scotch beagles, whatever that may be. They are very small, say six pounds each, and have fine short hair and their skin, little beauties to look at. In an open country, they do very well. Yesterday we were on one of my father's farms near the river, which is full of briar patches and briary thickets. The rabbits are plentiful, but the little Scotchmen were literally worthless. In an hour they were cut up and came to heel, absolutely refusing to work. The one with a dense coat and a brush on his tail, followed by the brace of puppies, had to do all the hunting the rest of the day. He dodged in and out of the briars without getting a mark, while the blood from the rat-tailed brace made them look as if their throats had been cut. Hereafter I stand by the American Beagle Club's standard. My friend's faith was shaken, and he wants a brush-tailed pedigree dog to try on his bishes as an experiment. He lives in a better cultivated end of the country and had not tried his much in briars before. Since the briar farms are the natural refuge of the rabbits and afford the best sport, he sees that a tougher hound is more useful. The day's experience was so exactly a corroboration of your letter, I quite enjoy giving it to you. Very truly. End quote. Also, to avoid having your beagle cut up more than can be avoided, it is well to select one having a low and well-set ear, and, as called for by the standard, quote, closely framing and interned to the cheek, close quote. The best hung ears will spread out considerably when the hound is running, and a poorly hung and high-set one will be greatly exposed to all the briars and thorns within reach. Do not merely have in mind an ear of great length. The shape of the nose or muzzle is, of course, no positive indication of the scenting powers of its possessor, but it is well to always choose the hound having a wide muzzle 
and good and open, moist nostrils. The same usually be indicative of fine scenting powers. A more important factor in a hound for rabbit or hare hunting than any other. I cannot say that I agree with the standard in preferring a full and prominent eye as called for, for the same reason that a fine soft coat and exposed ear is not desired. Personally, I prefer an eye somewhat protected and not as exposed as the one called for, as my experience has taught me that too full and prominent an eye is easily injured. While personally, as far as beauty is concerned, I admire a black and tan coat as giving a beagle decidedly the appearance of being a miniature foxhound, I consider it desirable and prefer for work a hound having plenty of white on him, as this enables one to readily see him at a distance. Beagles, like other hounds, are not specially obedient as to coming in when called particularly when there appear any prospects of soon getting started on a warm trail, and one can often locate his hounds if they possess a fair amount of white, when otherwise they could not be seen and one can then get them, if desired, when otherwise he could not. As I stated above, the question of size is one on which there is a diversity of opinion. I shall not argue the question here or give my views either for or against the large or small beagle, but will say for the benefit of the novice or inexperienced who may contemplate purchasing beagles that it is usually a safe method when lacking practical knowledge or experience to be governed by the choice of what the majority would prefer or select. The great majority of our practical beagle men who use their beagles for field purposes such as the late General Rowett, Pottinger Dorsey, F.C. Phoebus of the Somerset Kennels, A.H. Wakefield, Lewis Smith, Dr. C.E. Nichols, W.F. Rutter, W.S. Clark, George Lake, and others prefer what is comparatively speaking the large beagle. By that is commonly meant a beagle close in height to the limit allowed by the American Beagle Club standard, 15 inches. The writer himself prefers this last mentioned type of hound and contends that where a hound of a certain speed is desired, it is preferable to obtain it in a comparatively large hound than in a smaller one, as the former necessarily will be built more on the lines of endurance than those of speed while the latter will be built more on the lines of speed than endurance, and while the desired speed is obtained in either, the former will combine it with the greater endurance and staying powers, a most important requisite in a hound. Thus, if a 12-inch and 15-inch hound are bred to hunt at about a certain pace, the latter must be a hound of more substance and bottom than the former, or it will be the speedier, and as a result, while it has the desired speed, it also combines the power to hunt longer than the former. Standards and points of judging the beagle. Skull, value five. Ears, 15. Eyes, 10. Muzzle, jaws, and lips, five. Neck, five. Shoulders and chest, 10. Back and loins, 15. Ribs, five. Four legs and feet, 10. Hips, thighs, and hind legs, 10. Tail, 5. Coat, 5. Total, 100 points. Standard and scale of points adopted by the American Beagle Club and endorsed by all the leading shows. Head. The skull should be moderately domed at the occiput with the cranium broad and full. The ears set on low, long, and fine in texture the forward or front edge closely framing an inturned to the cheek, rather broad and rounded at the tips, with an almost entire absence of erectile power at their origin. The eyes, full and prominent, rather wide apart, soft and lustrous, brown or hazel in color. The orbital process is well developed. The expression gentle, subdued, and pleading. The muzzle of medium length, squarely cut, 
the stop well defined the jaws should be level lips either free from or with moderate flues nostrils large moist and open defects a flat skull narrow across the top of the head absence of dome ears short set on too high or when the dog is excited rising above the line of the skull at their points of origin due to an excess of erectile power ears pointed at tips thick or hoardy in substance or carried out from cheek showing a space between eyes of a light or yellow color muzzle long and snippy pig jaws or the reverse known as undershot lips showing deep pendulous flues disqualifications eyes close together small beady and terrier like neck and throat neck rising free and light from the shoulders strong in substance yet not loaded of medium length the throat clean and free from folds of skin a slight wrinkle below the angle of the jaw however may be allowable defects a thick short cloddy neck carried on a line with the top of the shoulder throat showing dewlap and folds of skin to a degree termed throatiness shoulders and chest shoulders somewhat declining muscular but not loaded conveying the idea of freedom of action with lightness activity and strength chest moderately broad and full defects upright shoulders and a disproportionately wide chest back loin and ribs back short muscular and strong loin broad and slightly arched and the ribs well sprung giving abundant lung room defects a long or swayed back a flat narrow loin or a flat constricted rib forelegs and feet forelegs straight with plenty of bone feet close firm and either round or hair-like in form defects out at elbows knees knuckled over or forward or bent backward feet open and spreading hips thighs hind legs and feet hips strongly muscled giving abundant propelling power stifles strong and well let down hocks firm symmetrical and moderately bent feet close and firm defects cow hocks and open feet tail the tail should be carried gaily well up and with medium curve rather short as compared with the size of the dog and clothed with a decided brush defects a long tail with a teapot curve disqualifications a thinly haired radish tail with entire absence of brush coat moderately coarse in texture and of good length disqualifications a short close and nappy coat height the meaning of the term beagle a word of celtic origin and in old english bigel is small little the dog was so named from his diminutive size your committee therefore for the sake of consistency and that the beagle shall be in fact what his name implies strongly recommend that the height line shall be sharply drawn at 15 inches and that all dogs exceeding that height shall be disqualified as overgrown and outside the pale of recognition color all hound colors are admissible perhaps the most popular is black white and tan next in order is the lemon and white the blue and lemon models then follow the solid colors such as black and tan tan lemon fawn etc this arrangement is of course arbitrary the question being one governed entirely by fancy the colors first named form the most lively contrast and blend better in the pack the solid colors being somber and monotonous to the eye it is not intended to give a point value to color in the scale for judging as before said all true hound colors are correct the foregoing remarks on the subject are therefore simply suggestive 
general appearance. A miniature foxhound, solid and big for his inches, with the wear and tear look of the dog that can last in the chase and follow his quarry to the death. Note, dogs possessing such serious faults as are enumerated under the heading of disqualifications are under the grave suspicion of being of impure blood. Under the heading of defects, objectionable features are indicated. Such departures from the standard not, however, impugning the purity of the breeding. In this standard it will be observed that the head is scored 35 points, which is the same number allowed for the body. In the standards for the various breeds of bird dogs, it has been deemed proper by all the breeders to allow a much less number of points for the head than for the body, as certainly a good body is of much greater importance in assisting a dog to be a good or successful hunter than a correspondingly typical head is. In the hound, the difference of importance between the head and the body should be more marked, as not only from the nature of his work does a hound rely on his natural instinct to pursue and kill his game, and not require the mental faculties necessary in a bird dog, but it is of more importance that his running and staying powers should be superior, as his work admits no rest or let up until the game is captured. I do not mean to convey the impression that I do not consider a typical head of importance, as in no breed more than a beagle does the head give character to the dog, and no one can admire hound character in a beagle more than I do. I further claim that in assigning the numerical value of points in the standard, symmetry should be considered and allotted a certain number of points. The same is illustrated in the fact that there were two hounds to be taken and scored, both scoring the same number of points, and one hound should happen to be very nicely and symmetrically built, and the other out of proportion, say for instance, short on the forelegs and long in the loin. The former would be undoubtedly selected even if scoring a point or two less than the latter, as it would be evident as far as appearances went that the former would be able to stand more work. While the sentiments expressed in the foregoing article are those of the writer individually, I may add that they are the same as have appeared in former articles by myself and which I have submitted to several of our most prominent practical authorities on the breed, and they tell me they are practically the views held by themselves. End of section 14. Recording by Tom Mack. Section 15 of The American Book of the Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Book of the Dog, G. O. Shields, Editor. Section 15, The Irish Water Spaniel, by P. T. Madison. One of the greatest, if not the greatest, retrievers of which we have any knowledge is the Irish Water Spaniel. Especially is this true of the species from the south of Ireland. The breed consists of two distinct varieties peculiar to the north and south of Ireland. The northern dog has short ears with little feather either on them or on the legs, but with a considerable curl in his coat. In color he is generally liver, but with more or less white, which sometimes predominates so as to make him decidedly white and liver. The South Country Irish Water Spaniel is, on the contrary, invariably of a pure liver color, ears long and well feathered, being often twenty-four inches from point to point, and the whole coat consisting of short, crisp curls body long, low, and strong, tail round and carried slightly down, but straight, without any feather. Almost all the importations to America are from the latter named species. The importers and breeders of America have endeavored to keep the breed pure, and through their efforts this country can now boast of as fine specimens as can be found anywhere in the world. The writer has in his kennel a dog, now three years old, by Count Bendingo, out of foam, which is pronounced by persons well posted on this breed a typical specimen. Therefore, in the absence of anything better, I will use the measurements of this dog in giving a description of my ideal of the breed. 
height 24 inches at the shoulder, weight 55 pounds, head capacious, forehead prominent, face from eyes and ears down perfectly smooth, ears 21 inches from point to point of leather, and 25 inches from point to point of feather. The head is crowned with a well-defined top knot, which stands erect and is not straggling across like that of the common rough water dog, but comes down in a peak on the forehead, giving the head and face much of the appearance of a merino sheep. His body is covered with small, crisp curls, which extend along the tail about three inches. From there to the sting, the tail is smooth. His color is pure liver. The standard as adopted by the English Spaniel Club, here and after given, meets my approval, except as to the top knot, which in my judgment should not fall over the eyes, but should stand erect. Mr. J. S. Skidmore, a noted English breeder of Irish Water Spaniels, pays this well-deserved tribute to the good qualities of the breed. To a sportsman of limited means, or one who is not prepared to keep a team of dogs, the Irish Water Spaniel is the most useful dog he can have, inasmuch as he can be made to perform the duties of pointer, setter, retriever, and spaniel. But as his name implies, he is peculiarly fitted by temperament and by a water-resisting coat for the arduous duties required by a sportsman whose proclivities lie in the direction of wildfowl shooting. In this branch of sport, they have no equal, being able to stand any amount of hardship. This, combined with an indomitable spirit, leads them into deeds of daring from which many dogs would shrink. Many are the feats recorded of their pluck, sagacity, and intelligence. For a well-bred and trained specimen, no sea is too rough, no pier too high, and no water too cold. Even if he have to break the ice at every step, he is not discouraged, and day after day will repeat the arduous task. As a companion for a lady or gentleman, the Irish Water Spaniel has no equal, while a well-behaved dog of the breed is worth a whole mint of toys to the children. He will allow the little ones to pull him about by the ears, will roll over and over with them, will fetch their balls as often as thrown for him, and will act as their guard in times of danger. So good an authority as Mr. J. H. Whitman of Chicago says, I have no hesitation in saying to the sportsman who desires a really first-class retriever for wild fowls that there is none superior, if equal, to the Irish Water Spaniel for retrieving ducks, brant, geese, etc., from land or water. I never saw a dog that seemed to enter into the sport with more zeal, and on whom cold water had so little effect. I have seen them retrieve ducks when ice would form on their coats reaching shore. Still, they were always ready to go. I never saw more intelligence in any breed of dogs. They can be taught tricks as easily as a poodle. They soon learn that a duck shot dead and falling in the water can be retrieved at any time, and where two are dropped, one dead and one wounded, the Irish Water Spaniel invariably goes for the wounded one first. There is no dog that is so natural a retriever or so easily broken as the pure Irish Water Spaniel. I would advise parties owning one of these dogs that they expect to use as a retriever on game, not to teach him any tricks, as I have always observed that a trick dog was good for nothing else. In training the Irish Water Spaniel for shooting purposes, you should first instill into his mind obedience, and when that is fully accomplished, your dog is broken, as it is as natural for him to retrieve from land or water as it is for a pointer or setter to point. I have my dog broken to go as soon as the shot is fired. In this way, I lose few, if any, wounded birds. While, on the contrary, if the dog is broken to drop to shot, your wounded duck or snipe often gets away before the dog is ordered on. In quail shooting, a dog is trained to drop to shot because other birds often remain within shooting distance after the gun has been fired, and if the dog were allowed to break shot, he would likely flush many of them while your gun was empty. But as all ducks and snipes take wing as soon as they hear the report of a gun, you run no such chances in that class of shooting. Hence, in order that you may secure all your wounded birds, I advise you to teach your Irish Water Spaniel to break shot. On the subject of training the Irish Water Spaniel, Mr. Whitman says, Commence, if the puppy is precocious, at three months old. First throw a ball or roll of cloth or any soft substance, calling his attention to it as it passes from your hand. If he does not bring it the first time, he may the second or third. If he does not, let him go for that time he is too young to force, but will soon begin to understand what is wanted and perform more to your wish. Try him twice a day, but not long at a time. Teach him to come to you when called. At first he may not come. Put a cord round his neck, or if he wears a collar, attach cord to that. Now call him. If he does not come, pull him to you, pet him, let him go and call him again. If he refuse to come, bring him to you again with the cord. By following this course he will soon learn that you are his master and will obey you. 
Now make him charge or lie down. Say charge, drop, or any word you like, but invariably use the same word and raise the hand. As at first he neither understands the meaning of the word nor the uplifted hand, you should take his four legs and pull them from under him with one hand while you press down his hindquarters with the other, using at the same time the word at which you desire he should lie down. When he will remain in the position in which you have placed him, looking towards you, raise the hand and repeat the word as often as he offers to move. In a short time he will do this seemingly well, but, as this is a very important lesson, continue it for days and weeks until he becomes so perfect that at your whistle or word of command he will look at you and drop instantly at uplifted hand. Many dogs want to come to you before they drop, but insist on their dropping where they first get the signal to do so. Easy enough said, but how shall it be done? My way is to take the dog back to the place where he was ordered to charge, walking backward from him with hand raised, returning him to the spot from which he started, every time, until he remains as desired. Having taught him to do this well, take a well-trained dog out with him. Charge both, the older one in the rear of the puppy. Walk away from them as before. Call the older one by name when he will come, and undoubtedly the puppy will come too, but he must be taken back until he is perfect in this. The importance of this is, should you be hunting with some friend whose dog is not well broken and runs in at the report of the gun, your dog, if so trained, will not move, even if he is passed by the other dog. Or you may see game to which you desire to creep. You can then leave the dog behind you. To teach him to follow at heel, attach the cord to the puppy, say, heel, carry your whip in hand, and should he attempt to get in front of you, touch him lightly on the nose, say, at the same time, heel. Another way is to couple him to a broken dog, using the same means and word should he try to get ahead. Having taught him to retrieve anything you may throw for him when he can see it, now throw it in high grass or weeds, or in fact any place where he cannot see it, and bid him fetch. He will begin to look for it, and unless he should find it at once, you should encourage him to find it by, if necessary, going with him. But do not pick it up yourself. Have him do that, and follow you with it in his mouth. It is better to do this with a bird, say a, a pigeon or a duck, as I have seen dogs that would bring a ball, roll of cloth, etc., well, that at first would not touch a bird. I prefer a bird with which to teach them to retrieve. Having now taught him to charge, retrieve, heel, and come at whistle, you should take him to some stream where the water is not too deep to start with, throwing into the water the object he is in the habit of retrieving on land and sending him for it. I have not seen one puppy that would not go for it at once, especially if the water were warm. It is better to teach the puppy this work in the summer or early fall before the weather is too cold. Your dog is now ready for a lesson in duck shooting. Get on some point of land where birds pass and shoot one, having it fall as near shore as possible. Send him for it and encourage him if he brings it nicely. You should endeavor to have him watch birds as they fly past. It will soon teach him to watch them as they fall and mark well the spot so he can go direct to them. I would advise you to accustom him to the sound of the gun from his youth, until you begin to work him on game, commencing with percussion caps or a small charge of powder, no shot. When he shows that for him the report of a gun has no terror, you are all right. He will not be gun shy. If he is a little timid, don't despair, for he, finding he is not hurt by the report, if properly handled, will come out all right. If you go with him in boat, have him charge, and do not allow him to rise until ordered. If he will not mind promptly the word charge, tie a rope across the boat from rowlock to rowlock, and fasten him in center so that he cannot get out. Now shoot, if possible, some ducks while he is so confined, and when the gun is fired, should he attempt to move, say, charge, and compel him to go down promptly. Repeat this until he is perfect in not attempting to leave the boat until ordered. He must be kept in strict obedience. Do not allow him to disobey without correcting him at once. In your ardor to secure the game, don't forget you have a dog for that purpose. I have never seen the weather or water too cold for my dog to take great pleasure, apparently, in his work. I have worked him from early morning till late at night in slush ice, and he would not suffer in the least. The undercoat of this breed is similar to that of the beaver or muskrat, and is saturated with an oily substance that almost thoroughly protects them from wet and cold. To fully appreciate the pleasure of duck and snipe shooting, the sportsman should have a well-broken Irish water spaniel. I would take just as much pleasure in quail shooting without my setter or pointer as I would in duck or snipe shooting without my retriever. I predict for the Irish Water Spaniel a bright future, as he has only to be known to be appreciated, and he is becoming better known every year. 
this is a noble dog and should be developed to the greatest possible perfection and in order to stimulate effort in this direction i believe that a retriever club should be formed in america for the purpose of holding field trials on some of our numerous lakes rivers or marshes to which all members of the retriever family should be eligible it would be as easy to formulate rules for the government of trials of this character as it was for the originators of field trials for pointers and setters to evolve their rules while our first efforts in this direction would doubtless be crude experience would soon teach us and by bringing all the different breeds together we could in a short time determine which is best fitted to perform the various kinds of work one breed might be found far superior to another in working in open rough and large bodies of water while another would excel in the weeds and grasses of the marsh these questions can only be settled by actual competition, and I am satisfied that great good would result from frequent trials, as the breeders would take great pride in possessing a field trial winner, and in the future would breed with the sole object of producing the best performers. By this means, the value of each breed would be greatly enhanced. I can remember when five dollars was a big price for a pointer or setter puppy, and twenty-five dollars an enormous price for a broken dog. Perfection in breeding, brought about largely by field trials, has enhanced the value of the setter and pointer so much that often we hear of a fine performer bringing a thousand dollars or more. I hope to see a retriever club organized and will gladly assist in the good work. I will devote as much of my time as I can spare from my business to organizing such a club, formulating rules, and conducting trials. The standard and scale of points of the Irish Water Spaniel are as follows. Positive Points Head and jaw, 10. Eyes, 5. Top knot, 5. Ears, 10. Neck, 7.5. Body, 7.5. Four legs, 5. Hind legs, 5. Feet, 5. Stern, 10. Coat, 15. General appearance, 15. Total, 100. Negative points. Cording or tags of dead or matted hair, 20. Mustache or poodle hair on cheek, 10. Length, open or woolly coat, 10. A natural sandy light coat, 15. Furnishing of tail more than halfway down to sting, 5. Setter feathering on legs, 15. White patch on chest, 15. Total, 90. Disqualifications. Total absence of top knot. A fully feathered tail. Any white patch on any part of dog except a small one on chest or toe. Head. Capacious skull, rather raised in dome and fairly wide, showing large brain capacity. The dome appears higher than it really is, from its being surmounted by the crest or top knot, which should grow down to a point between the eyes, leaving the temple smooth. Eyes. Highly intelligent, amber-colored. Dark is generally preferred. Nose. Dark, liver-colored, rather large, and well-developed. Ears. Set on rather low. In a full-sized specimen, the leather should not be less than 18 inches, and with feather about 24 inches. The feather on the ear should be long, abundant, and wavy. Neck should be pointer-like, i.e. muscular, slightly arched, and not too long. It should be strongly set on the shoulders. Body, including size and symmetry. Height at shoulder from 20 to 24 inches, according to sex and strain. Body fair-sized, round, barrel-shaped, well-ribbed up when wet would resemble in contour that of a sporting-looking pointer. Shoulders and chest. Chest deep and not too narrow. Shoulders strong, rather sloping, and well covered with hard muscle. Back and loin. Back strong, loins a trifle arched and powerful so as to fit them for the heavy work of beating through sedgy, muddy sides of rivers. Hindquarters. Round and muscular and slightly drooping toward the set on of the stern. Stern. A whip tail thick at base and tapering to a sting. The hair on it should be short, straight, and close-lying, except for a few inches from its root, where it gradually merges into the body coat in some short curls. Feet and legs. Forelegs straight, well-boned. They should be well-furnished with wavy hair all round and down to the feet, which should be large and round. Hind legs stifle long, hock set low. They should be well-furnished except from the hock down the front. Coat. Neither woolly nor lank, but should consist of short, crisp curls right up to the stern. Top knot should fall well over the eyes. It and furnishing of ears should be abundant and wavy. Color. Dark, rich liver or puce to be judged by its original color. A sandy, light coat is a defect. Total absence of white desirable. Any except a little on chest or a toe should disqualify. General appearance. 
that of a strong compact dashing-looking dog with a quaint and very intelligent aspect the light rim round the eye objected to by some frequently adds much to their intelligent knowing expression they should not be leggy as power and endurance are required of them in their work noisy and joyous when out for a spree but mute on game the following may be mentioned among the many prominent owners and breeders of irish water spaniels in this country charles l griffith 82 front street new york city john r daniels 151 ontario street cleveland ohio hornell harmony kennels hornellsville new york joseph lewis cannonsburg pennsylvania milwaukee kennel club milwaukee wisconsin anderson and kilpatrick 229 Park Avenue, Chicago, Illinois. C.B. Rhodes, Moberly, Missouri. James Delahuity, 134 Second Street, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. George H. Hill, Madeira, Ohio. Dr. James F. W. Ross, Toronto, Ontario. J. H. Whitman, Passenger Department Grand Trunk Railway, Chicago. Andrew Laidlaw, Woodstock, Ontario. Devonshire Kennels, Attica, Indiana. T. Donahue, LaSalle, Illinois. John D. Alcott, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. P. Tindolf, Vincennes, Indiana. C. H. Hampson, Denver, Colorado. End of section 15. Section 16 of the American Book of the Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. The American Book of the Dog. G. O. Shields, Editor. Section 16. The English Water Spaniel by William A. Bruett. By many, the old English water spaniel is considered extinct, but this claim I cannot allow, for scattered throughout Great Britain, as well as in a few instances in America, are perfect specimens of the breed in the hands of sportsmen who know their true worth, and who use them extensively in their private shooting. Were the good qualities of this dog better known, they would be very popular among our inland duck shooters. The English Water Spaniel is historically older than the Irish, and all writers on canine histiology since the 14th century have described him with more or less care. Dr. Caius says, quote, The Water Spaniel is that kind of a dog whose service is required in fouling upon the water, partially through a natural towardness and partially by diligent teaching, is endued with that property. The sort is somewhat big and of a measurable greatness, having long, rough, and curled hair, not obtained by extraordinary trades, but given by nature's appointment." End quote. In the Gentleman's Recreation a similar description occurs. In the Sportsman's Cabinet, written about 1802, this dog is described as having the hair long and naturally curled not loose and shaggy, and the engraving by Scott from a drawing by Reinegale, which accompanies the article, represents a medium-sized liver-and-white curly-coated spaniel, with the legs feathered but not curled. Uat, in his Book of the Dog, has a woodcut showing a similar type, but says, quote, The water spaniel was originally from Spain. The pure breed has been lost, and the present dog is probably descended from the large water dog and the English setter." End quote. All authorities agree that the spaniel came originally from Spain, but it is generally admitted that none exist as imported without alteration by mixture with allied varieties. It is generally agreed that the English setter sprung from the land spaniel, and very likely the dogs referred to by Uat were in greater part, if not all, water spaniels. From the earliest times, 
the English water spaniel is described as differing from the land spaniel. Edmund de Langley, in The Master of Game, writes of the land spaniel, quote, white and tawny in color and not rough-coated, whereas nearly all other writers describe the water spaniel as rough and curly-coated, but not shaggy. All the earlier writers speak of a large and small water spaniel, and I can easily conceive that two sizes would naturally result from the requirements of sportsmen living in different localities. The bay or sea shooter requires a larger and more powerful dog than the inland sportsman, whose shooting is confined to the smaller lakes and streams, where a dog weighing from 25 to 40 pounds can work the willows, reeds, and rice to much better advantage than a larger animal, and is more easily carried and concealed. I have found the English water spaniel extremely intelligent, particularly fond of the water, which he will enter by choice in all weathers. His powers of swimming and diving are immense. He works through mud, rice, and weeds seemingly with as much ease as on land, while his keen nose enables him to scent the dead or wounded duck at marvelously long distances. He will work out the hiding place of a wounded bird with a perseverance and intelligence that can only be born of a genuine love of the sport. He requires little, if any, training and seems to have inherent a desire to please his master, as well as to gratify his own love of the sport. He will frequently mark the approach of the wild fowl before the hunter sees it, will crouch down till he hears the report of the gun, when he is all animation to mark the fall of the dead or wounded duck. He is of a much handsomer appearance than either the Irish or Chesapeake Bay dogs, and makes an excellent companion at home as well as in the field. The points of the English water spaniel are general appearance, strong, compact of medium size, leggy by comparison with the clumber, Sussex, or black field spaniel, and showing great activity. The head is rather long, the brow apparent, but not very prominent. Jaws fairly long, and slightly but not too much pointed. The whole face and skull to the occiput covered with short smooth hair, and no forelocks as in the Irish water spaniel. The eyes fairly full but not watery, clear brown-colored, with an intelligent beseeching expression. The ears long, rather broad, soft, pendulous, and thickly covered with curly hair of greater length than that of the body. The neck short, thick, and muscular. The chest capacious. The barrel stout and the shoulders wide and strong. The loin strong. The buttock square and thighs muscular. The legs rather long, straight, strong of bone, well clothed with muscle, and the feet a good size, rather spreading, without being absolutely splay-footed. The coat over the whole upper part of the body and sides, thick and closely curled, flatter on the belly and under the legs, which should, however, be well clad at the back with feathery curls. The prevailing color is liver and white, but whole liver, black and black and white, are also described by some writers. The tail is usually decked rather thick and covered with curls. Appended is the standard and points of judging the English Water Spaniel, as adopted by the English Water Spaniel Club. Head, jaws, and eyes, value 20. Ears, value 5. Neck, value 5. Body value 10. Forelegs value 10. Hind legs value 10. Feet value 5. Stern value 10. Coat value 15. General appearance value 10. Total 100. Negative points. 
feather on stern ten top knot ten total twenty head long somewhat straight and rather narrow muzzle rather long and if anything rather pointed eyes small for the size of the dog ears set in forward and thickly clothed with hair inside and out neck straight body including size and symmetry ribs round the back ones not very deep nose large shoulders and chest shoulders low and chest rather narrow but deep back and loin strong but not clumsy hind quarters long and straight rather rising toward the stern than drooping which combined with the low shoulder gives him the appearance of standing higher behind than in front stern docked from seven inches to ten inches according to the size of the dog carried a little above the level of the back but by no means high feet and legs feet well spread large and strong well clothed with hair especially between the pads legs long and strong the stifles well bent coat covered either with crisp curls or with ringlets no top knot but the close curl should cease on the top of the head leaving the face perfectly smooth and lean looking color black and white liver and white or self-colored black or liver the pied for choice general appearance sober looking with rather a slouching gait and a general independence of manner which is thrown aside at the sight of a gun end of section 16 recording by roger maline section 17 of the american book of the dog this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The American Book of the Dog, G. O. Shields, Editor, Section 17, The Clumber Spaniel, by F. H. F. Mercer of Clumber. We begin this section with two extracts in Middle English, the first from The Master of Game by Edmund de Langley, born A.D. 1378. Another manner of hounds there is that been called hounds for your hawk, and spaniels for your nature of him cometh from Spain, notwithstanding that there been many in other countries and such hounds having many good customs and evil. Also a fair hound for your hawk should have a great head and a great body, and a fair hue, white or tawn, for these been ye fairest, and of such have there been commonly best. A good spaniel should not be too rough, but his tail should be rough. The good customs of such hounds have been these. They leaven well their masters, and follow him without losing, though they be in great press of men, and commonly he goes before his master, running and playing with her tail, and raising or starting fowls and wild beasts. But her right craft is of ye partridge, and of ye quail. It is a good thing to a man that hath a good goose-hawk, or a tiercel, or a spar-hawk for ye partridge, to have such hounds, and also, when they been taught to be careful, they been good for to take partridge and ye quail with a net. Also, they been good when they been taught to swim and to be good for your river and for fowls when they been dived. But in that other side you have many evil conditions after the country that they been common of. For a country draweth to two natures of men, to call of beasties and of fowls, and as men to call greyhounds in ends of Scotland, of Britain, just so ye alimentes and ye hounds for your hawk cometh out Spain, 
and they draw in after your nature of your generations of which they come in hounds for your hawk been fighters and great baffers and if you lead em on hunting among running hounds what beast that you hunt to she shall make her come out for the fallen as when they gone aright and leading ye hounds about and making em overshoot and fail also if you lead greyhounds with two other hounds for your hawk that is to say a spaniel if he see geese kine or horse oxen or other beasties he will run anon and begin to bath at em and because of him your greyhounds shall run there too for to take your beast through his eggen for he will make all your riot and all your harm the hounds for your hawk have so many other evil touches that but if i had a goose hawk or a falcon or hawks for your river or a spar hawk for your net i would never have none namely there as i should hunt End quote. and here comes an extract from dogs by dr johannes caius written during the reign of queen elizabeth i in the fifteen hundreds the spaniel is so named from spain whence they come the most part of their skins are white and if they are marked with any spots they are commonly red End quote. and now for the main article it has ever been my belief that the dog described in the foregoing extracts from the works of these the two oldest writers on the canine species is identical with that variety of the genus spaniel now known as the clumber when we consider the crudeness of all writings descriptive of men and things in those early days it must be conceded that de langley's description of the best hound for hawking and for the reverie fits the patrician of his family with the most remarkable exactitude the spaniel he writes should have a large head and a large body with not too curly or wavy a coat that a coloring should be white and tawn lemon and that the tail should be rough he goes on to enumerate many traits of clumber character though this old aristocrat has during a lapse of four centuries arrived doubtless at the conclusion that to play with his tail is beneath such dignity as his and therefore has given over the practice of so frivolous a pastime the baffing barking propensity with which he charges them has certainly not been transmitted to their presumed descendants the clumbers as they are the most silent of dogs and in fact are entirely mute when at work still nothing can be more probable than that their patrons the dukes of newcastle finding this noisiness to be an objectionable feature as it undoubtedly is bred out the noxious habit by judicious matings of the more silent specimens dr caius still further strengthens their claim to great antiquity for though the markings nowadays recognized are not red in hue the darker shades displayed by some individuals might certainly be so denominated as a matter of fact the writer when accompanied by clumbers of the exactest shades of lemon and orange has overheard passers-by remark on their being white dogs with red ears then again does any other variety of the genus answer the here and before quoted descriptions of the spaniels given by both de langley and caius from the former's remarks it would appear that this presumed clumber is not only the original land spaniel but also the progenitor of the setter in daniel's rural sports we learn that the immediate ancestors of the present race were given by the french nobleman the duc de Noailles, to the duke of newcastle probably about two centuries ago the name is derived from a seat of the dukes of newcastle situated in nottinghamshire clumber where they were domiciled from the outset to those who value things for their associations the clumber is a fit object for appreciation as from the outset his associations have been aristocratic the kennels of dukes marquises earls barons baronets knights and the leading country gentry of great britain and ireland not to mention those of royalty having been the cradles of the breed specimens are but rarely met with in america and until of late years were scarce even in england where they were almost entirely in the hands of noblemen and country gentlemen who kept them on their estates for shooting purposes these were chary of disposing of surplus stock to any but their immediate friends who in turn maintained them for their private uses 
did any outsider therefore desire to obtain a specimen he could procure it clandestinely from the gamekeeper only who would report a puppy as having been destroyed whereas he had sold it and pocketed the proceeds of his dishonesty it is therefore not difficult of comprehension that under conditions such as these but few were disseminated among the general public but all this is changed now and the purebred clumbers are easily to be got in england though high-class animals are few and far between in that country as elsewhere that they were prized by the highest class of sportsmen is borne witness to by colonel hamilton in his recollections which are of shooting incidents in the early days of the century he writes quote, a spaniel known as a clumber breed his grace always shooting over them in his woods is much sought after by sportsmen end quote. then he enumerates their many excellences this extract from the dog the work of the late lamented idstone will be of interest quote, the best pictures of the dog extant perhaps are those of the clumbers for from bewick to abraham copper we had few if any painters except moreland who could make anything better than a map of the dog and moreland's dogs are generally clumbers and first-rate specimens i have no doubt that some good english spaniels existed in his day for i have seen a good picture by this artist of snipe shooting in the snow where english or colored spaniels are employed but evidently the clumber was a dog of his time as it will be of all time somewhere about eighteen sixty eight sixty nine a fine picture by f wheatley a r a of the duke of newcastle was exhibited in the portrait gallery in london and was attributed by several persons to moreland who seldom if ever finished so highly as a former painter the duke is represented on his bay shooting pony surrounded by a group of clumbers which a writer in a sporting magazine of eighteen o seven when an engraving of the picture or a part of it only appeared in that serial called Springers or Cockflushers. William Mansell at that time had had the care of them for thirty years and made it his study to produce this race of dogs unmixed, and they were at that time known as the Duke or Mansell's breed. It is no easy matter to breed clumbers successfully. They will allow of no cross, but they often improve ordinary field spaniels and it is difficult to produce thick short-legged ones without an infusion of the blood it will be evident from my foregoing remarks that all the clumbers in the kingdom sprung from one family and one place and therefore there can be no change of blood and although an interchange of puppies from the few kennels scattered up and down the country does good it cannot refresh the constitution like a new strain from this lack of infusions of new blood the clumber has been constitutionally weakened but only during puppyhood to the ills of which he is peculiarly susceptible on the attainment of full growth however no more hardy dog exists and no further trouble on this score need be apprehended non-converts to the belief that this breed is the original land spaniel and as pure a one as any can be advance a number of theories as to how it was evolved of these the most credible is that it is derived from a union of the french basset hound and the nondescript spaniel of the time yet another faction hold out that it originated in a cross between the turnspit a very long short-legged dog so named from his being used to turn the spit on which the meat roasted the breed if indeed there ever was a breed is now extinct and the land spaniel but it seems so highly improbable that a sportsman should invoke the aid of the kitchen in breeding a sporting dog that outside of every other consideration i consider the contention untenable after much research and inquiry the writer has arrived at the conclusion that the first specimens brought to america were imported by lieutenant afterwards major venables of her majesty's ninety seventh regiment then in garrison at halifax nova scotia canada in eighteen forty two he obtained his dogs from the kennels of marwood yateman esq the stockhouse dorset whose ownership of excellent clumbers is especially mentioned by idstone in his book the writer has three of the direct descendants of these dogs in his kennels and mr george piers also is the owner of two bitches of the same breeding but his old dog smash the second was accidentally poisoned last year 
the initial importation into nova scotia was supplemented by many others the breed having at once risen to the pinnacle of high favor and halifax now undoubtedly numbers more clumbers in its canine population than any other city on the continent later some exceedingly well-bred clumbers were imported by a gentleman in ohio whose name i for the moment do not recollect several were bought by parties in baltimore maryland and mr jonathan thorne jr of pennsylvania for some years had things all his own way on the show bench with his imported dogs especially trim bush whose portrait is given in pope's series of colored lithographs of dogs within the past seven years a powerful colony has been founded in ottawa canada the best clumbers ever seen in america have been bred there as a matter of fact states bred specimens have always had to succumb to the canucks champion johnny drake champion newcastle tyne john halifax etc all being canadian born and bred the year 1889 will ever be a red-letter one with the American clumber lovers, for in it the importation of leading English prize winners was inaugurated. In 1887, the writer secured the celebrated champion Psycho and his kennel companions, Snow, Clover, Sherry, Cynic, and two others to come to this country, but the negotiation unfortunately fell through. Since then, no notorieties have crossed the Atlantic until Mr. Cameron Bate of Ottawa pluckily purchased the English champion Boss Three, Damper Lotus, winner of an immense number of prizes on the other side. This dog, while deficient in several attributes, notably in head and coat, is wonderfully low on the leg and altogether a decided gain to the clumber interests of America. Shortly after, the same gentleman, on the recommendation of the writer, purchased the bitch Bromine, Tower Leda, a winner of three first prizes in England, and who defeated several leading winners there, besides being highly eulogized by the kennel press. The writer has now on the seas the beautiful all-white bitch Snow, champion John O'Gaunt, Foxley Beauty, a winner of many first prizes, including the Kennel Club Jubilee Show at Barn Elms and Birmingham twice, that both from her form and splendid breeding, he expects will prove an invaluable addition to his kennel. Ottawa, however, is not singular in enterprise of this description, for Mr. A. L. Weston of Denver, Colorado, having laid the foundation of a good kennel of the breed by purchases in this country, has bought from the Duke of Westminster at a very long price his grace's first prize-winning bitch at Birmingham. But the show bench, much as he adorns it by his presence, is not the clumber's sphere. To appreciate them at the full, one must see them silently questing for their game. I am of the firm belief that there is no prettier sight than a team of good clumbers stealing ghost-like through forest or covert. Not a sound is to be heard, save now and then the breaking of the omnipresent dry twig. Mark to the right. Drake is feathering. Nell, too, has caught the scent. Johnny, who has been questing to the extreme left, now comes up to them, and by his manner at once betrays the proximity of the game. The bodies now are sunk until they seem to sweep the ground. They look to have no legs. Their heads point towards some matted, fallen hemlocks, and with every now and then a backward glance, for fear of advancing too quickly for the gun, they swiftly steal along. Now they are within a yard of the grouse's lair, and their aspects change. With a bound and a frantic waving of sterns, they are in. Whirr! A fine old cock is flushed at once. Bang! One down. Whirr! Whirr! Two more up, and only one barrel charged. A hen this time presents the easier shot, and to the report drops, but only wing-tipped. No more birds being there to flush, the dogs are on the alert to retrieve whatever may fall. If two birds or more are down, both Johnny and Drake retrieve, the others not being allowed to interfere, though if given an opportunity they will retrieve with alacrity. In this instance Drake brings in the dead cock while Johnny pursues the runner. Flying and running together, a wing-tipped grouse can encompass space with marvelous celerity, and the object of Johnny's pursuit is not an exception to the general rule. The bird doubles and twists in its effort to escape, thereby causing the heavy dog to lose ground, 
but its wiles are of no avail and soon it grasps it by the wing the prisoner administering heavy punishment about his head with the free one and brings it to bag from this a conception of the clumber's manner of land work may be had and surely every sportsman will admit that such silence and stealth in the pursuit of game is a desideratum it is killing certainly and in an eminently sportsmanlike way their scent is simply marvellous and is scarcely subordinate in excellent to that of the pointer and setter indeed one gentleman in particular takes me to task for in a former article placing them on a par at all so high is his opinion of the clumber's keenness of scent they are all round dogs good alike in water and on land to quote a sixty-year-old sportsman friend writing in our leading sportsman's paper some two years since quote, for snipe woodcock and partridge ruffed grouse shooting and for retrieving ducks i consider them unequalled by any breed of dogs and i believe that they would also be excellent dogs to shoot quail over they hunt so close to the gun that their flushing the birds without pointing would not be of any consequence and in finding scattered birds after the bevies have been flushed and marked down i believe they would not be excelled by the very best pointers and setters End quote. in all of which i fully coincide keen-scented obedient and withal passionately fond of his work he is the beau ideal of the sportsman's companion among his many good qualities is one that should especially recommend him to the average sportsman who has but little time to spend afield much less in breaking a dog he is a natural worker and needs but little training while on game he is entirely mute which is of course a great recommendation as nothing disturbs game more than the yapping of a noisy dog it is quite the fashion among sportsmen to decry the clumber's working capabilities to say they're too big or too clumsy and frequently to conclude by informing you gravely that they're no good anyway but happily their dictum with the cognoscenti does not carry much weight no one that would speak in such a strain could have seen a good clumber at work the writer has tried them very high and has never known them to fail he has worked one champion johnny a seventy-pound dog for seventeen consecutive days without visibly affecting him also a team on ruffed grouse for sixteen days they were weary at the end and footsore but by no means tired out and probably the insufficiency of strengthening food was most to blame i could fill pages with citations of instances in which clumbers have not tired out but cannot recollect a single instance of their having done so basil an eminent english authority on shooting wrote in a london publication two years ago an article on clumber spaniels with particular reference to their superiority over pointers and setters at all work save that of grouse shooting on the moors the following is an extract Quote, for any man who does not shoot on moors and who wants a general dog i say take a clumber there is no sort of low country he cannot do I may go even further and say that he will do grouse ground too and i believe he would well especially in those districts such as yorkshire and derbyshire where birds are wild and where the ordinary sportsman has to go gruffing as it is called to get game i e stealing up the gruffs or gullies and undulations in the ground and trying all the clumps of long old twisted heather and broken bogs of course my lord nabob who can command an army of men can drive his grouse I talk of the men who enjoy more sport than he, i.e., the man who, as I say, wants a general dog. A good retrieving clumber, taught, as they mostly are, to drop to hand, fur, wing, and shot, and to keep at heel when desired, is the most useful dog you can have. On partridge and low ground shooting he is any dog's equal, I say his master, and by walking across the open places on the moor and thus driving the birds forward to deep lying bogs and gruffs similar tactics to partridge shooting you will find him a very satisfactory animal to fill the bag and in scotch cover for woodcock blackcock and pheasant shooting in the long old ling ferns and juniper which is the undergrowth in highland woods he is fully in his element being perfectly mute sagacious and killing 
for any man who wants a general dog and a general gun i should say take a good cylinder twelve bore and a handsome well-bred and well-broken retrieving clumber and you will not regret it in my country the lord nabobs keep their pointers and setters for the moors and clumbers for partridge shooting experience has taught them that that is the right course and that is the course pursued when they kill from one thousand to three thousand brace of birds in a season the advantage which the clumber has over the pointer for partridges is he goes much quieter and when he flushes is within range again birds when they scatter in turnips often run very much with a pointer roding and roding them, they frequently run all over the field, especially in windy weather, and thus steal away out of shot or at long distances. A spaniel, when he comes across game, does not give it leisure to play these tricks. He pounces on it, and it must rise at once. Pheasants, also in turnips, often tease a pointer or set her terribly, when a good spaniel would have them up directly. I have explained that his range is close therefore he rises them within shot, and a clumber can always be kept to his range. End quote. Idstone, in his heretofore mentioned work on the dog, remarks as follows regarding the clumber. Quote, Owing to his strong frame and sober disposition, the clumber lasts longer than most dogs. He also gains wisdom by experience and attains value with age. Thus, at seven, when your setter is slow, your clumber is an adept, and you are the envy of all your acquaintances, who, provided they are really fond of sport, will feel as much pleasure in the work of your dog as in the variety and abundance of sport you offer them. End quote. During the spring of 1888, I had occasion to search a tract of several square miles of land, most of it densely covered with timber, in search of a clumber belonging to me that had escaped from the train at a neighboring station, and, terror-stricken at the strangeness of the surroundings, had taken to the brush. On the first day's search I took with me a pointer and setter, and was much struck with the apparent scarcity of game. The second day I was accompanied by my clumber, and in the same woods he flushed an abundance of game. He nosed out what the gallopers had passed by. For duck retrieving from the water they are superb, being swift and powerful swimmers, and always intent on coming up with the game. They will dive after a bird like a Chesapeake Bay dog. This accomplishment, it will be observed, is mentioned by De Langley, and catch it under water. The color is objectionable for this work, but a light cotton cloth, dead grass in color, thrown over him, will prevent his being seen. No bird can escape them by hiding in reeds or rushes. Yet the transcendent merits of this grand dog are unknown to the vast majority of sportsmen, and those who know of him through hearsay and Stonehenge are strongly prejudiced against him. That writer, by his utterly unjust statements that they quickly tire and are but the rich man's dog, has done great injury to the breed, for Stonehenge's books are far more widely circulated than any other publications treating of the dog. I am often asked, if clumbers are such wonderful dogs, why are they so unpopular? My answer is that they are the victims of ignorance and prejudice. It may be pertinent to remark that I know of no one who has taken up clumbers who is not more than pleased and satisfied with them. Nay, in nearly every instance, they are enthusiastic in their praise. Clumbers, as bred in America, are much higher on the leg than the general run of English dogs, consequent upon their having been bred until the last few years, for shooting only, and without reference to bench show points of excellence. A working spaniel must have a certain amount of leg, but then again leg can be overdone, just as lowness can be, and many of our clumbers are far too abundantly supplied with understandings. But while I dislike extreme legginess greatly, I also abhor the exaggerated long and low type, whose bellies nearly sweep the ground. It is purely a fancy fad that construes short in a standard to mean shortest and low lowest. Why we should rush to extremes instead of following a midway course for the life of me I cannot see. In breeding clumbers, this tendency to extreme legginess is to be guarded against. Another general fault is the unclumber-like ear, and few specimens have really well-shaped and well-hung ones. 
the ear is so distinctive a mark of the breed that this is to be deplored expression of the true kind too is seldom seen and heads are far too apt to be misshapen in england i learn the breed is fast deteriorating from its old-time excellence but i hope that the proverbial american push and intelligence will in time succeed in resuscitating the clumber spaniel probably the best clumber ever seen was mr bullock's old nabob sometime since dead i have repeatedly endeavoured to secure a portrait of him but without success indeed a prominent english spaniel owner writes to me i do not think there is a photograph of nabob in existence i knew the dog and the gentleman who owned him during nearly the whole of his showtime mr bullock was awfully jealous of his dogs and hardly liked people looking at them when at exhibitions the best of late years was champion psycho who is sixteen years old champion john o gaunt too was a good clumber at present there is no dog that stands prominently out from his fellows among the best are holmes tower mr farrow's faust ralph Fireboss and hot pot in america the best native bred dogs have been champion johnny champion newcastle drake and tyne all sired by one dog mr palmer's imported ben a dog of direct clumber house descent the leading clumber owners and exhibitors are mr wilmerding and kitchell of new york mr hill of ottawa who is associated with the writer mr h w windrum of boston and mr bate and gettys of ottawa an important newcomer is mr a l weston of denver colorado the few clumbers in this country are owned for the most part by sportsmen scattered far and wide over the continent who do not care to go to the trouble and expense the exhibiting of dogs entails as to preparation for the show bench little can be said for the lesson can only be learned in the school of experience and even when learned mayhap it will not apply some dogs cannot be properly conditioned plenty of brushing and judicious feeding and exercising are the only means by which the desired end may be attained every sportsman takes pride in the ownership of a handsome dog and the gift of beauty a clumber possesses in a high degree they are withal eminently aristocratic in appearance handsome is as handsome does is a time-honoured adage but when we can combine beauty and utility in one body surely it is as well to have it so idstone goes so far as to characterize the clumber as decidedly the handsomest dog ever bred for the sportsman dog stories of late years have been so much overdone that i will not weary the reader with oft-told tales of the miraculous performance of my pets but this omission must not be construed as being due to a paucity of instances of clumber sagacity for me to elaborate upon there is no more intelligent dog in existence than he whom i champion the noble clumber to their masters they are the most faithful of friends and no stranger need expect this aristocrat to take the least notice of his caresses if indeed he tolerates them at all they are splendid watchdogs and no intruder can come about their master's residence without notice being given of his presence my clumbers prevented one burglar that i know of from burgling he was seen and a gentleman writes to me of his clumber that Quote, he is the most vigilant watchdog i have ever known and i have owned many he does not bite but will bark persistently on two occasions he prevented the entrance of burglars many of the houses in the neighborhood being entered but he never barks unless there is a noise around the house End quote. this describes their methods very well though my experience has been that they will bite at a pinch and an ugly wound they can give i should certainly not care to have a stranger happen in my kennels at night there would be a badly used up man to comfort i fancy of ancient and high lineage useful strong enduring faithful watchful and beautiful surely the clumber spaniel is deserving of popularity it is therefore most gratifying to those of us who know and love this noble dog to observe that he is becoming more and more popular in america every year that he is being sought after to-day by sportsmen who a few years ago either knew or cared nothing for him that good specimens of the breed now sell readily at prices that a few years ago would have been thought by every american exorbitant it is gratifying to know that notwithstanding the wide distribution of clumber owners already noted each year's entry of this breed at our bench shows 
shows an increase over the preceding year all these facts indicate that the clumber is a coming dog and it is safe to predict that in time he will become almost as numerous and as generally popular in this country as is the setter today a representative pedigree and one tracing back to the best strains in great britain is that of the fine young dog johnny the second bred by the writer whose pedigree is shown on these pages he is brother in blood to quester of whom an illustration is given on page three hundred and ten subjoined is the standard for judging clumber spaniels as drawn up by me and adopted by the american spaniel club general appearance and size value ten head value fifteen eyes five ears ten neck and shoulders fifteen body and quarters twenty legs and feet ten coat and feather ten color and markings five total one hundred points general appearance and size general appearance a long low heavy looking dog of a very thoughtful expression betokening great intelligence should have the appearance of great power sedate in all movements but not clumsy weight of dogs averages between fifty five and sixty five pounds bitches from thirty five to fifty pounds head head large and massive in all its dimensions round above eyes flat on the top with the furrow running from between the eyes up the centre a marked stop and large occipital protuberance jaw long broad and deep lips of the upper jaw overhung muzzle not square but at the same time powerful looking nostrils large open and flesh-colored sometimes cherry-colored eyes eyes large soft and deep-set and showing haw hazel in color not too pale with dignified and intelligent expression ears ears long and broad at the top turned over on the front edge vine-shaped close to the head set on low and feathered only on the front edge and there but slightly hair short and silky without slightest approach to wave or curl neck and shoulders neck long thick and powerful free from dewlap with a large ruff shoulders immensely strong and muscular giving a heavy appearance in front body and quarters body very long and low well ribbed and long in the coupling chest of great depth and volume loin powerful and not too much arched back long broad and straight free from droop or bow length an important characteristic the nearer the dog is in length to being two and a half times his height at shoulders the better quarters shapely and very muscular neither drooping nor stilty legs and feet four legs short straight and immensely heavy in bone well in at elbow hind legs heavy in bone but not so heavy as fore legs no feather below hocks but thick hair on back of leg just above the foot feet large compact and plentifully filled with hair between toes coat and feather coat silky and straight not too long extremely dense feather long and abundant color and markings color lemon and white and orange and white fewer markings on the body the better perfection of markings solid lemon or orange ears evenly marked head and eyes muzzle and legs tipped stern set on level and carried low this ends section seventeen the clumber spaniel section eighteen of the american book of the dog this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jamie Fiddler. The American Book of the Dog. G. O. Shields, Editor. Section 18. The Sussex Spaniel by A. Clinton Wilmerding. The Sussex is one of the many varieties of the land spaniel. In color, he is of a golden liver, not over-symmetrical in appearance, nor always graceful in gait and action, but a substantial worker, a valuable companion in the field, as a rule a good retriever on either land or water, 
and gifted, as are all the sporting spaniels, with a wonderful sense of smell. This breed is not so often met with in this country as are the Field or Springer, the Cocker, Clemmer, and Irish Water Spaniels. In fact, it appears as if but a matter of a few years when the few pure specimens that we have will die off, and the breed become practically extinct so far as we are concerned, unless further acquisitions are sought from the other side and more interest taken in this useful dog by our spaniel fanciers and breeders. It is perhaps an unfortunate condition of things that the few specimens here have not been kept religiously apart from the other breeds, instead of being indiscriminately bred with them. This, however, may be overlooked when we realize the rarity of the breed, and the difficulty and expense entailed in mating them when scattered, as they are, throughout the country. Then, too, with but one or two exceptions within our memory, their classification at bench shows brings them under the head of field spaniels, which title frequently embraces all the larger spaniels, over 28 pounds, excepting the Irish water. Clummer, Sussex, and Springers often competing together in this class. Hence, it is not to be wondered at that with but few of the breed, and the slight inducement offered to breeders, the disposition has been to breed to the winning blacks among the Springers, to perpetuate strength, length, and flatness of coat. Among the early breeders in England, and owners of the Sussex, appear such men as S. W. Marchant, who at one time claimed to be the only owner of the pure Rose Hill strain, J. Fuller of Rose Hill, Sussex, Rev. W. Shields, Lord Middleton, Lord Derby, Hon. Capt. Arbuthnot, H. Saxby, Phineas Bullock, and others. These men were certainly pioneers in the breed, and always stanch upholders of it. Among the purebred dogs of early date, we lend several well-known names that figure liberally in the pedigrees of many of our present prize winners, especially so with the field spaniels, or springers. To this ancestry may be attributed much of the strength, bone, and substance of our present dogs. In tracing out the family tree of a majority of the leading dogs of today, particularly of the Jacob stock, we find the old and familiar names of Burdett's Frank, Marchant's Rover, Burgess's Beb, Old Beb, Mousley's Venus, Bachelor, Bob, Bess, Bounce, etc., etc. These were all said to be of the pure Sussex breed. In the field, this dog is a strong and cheerful worker, of great pluck and energy. As a rule, he is not silent, although there are frequent exceptions to this. He generally gives tongue when approaching game. In many parts of our shooting territory, they should be particularly useful and valuable, in spots where the setter or pointer cannot penetrate. The Sussex being powerful and short of leg, and withal well protected by a thick, flat coat, will fearlessly press his way through the densest briars and undergrowth, and ultimately reach and flush the fur or feather secreted therein. It seems but fair that this much-neglected breed should receive the assistance of the Spaniel Club and, like the Cockers, the Springers, and the Clemmers, be brought into public notice and prominence as the others have been through the efforts of this club. The values of the points and a description of the dog will at once make themselves clear in the following standard for the breed from The Dogs of the British Isles, edited by the late J. H. Walsh, Stonehenge, and adopted by that protector and guardian of the Spaniel, the oldest specialty club in America, the American Spaniel Club. Skull, 15. Legs and feet, 10. Eyes, 5. Tail, 10. Nose, 10. Color, 10. Ears, 5. Coat, 5. Neck, 5. Symmetry, 5. Shoulders and chest, 10. Back and back ribs, 10. Total, 100. The skull, value 15, should be long and wide, with a deep indentation in the middle, and a full stop projecting well over the eyes, occiput full but not pointed, the whole giving an appearance of heaviness without dullness. The eyes, value five, are full, soft, and languishing, but not watering so as to stain the coat. The nose, value ten, should be long, three inches to three and one-half inches, and broad, 
Bien liver colored with large open nostrils. The ears, value five, are moderately long and lobe shaped, that is to say, narrow at the junction with the head, wider in the middle, and rounded below, not pointed. They should be well clothed with soft, wavy, and silky hair, but not heavily loaded with it. The neck, value five, is rather short, strong, and slightly arched, but not carrying the head much above the level of the back. There is no throatiness in the skin, but a well-marked frill in the coat. Shoulders and chest, value 10. The chest is round, especially behind the shoulders, and moderately deep, giving a good girth. It narrows at the shoulders, which are consequently oblique, though strong, with full points, long arms, and elbows well let down and these last should not be turned out or in. Back and back ribs, value 10. The back or loin is long and should be very muscular, both in width and depth. For this latter development, the back ribs must be very deep. The whole body is characterized as low, long, and strong. Legs and feet, value 10. Owing to the width of the chest, the four legs of the Sussex Spaniel are often bowed, but it is a defect, notwithstanding, though not a serious one. The arms and thighs must be bony as well as muscular, knees and hocks large, wide, and strong, pasterns very short and bony, feet round, and toes well arched and clothed thickly with hair. The fore legs should be well feathered all down, and the hind ones also above the hocks, but should not have much hair below this point. The tail, value 10, is generally cropped and should be thickly clothed with hair, but not with long feather. The true spaniel's low carriage of the tail at work is well marked in this breed. The color, value 10, of the Sussex spaniel is a well marked but not exactly rich golden liver, on which there is often a washed out look that detracts from its richness. This color is often met with in other breeds, however, and is no certain sign of purity in the Sussex spaniel. The coat, value 5, is wavy without any curl, abundant, silky, and soft. The symmetry, value 5, of the Sussex Spaniel is not very marked, but he should not be devoid of this quality. End of section 18. Section 19 of the American Book of the Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. The American Book of the Dog, G. O. Shields, Editor. Section 19, The Field Spaniel, by J. F. Kirk. The Field Spaniel is the modern name given to the larger breed of Land Spaniels, or Springers, to distinguish them from Water Spaniels and the smaller Land Spaniel, or Cocker. The name is not especially happy as to choice inasmuch as his work is principally confined to cover shooting, where he is particularly useful in finding and raising, or springing, the Woodcock, Partridge, or Pheasant, and his raison d'etre and popularity consists in his special excellence and adaptability for such work. In the English Kennel Club Stud Book, under the head of Field Spaniels, are included Springers and Cockers, except such as have special classes assigned to them, that is, Clumbers and Sussex Spaniels. Thus there are many varieties having distinct and separate characteristics admitted and recognized under the comprehensive cognomen of Field Spaniel, but the intention of scope of this article is to treat of that most popular and handsome variety known as the Black Spaniel. Before going into the points and qualities of this engaging and beautiful breed, a short glance into his history and elements will enable the reader to trace the fact that he is, at present, displayed on our show benches to the admiration of all lovers of sporting dogs. He is of comparatively modern origin. A stupid prejudice, as it seems to the writer, exists in the minds of many worthy old sportsmen 
that deterioration is the most evident fact to them in comparing modern spaniels with the wonderful dogs of their day this is pure nonsense and arises from a kind of halo of glory which we are all apt to surround the memories of our young and enthusiastic days from personal recollection and good opportunities of comparison extending over nearly forty years i feel positive that the handsome setters which old laverack used to bring with him to any native highland moors would not receive more than a vhc card at our modern shows and so with spaniels the dogs of thirty or even fifteen years ago cannot be compared with the cracks of the present day in candidly admitting this fact however i am quite free to confess that there is a strong tendency on the part of modern breeders to exaggerate fancy points and as a consequence an undue appreciation is apt to be given in the cultivation of the different breeds to abnormal excess in the admired and difficult to be obtained qualities that differentiate each class from its kindred and allied breed sometimes at the expense of more useful characteristics for instance spaniel conformation is essentially long and low and this has created a rivalry amongst breeders to produce the longest and lowest now there is a limit to the length and lowness which is clearly defined as a point where an exaggeration in those respects interferes with the necessary activity and ability to work with sufficient ease and vigor in a rough country in england the clumber which is the longest lowest and heaviest of the spaniel tribe is only particularly useful in pheasant preserves where rides are cut through the cover and where strong plodding dogs are required in examining the old authorities we find that there were numerous varieties of sporting spaniels and that each appears to have been selected and bred for the special peculiarities of game and shooting that prevailed in certain districts. In Sussex, the large and handsome golden liver breed was especially prized. In Wales and Devon, the smaller liver and liver and white cockers were especially suited par excellence for the sport in those countries, while farther north and in the Midland counties, the black and tan spaniels were the favorites. After the introduction of dog shows in England about 30 years ago, the blacks appear to have monopolized most attention, and several breeders of historical renown succeeded in improving by judicious selection and crossed the very beautiful black spaniel, till he fairly eclipsed all competitors for honors. More recently, a highly successful experiment of crossing him with the highly esteemed Sussex breed has brought fame and funds as the result to the most intelligent and persevering breeders of the present day. Thus we see that the popular modern black spaniel is a product of judicious and skillful crossing of various breeds. The Reverend W. B. Daniel, whose Rural Sports, published during the first decade of the century, ought to be in every sportsman's library, being the work of a thorough connoisseur and keen critical observer a spaniel cannot be too strong a spaniel cannot be too short on the leg a spaniel cannot be too high couraged thus we see that extremely short heavy limbs are no modern innovation as some claim i am inclined to think however that if the good and reverend old gentleman lived in our day he would be inclined to cry quote, halt You've got them short enough in the leg and heavy enough in the bone, and too many of your prize winners are too crooked and clumsy for any sporting purpose. End quote. And he would be right. The modern tendency is to breed them too heavy in bone and body, and consequently too heavy and unwieldy for use. I refer, of course, to the English prize winners because, on this side of the Atlantic, few indeed of this type have been seen. Our spaniels, as seen on the show benches, are generally absurdly wrong in the opposite direction. A leggy spaniel is an abomination, but we must come to a clear comprehension as to the line to be drawn between long legs and no legs. Now, a short-legged dog, which every spaniel should be, does not mean of necessity a crawling thing that requires to be helped over every obstacle a foot or two high. I have seen a Sussex spaniel bitch, 
measuring only 15 inches full height at shoulder and 40 inches from tip of nose to set on of tail, able to get over a six foot fence with ease, and work a tubby built 18 inch dog to a standstill in half a day's work. Why? Because she had grand supple shoulders, powerful loins and quarters, well bent stifles and hocks, the possession of which gave her what fox terrier men call liberty, while he, though of greater muscular development and short coupled, was tied and cloddy in action. If with length of body and shortness of limb are combined freedom of shoulder action, straight front legs and powerful sickle hocks and stifles with wide and muscular loins, you have a dog surprisingly active for his inches. Idstone, than whom no modern writer knew better what a spaniel should be, speaks of the low, long, and strong spaniel. Now, I insist on it that if your field spaniel has not this confirmation, he cannot be called a good one. The next distinguishing characteristic of a good specimen is his stamp of head, including muzzle, eyes, ears, and expression. The general contour and profile of the face and skull should resemble the shape of a reduced Gordon setter, but with longer, lower hanging and more heavily feathered ears, darker eyes, and rather clear-cut muzzle. The faults to be avoided are heavy, chumpy Newfoundland heads, high set on ears, full eyes, and throaty necks on the one hand, and attenuated tapering muscles with shallow lips and flat, narrow, brainless skulls. Fishy eyes, too light in color, showing limited intelligence and uncertain temper on the other. Good temper, intelligence, docility, and courage must be plainly indicated in the expression of the head and face. And a very important matter also is that the nose should be large, moist, and widespread, showing the possession of high capacity for keen scent. Another necessary mark of a good field spaniel is the coat. The flatter and straighter the coat lies to the body, the better, but it must not be thin and open, and the heavily coated ones are often inclined to be wavy, especially over the neck and rump. It must be of good, soft texture and very bright and glossy. A harsher texture of coat is generally dull in color, but some very excellent spaniels have rather strong hair, and this may be, as is by their owners contended, an indication of the strength of constitution. It is certainly quite becoming when brilliant and straight, but the tendency of such coats is to be scant and open. The feather should always be long and straight or slightly wavy, very heavy on ears, back of forelegs, under the belly, and behind the thighs as well as between the toes, which gives the feet great protection. A great deal of interesting contention and discussion has periodically been occasioned by the interbreeding of Cockers and Springers, and I have been asked to give my opinion as to the line of distinction to be drawn between the field and the Cocker Spaniel. Well, the actual difference is mainly one of size and proportions, and also of temperament. Field Spaniels range from 28 to 45 pounds in weight. Some exceed this latter limit, but I think this is not desirable. Cocker Spaniels should weigh from 18 to 25 pounds, or as the standard defines, even 28 pounds. Field Spaniels should be proportionately lower, heavier in bone, and generally slower and longer in body. Cocker Spaniels proportionately higher, but strong in muscle, more active, and cobbier in build. While both classes should display the essential characteristics of the sporting Spaniel, more dash and energy and general eagerness, which their more active build and smaller size indicate, are expected from the smaller breed, and on the other hand a closer range, stricter obedience to signs and whistles, and the same diligence in work should be looked for in the larger and heavier breed. The cocker may be shorter in head and body, 
but should exhibit a well-formed muzzle, showing a well-developed nose and flues, with lips well pendant, and in both breeds the ears should be long in leather and with good feather, set low on the head, especially so with the larger breed. It is esteemed a point of beauty in field spaniels to have the peak of the occiput well marked and rising in a distinct point above the origin or highest set on of the ears, which must fall close to the head and hang flat to the cheek or side of the head. The height at shoulder of a 22-pound cocker should not exceed 12 inches, and 11 inches would be better. A 28-pound dog may go to 13 and a half inches, but not more. A field spaniel of 45 pounds should not exceed 15 inches at the shoulder, and a smaller one, say 35 pounds, should be 14 inches or less. Straight legs in front should be insisted on, especially in the cocker breed, but not to the extent that obtains in fox terriers. A narrow front is not desirable, and a good depth of chest and well-rounded barrel, with ribs well-developed toward the loins, which should be muscular and strong, are particularly required. The hind quarters should be muscular, and the first and second thighs and hocks well bent, and so arranged as to give vigorous spring to the movement. Cow hocks or hocks outturned are objectionable. The feet are of great importance and should be strong and well furnished with heavy, solid, thick pads, horny soles, and knuckles well sprung and held close together, not splay-footed or spreading. A pendant is the standard for the modern field spaniel or springer adopted by the American Spaniel Club with scale points for judging. Value head, 15. Legs and feet, 15. Ears 10, body and quarters 20, neck 5, coat and feather 15, shoulders and arms 10, tail 10, total 100 points. General appearance, considerably larger, heavier, and stronger in build than the cocker, the modern springer is more active and animated than the clumber and has little of the sober sedateness characteristic of the latter. He should exhibit courage and determination in his carriage and action, as well as liveliness of temperament, though not in this respect to the same restless degree generally possessed by the cocker. His conformation should be long and low, more so than the cocker. Intelligence, obedience, and good nature should be strongly evident. The colors most preferred are solid black or liver, but liver and white, black and white, black and tan, orange, and orange and white are all legitimate spaniel colors. Head, value 15, long and not too wide, elegant and shapely, and carried gracefully. Skull, showing clearly cut brows, but without a very pronounced stop. Occupant, distinct and rising considerably above the set on of the ears. Muzzle, long with well-developed nose, not too thick immediately in front of the eye, and maintaining nearly the same breadth to the point, sufficient flue to give a certain squareness to the muscle, and avoid snippiness or wedginess of face, teeth sound and regular, eyes intelligent in expression and dark, not showing the haw, nor so large as to be prominent or goggle-eyed. Ears, value 10, should be long and hung low on the skull lobe-shaped and covered with straight or slightly wavy silky feather. Neck, value five, long, graceful, and free from throatiness, tapering toward the head, not too thick, but strongly set into shoulders and brisket. Shoulders and arms, value 10. The shoulder blades should lie obliquely and with sufficient looseness of attachment to give freedom to the forearms, which should be well let down. Legs and feet, value 15. The fore legs should be straight, very strong and short. Hind legs should be well bent at the stiffle joint with plenty of muscular power. Feet should be of good size with thick, well-developed pads, not flat or spreading. Body and quarters, value 20. Long with well-sprung ribs, 
strong, slightly arching loins, well coupled to the quarters, which may droop slightly toward the stern. Coat and feather value 15. The coat should be as straight and flat as possible, silky in texture, of sufficient denseness to afford good protection to the skin in thorny coverts and moderately long. The feather should be long and ample, straight or slightly wavy, heavily fringing, the ears, back of the forelegs between the toes, and on back quarters. Tail, value 10, should be strong and carried not higher than the level of the back. End of section 19. Recording by Tom Mack. Section 20 of the American Book of the Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The American Book of the Dog, G. O. Shields, Editor. Section 20. The Cocker Spaniel by J. Otis Fellows. The Spaniel is one of the oldest breeds of dogs in existence, and several other and later breeds owe some of their best qualities to crosses on this breed. So far as known, the Spaniel is, as the name indicates, a native of Spain. From there he was introduced into England, and by crossing, interbreeding, and manipulation, several strains have been thrown off from the original parent stock. Dr. John Caius, writing in 1576, says quote, there be gentle dogs serving the hawk the first of the spaniel called in latin hispaniolis there are two sorts viz the first findeth the game on the land the other findeth the game on the water such as delight on the land play their parts either by swiftness of foot or by often questing to search out and to spring the bird for further hope of advantage or else by some secret sign and privy token bewray the place where they fall the first kind of such serve the hawk the second the net or train the first kind have no peculiar names assigned unto them save only that they be denominated after the bird which by natural appointment he is allotted to take for the which consideration the cocker is thus named as spoken of hereafter such be called dogs for the falcon the pheasant the partridge and such like the common sort of people call them by one general word, namely spaniels, as though this kind of dog came originally and first of all out of Spain. The most part of their skins is white, and if they be marked with any spots, they are commonly red, and somewhat great therewithal, the hairs not growing in such thickness, but that the mixture of them may easily be perceived. We are to choose him by his shape, beauty, metal and cunning hunting his shape being discerned in the good composition of his body as when he hath a round thick head a short nose a long well compact and hairy ear broad-eyed lips a clear red eye a thick neck a broad chest short and well-knit joints round feet strong claws good round ribs a gaunt belly a short broad back a thick bushy and long-haired tail and all his body generally long and well-haired he is small with a wanton playing tail and a busy laboring nose and to give his master warning of what he senteth he doth it by whimpering and whinnies making him adapted for covert shooting they vary in size from fourteen to twenty pounds in weight the doctor then describes other varieties of the spaniel family as follows that kind of a dog whose service is required in following upon the water partly through a natural towardness and partly by diligent teaching is endued with that property this sort is somewhat big and of a measurable greatness having long rough and curly hair not obtained by extraordinary trades but given by nature's appointment yet nevertheless friend gessner i have described and set him out in this manner 
pulled and nodded from the shoulders to the hindmost legs and to the end of his tail which i did for use and custom's cause that being as it were made somewhat bare and naked by the shearing of such superfluity of hair they might achieve more lightness and swiftness and be less hindered in swimming so troublesome and needless a burden being shaken off this kind of dog is properly called aqueticus a water spaniel because he frequenteth and hath recourse to the water where all his game and exercise lieth whereupon he is likewise named a dog for the duck because in that quality he is excellent we use them also to bring us our bolts and arrows out of the water missing our mark whereat we directed our level which otherwise we should hardly recover and oftentimes they restore to us our shafts which we thought never to see touch or handle again after they were lost for which circumstances they are called inquisitors searchers and finders further on the good doctor alludes to the delicate neat and pretty kind of dogs called spaniel gentle or the comforter in latin melitocus or totes of which he writes there is besides those which we have already delivered another sort of gentle dogs in this our english soil but exempted from the order of the residue notwithstanding many make much of those pretty puppies called spaniels gentle and though some suppose that such dogs are fit for no service i dare say by their leaves they be in a wrong box End quote. thus it will be seen that the cocker is one of the oldest and bluest blooded strains of the spaniel family he was the friend and companion of nobility in an age when few other dogs were thus honoured stonehenge in his book dogs of the british isles says quote, the cocker can scarcely be described inasmuch as there are so many varieties in different parts of great britain he may however be said in general terms to be a light active spaniel of about fourteen pounds weight on the average sometimes reaching twenty pounds with very elegant shape a lively and spirited carriage in hunting he keeps his tail down like the rest of his kind works it constantly in a most rapid and merry way alone he may be known from the springer who also works his but solemnly and deliberately without the same pleasurable sensations which are displayed by the cocker the head is round and the forehead raised muzzle more pointed than the springer and the ears less heavy but of good length and well clothed with soft wavy hair which should not be matted in a heavy mass the eye is of medium size slightly inclined to water but not to weep like the toy dogs body of medium length and the shape generally resembling that of a small setter these dogs are well feathered and the work for their feet and legs requires them to be strong and well formed the coat should be thick and wavy but not absolutely curled which last shows the cross with the water spaniel and that gives too much obstinacy with it to conduce to success in covert shooting the color varies from plain liver or black to black and tan white and black white and liver white and red or white and lemon different breeds are noted as possessing some one of these in particular but i am not aware that any one is remarkable as belonging to a superior race End quote. an old work on the dog condensed from stonehenge's british rural sports and the farmer's calendar contains the following description of spaniels quote, field spaniels are divided into two principal groups the springers or large variety used for all sorts of covert game the cockers kept more especially for woodcocks to follow which they must be of a smaller size the springer is again subdivided into the clumber sussex norfolk and other strains while the cocker includes the devonshire and welsh varieties as well as many other strains without special names the cocker spaniel is a much smaller dog than the springer seldom exceeding eighteen pounds in weight for bitches and twenty-five pounds for dogs he is much more active than the springer and of any color more or less marked with white and closely resemble each other in other respects they are nearly mute but whimper slightly on a scent and when well broken they distinguish each kind of game by the note they give out especially the woodcock of which they are very fond 
End quote. Mr. A. W. Langdale, a prominent English authority, quoted by Vero Shaw in his work on the dog, says of the cocker, quote, smaller than their brethren the springers, they work in a totally different style, and in a hedgerow or copse with a thick underwood are invaluable. They, like the springers, are not noisy, but when they do give tongue, it is of such a silvery note as to warm the ardent sportsman's blood. Cockers run into all sorts of color, from lemon and white, orange and white, and orange, most generally seen in Wales, to the liver and white, liver and tan, and roan, generally seen south, and the black and tan of the north, end quote. In undertaking to write an article on the Cocker Spaniel, I may say that I am no novice in this field. I have bred them for 35 years. Spaniels that I bred won prizes at the first bench shows in America, and since 1881 we have won over 1,200 prizes. It was I that first advocated a club to improve the Spaniels of America. I was selected by the Breeders of America as one of the committee to frame a standard for the Cocker Spaniel Club, which is the oldest specialty club in America. The club, organized in 1881, is still alive with a large number of members and is now called the American Spaniel Club. Before 1881, anything and everything that looked like a spaniel was called a cocker. They were generally liver or liver and white in color, long-legged, snippy-headed dogs without any fixed type. All that was required of them was to hunt, and they certainly could do that. The cocker soon improved under the American Spaniel Club standard, but they were not content with a long, low dog, but must have the longest and lowest. The standard was made by practical men of wide experience with cockers in the field, and of course they made a standard for a dog fit for work. But a lot of dude judges who never fired a gun or saw a cocker at work step into the ring and spoil the whole thing by giving prizes to dogs that are cripples, practically unfit for field work. The worse the dog is deformed, the more prizes he can win. I know I am right in the stand that I have taken against the longest and lowest abortion, and others know it, prominent breeders, professional breakers, practical sportsmen. Editors of sportsmen's journals and many others who love a cocker often write me to endorse the position I have taken, but what good I can do is all spoilt by the non-sporting dude judges. For the general purpose dog, there is nothing that can compare with the Cocker Spaniel. He can take the place of the pointer, setter, hound, or retriever, is not too large for the house, makes a good watch dog, and can be taught as many tricks as a poodle, but to secure a concentration of power and endurance, he must have a short back with immense loin for the weight of the dog. His legs must not be too short, but straight and well-boned, and the feet must be firm and cat-like, not splay-footed, loose and flabby, as we too often see them nowadays. Until 1887, we imported or owned about all the good field and cocker spaniels that crossed the pond, Bob the Third, Benedict, Beatrice, Dash, Hindu, Creole, Bub, Jenny, Dandy, Dinah, Miss Oboe the Second, Newton Abbott Lady, Oboe Junior, Young Oboe, Burdette Bob, Bonanza, Bobo, etc. The Jacobs strain was useless for field work. The Pharaoh or Oboe strain not much better, as they had never done any work in England. The Burdett or Bolton Beverly were the best of all, crossed with native stock, they are hard to beat in the field. In the early days of dog shows, Mr. F. Burdett, the first secretary of the Birmingham Dog Show, had a breed of cockers collected near Ladderworth, England, where they had been bred for many years by an old family named Footman. They were unrivaled in appearance as well as at work, taking every prize for which they competed. They were black and tan in color. After Mr. Burdett's death, most of them were sold to Mr. W. W. Bolton, Beverly, York, England, and en passant, I wish to say that Mr. Bolton is the oldest Cocker Spaniel breeder in the world, as well as the greatest authority. Mr. O. S. Hubble, while visiting in England in 1873, purchased a pair of Mr. Bolton, for which he paid $900. 
they were bow and blanche black with rich tan markings blanche whelped october eighteen seventy four eight puppies one of the litter bell was presented to mr a c waddell she died in my kennel in eighteen eighty six but i had several litters from her by champion hornell dandy bullock's spaniels as exhibited originally were very beautiful but by no means typical for the very good reason that they were crossed with the irish water spaniel to get the immense feather and ear so much admired in the early days of dog shows in england but which so deeply impregnated the strain with the fatal top-knot and rough coat that it has never been altogether eradicated this strain was also crossed with the sussex an own brother to the famous flirt and nelly blacks was the pale liver-coloured george who mated with his sister nelly produced one of the very best-looking sussex spaniels ever exhibited this will surely account for the eccentricities of colour cropping up now and again in the progeny the tendency being to reproduce the original colour of their ancestors the colour or odd colour is often intensified by the oboe cross as no one can say how this strain was produced and when papers and letters were sent to mr farrow about the red and buff puppies got by silk and oboe the second he was silent as an oyster I do not object to the reds and buffs myself, for Hornell Velda, a buff, was the best cocker ever seen in America, and Brantford Red Jacket, a red, and Hornell Dick, a buff, although of different type, are as good as any we have. Many of the oldest strains of cockers were lemon, red, and roan, or these colors were more or less intermingled with white. In 1861, I bought a buff cocker from a sailor at Port Colburn. She had been stolen in England, was buff-colored, and the exact image of Velda. The real old-fashioned cocker is not often seen nowadays. The present generation of fanciers never saw them, and surely never used them afield. They simply don't know what they were, or what they ought to be. As to the absurdly long body and low formation, which I hold to be not only a deformity, but altogether contrary to the true formation and type, it must also be against the very utility of the breed. Mr. J. E. Hosford of Washington, D.C., in an article in The American Field, speaking of the good qualities of the cocker, says, there is something about this breed of dogs that at once appeals to our sympathy and no man can own one and not feel constantly on the alert to defend it from abuse slander or misrepresentation there is no other breed of dogs that will win one's affection so completely and hold it so firmly a new spaniel puppy may never replace in its owner's heart some favorite old setter or pointer but it will be sure to find a place there and hold it too against all comers when the shooting season closes the pointer and setter are laid up in ordinary until the approach of the next season if owned by the right man they are regularly exercised and carefully groomed every day and their grateful master never tires of relating their wonderful prowess in the field they rest on their laurels contentedly. Not so with the little cocker. He and his game have no closed season. He seems to know intuitively a thousand and one little tricks and ways to please, entertain, and surprise his master in and out of season. He is constantly at work in a busy, merry, unobtrusive way. He knows your words better than you do yourself and governs himself accordingly. If you want him, he is right here before you, wagging his tail and looking at you intently, as if to say, I'm ready for anything. If you don't want him, he is away in some corner, quietly dozing, or apparently sleeping, but always on the alert. He is never troublesome. He is always able to take care of himself, and to do a great deal else besides. He is a most noble and faithful guardian of your property and person. While he is in your possession, chickens do not scratch the flower beds and wallow around the front porch. Rats do not come into the cellar, nor strange cats into the backyard. Your peaches and melons ripen before they are stolen, and burglars do not tamper with your locks and window catches. 
if anything goes wrong about the place the little cocker is almost always the first one to notice it and the almost human way in which he comes and tells you of it touches certain chords in the heart which do not vibrate too often they are the handiest little companions of the whole dog race they ask for but little room little food and little care yet in return they give a value tangible only to those who know how to love and appreciate a good and faithful dog their worth cannot be told in dollars and cents nor compared with other standards i know of no other breed of dogs so generally useful and worthy of man's companionship at all times and places in town or country although i have not had personal experience on all game yet from close study of their ways and methods and a knowledge of their great intelligence i am sure they would not be out of place whether one hunts ducks or squirrels coons or rabbits partridges pheasants woodcocks or wild turkeys and i was not at all surprised to read in a recent number of the american field that one of our best-known sportsmen have found them very serviceable while hunting deer i know the cocker and i am not afraid to say that he can make himself more or less useful on any game that is hunted and unless a sportsman confines himself to some game to which another breed of dogs is better adapted there is no more useful dog for him to own than a bright active intelligent cocker spaniel now let me ask why are they not more popular why are not thousands instead of hundreds sold every year when they can be utilized at all times and kept in city or country in the house or outdoors at an office or a hotel why are they counted by ones and twos to a county here and there while every town has almost as many setters pointers and hounds as there are men and boys who shoot it is simply because the merits and good qualities of the cocker are not known to the masses it is because our favorites have not been advertised and pushed to the front as the other breeds of sporting dogs have and if cocker breeders and cocker owners would institute field trials for cockers thousands of sportsmen would come and see them run who are now ignorant of their usefulness then we should see the noble little dog take his place at the front where he belongs End quote and not only as a field dog does the cocker excel but as a pet a house dog a companion for children or adults he is without a rival when desired for this purpose alone he may be bred down to twenty pounds or under no dog is more affectionate than the cocker and none has so many ways of showing his affection none is more faithful as a guardian of persons or property and none more quiet unobtrusive or cleanly in his habits in training for the house or field be gentle but firm and patient as soon as the dog knows what you want he will do it himself never under any circumstances use a whip or speak harshly to a cocker you can coax him to do anything but he will not stand the whip it is only a matter of patience to teach a cocker to do anything that a dog can do they can almost talk i now own two that can sing and they will accompany any instrument that is played the small dogs seem to learn tricks quicker than the large ones and the cocker never forgets my son taught a little cocker forty-two distinct tricks in a year this little dog was better and quicker than any two messenger boys in the country was also a master hand on woodcock and ruffed grouse a friend of mine has a handsome black and tan cocker neptune by name who considers himself the chosen friend the guardian the nurse the messenger of the family when his master comes into the house after an absence of a few hours the little dog is beside himself with joy he leaps dances and rubs against the man and in various ways shows his delight when his master sits down the little dog will if invited leap upon his lap rub and caress him in a perfect ecstasy of joy and then without waiting for a command he will leap down run and get the man's slippers and bring them to him as much as to say here my friend put these on and be comfortable if the master lies down on the sofa the dog lies beside him either on the sofa or on the floor as directed and any one who approaches him while asleep is warned by an angry growl and a show of ivory that the atmosphere about there is unhealthy for intruders if the master move uneasily or moan in his sleep 
nep is up in an instant peering anxiously into his face whining and showing the most intense anxiety for his charge this same delight is shown when any member of the family returns from even a temporary absence and the same solicitude and care are bestowed upon any member of the family who lies down during the day at night nep seems to think it is his duty to guard the room of his young mistress he sleeps just outside her door and any one who attempts to approach it gets into trouble at once there are no small children in this family but when friends call and bring children the little dog is delighted beyond measure he at once takes charge of the little folks and not even their own mother is allowed to punish them in his presence after caressing and romping with them a few minutes he sails away gets his ball brings it and in all but words invites his playmates to a friendly game they throw the ball through the halls he retrieves it lays it at their feet and looking up at them beseeches them with his great dark eyes and eager excited motions to throw it again he plays hide and seek with them as enthusiastically and as skillfully as any one of their own number some member of the party holds him and blinds him by placing his long silky ears over his eyes when the signal is given and he is released he races through the house with the speed of a greyhound for a few moments in a kind of general search then he cools down and goes about his work more systematically he approaches looks at and smells of each child in the room even if there be a dozen of them apparently in order to learn which one is missing then he starts on a tour of the rooms and halls searching for both foot and body scent and soon locates the fugitive no matter where he or she may be the little children frequently step into a closet and close the door but nep finds them all the same and having smelt at the threshold until sure he is right sets up an emphatic barking that soon brings the hidden treasure laughing and screaming into the light once when playing this game with him a little girl hid on top of the piano nep hunted her through all the rooms and finally decided that she was in the parlor he ran sniffing and yelping eagerly from side to side of this room looking in and behind every chair finally he took up her trail and followed it he found the chair from which she had stepped onto the piano leaping into this he stood up with his feet on the back of it and this enabled him to see the little miss perched on the centre of the lid his barking though most excited and vigorous was well nigh drowned in the shouts and screams of laughter in which all the spectators old and young joined nep carries notes and packages up and down stairs and anywhere about the house thus saving his master and mistress many a step these charges he always delivers to the person to whom he is sent and it is useless for any one else to try to get them from him enwrapped when the postman rings the bell nep goes down gets the mail and delivers it safely to his mistress what is he worth what do you imagine it would take to buy such a friend if you owned him he is worth his weight in gold but that wouldn't buy him his owner would as soon sell one of his own children as nep and yet any well-bred cocker may be taught these things if only a reasonable amount of time effort patience and horse sense be devoted to the task in breeding i do not try to have one dog correct faults in the other but try to have both as perfect as i can get them i do not object to in and in breeding as it fixes the type and i have never yet seen any bad results from it such as deformities or loss of capacity to learn after the bitch has been bred i give her exercise until she is ready to whelp i always give her a quiet place to whelp in with plenty of room the bitch always seems to do better alone but care must be taken in cold weather that the puppy shall not get chilled cocker spaniels are always docked i do it when the puppies are from one to two weeks old before they can move around much then the wound heals quicker the operation is painless let one person hold the puppy's tail on a block of wood while another with a sharp chisel and a mallet removes just half of the tail all well-bred cockers are natural hunters and retrievers and their senses of sight and smell are more acute than those of either the setter or pointer captain mcmurdo told me that when breaking setters and pointers he always had his little cocker bitch at heel and he could tell by her actions when near game although the setters and pointers arranging ahead would give no notice of it 
when a cocker is under control he is trained he should be taught to stop instantly and to come in promptly he will always work his ground thoroughly but must not range out of gunshot because he flushes his game and if this be done too far from the gun you lose your chance for a shot i do not train my dogs to drop to shot or wing but always to stop and at the word i think this is important for while you have the dog under better control at a close charge in such a position he does not have a chance to use his eyes i have often seen them stand on their hind feet and jump up to see where the bird has gone our best woodcock shooting here is in tall corn woodcock dogs i do not train to drop to shot a wing but let them go for all they are worth then the bird will top the corn and you can get a fair shot a writer in land and water gives some excellent advice regarding the training of spaniels and i cannot do better than to quote a few paragraphs in his own words he says most people are contented if a dog will work within gunshot and push out the game for him to kill almost any mongrel with the necessary practice and experience will do this but i assume that the sportsman takes a pride in his dogs likes to have good-looking and well-bred ones and if he wishes to shoot in comfort and in good form when he uses spaniels it is quite as necessary to have them well trained as any other breed of sporting dog i will therefore give such directions as experience has taught me are useful i know no dog that more repays the trouble of breaking yourself that is if you have the requisite knowledge and patience than the spaniel who from the natural love and affection he has for his master more than any other dog should be more ready to work for him than any one else the spaniel's natural love of and ardor in hunting require a firm hand over him until he is matured there is an old saying that a spaniel is no good until he is nearly worn out there is a great deal of truth in this and the spaniel's enthusiasm must be largely reduced before he can get down to cool earnest work i recollect an old bitch that belonged to a devonshire sportsman that was so cunning that she used to catch as much game as he shot when the old man died i bought the bitch as she had a great reputation but she was far too much of a pot hunter for me i could have backed her against a moderate gun any day spaniels get very knowing and working to the gun after a few months and it is astonishing what efforts they will make to maneuver the game out to the shooter i have seen numberless instances of this particularly in hedgerow shooting when i have frequently seen a clever old dog on winding game not make a rush at it which would have had the effect of sending it out on the other side but pop through the fence and push it out to you this as i have said is only acquired by experience and a young vigorous spaniel will sometimes push up the game irrespective of lending any aid to the gun a really good spaniel even when he is busy questing and bustling about should always have an eye to the gun and to work to it instead of for himself and his own gratification and amusement you cannot well begin too early to train young spaniels to get their noses down and to hunt close to work thoroughly every bit of ground and every hole and corner that can possibly shelter a head of game this is what the spaniel is required to do when he is grown up and in order to inculcate this habit in him and to discourage him in what he is so prone to do namely go ahead you should begin by flinging small bits of meat or boiled liver into small patches of turnips in the garden or small patches of thick bushes or any kind of covert that will cause him to seek for it with his nose and not with his eyes by no means enter your young spaniels to rabbits if you can avoid it they take to them naturally when they get the chance and there is no fear of their not having the opportunity soon enough enter them to winged game by all means and for this purpose get an old cock partridge cut one wing and put him in a small patch of thick covert never take young spaniels into large or thick coverts where they can get away from under your eye confine your working ground to small bits of covert patches of turnips bushes bits of gorse anything in fact where you will be likely to have thorough control over them and where they are in reach of an attendant whom you should always have with you to turn them to your whistle 
i have found it a first-rate plan to take them out on the sides of rivers and ponds where there are lots of moorhens and plenty of sedges and rushes let them hunt in the rushes till they are tired and a morning's work of this kind will do them more good than anything i know of they soon become fond of the work it teaches them to hunt close and they are perfectly under the control of yourself and assistant teach them early to drop to hand and shot and spare no pains about it this is a part of the spaniel's education which is generally neglected i know many men who instead of making them drop to shot make them come to heel using the words come around or heel it answers every purpose and as it brings every dog to you and he has to work right away from you again when he gets the signal it has its advantages in keeping them under control but on the whole i prefer the dropping to shot and wing instantly it is difficult to make a spaniel drop to fur and if you can keep him from chasing merely putting up hares and rabbits but not following them after they are started rest satisfied that little more is necessary or desirable i once saw an interesting thing of this kind i was shooting with a gentleman near southampton in one of his coverts to a team of small clumbers we were both standing in a ride and saw a charming little bitch feathering near us toward the ride just as she got to it out popped a rabbit and scuttled down the ride followed out of the covert by the bitch but as soon as she cleared the wood and was in the ride close on to the rabbit which she had not seen till then down she dropped entirely of her own accord she had not seen either of us neither did we know that we were each observing this pretty bit of work until we compared notes a few minutes after and agreed that we had never seen anything better it is rather difficult to describe but to me it was worth all the afternoon's shooting and it made an impression at the time which is as fresh as ever now she was i need scarcely say thoroughly broken if it is desired to make young spaniels take water and they show any disinclination to it the best plan is to take them to a stream which you can wade through walk through to the other side and they will probably follow you at once if they do not walk straight away from the opposite side and go out of sight they will come after making a little fuss about it if you have not a suitable shallow stream but are obliged to make use of a deep river for your purpose get an attendant whom they do not know to hold your puppies while you go round by a bridge out of their sight and come down opposite to them and follow the instructions i have given above remember many young dogs have at first a great fear of getting out of their depth all at once but will freely dabble into a shallow stream so that it is best to lead them on by degrees once having got off their legs and finding that it is an easy matter to swim there will be no further trouble always choose warm weather for this teaching there is however no better plan of teaching them to take to the water than letting them hunt more hens as to whether spaniels should be taught to retrieve or not will depend on what your requirements are the number you use and so on if you own but one dog by all means take all the trouble you can to perfect him in this business and for this purpose you should choose your whelp from a strain that retrieves naturally if you work three or four spaniels together unless they are thoroughly broken they all want to retrieve and it is often the cause of much trouble nothing looks worse than to see several dogs all tugging at one bird except perhaps the bird itself afterward if your dogs are sufficiently broken and under command and will drop to shot or come to heel and you can direct either one of them to find the wounded game while the others remain down or at heel you can let them take it in turn which shall be allowed the pleasure and honor of recovering the wounded but how rarely one sees spaniels so well under command as this in the case of a team of spaniels i think it better that they should not be allowed to retrieve and this duty is better confined to a regular retriever it is a good plan with young spaniels to walk round a covert toward evening when pheasants are out at feed in the stubbles having an attendant with you to prevent them getting into covert and walk in a zigzag way about the stubbles you can generally give them plenty of practice in this way and enter them well to the scent of winged game if your puppies do not readily return to your whistle but show a disposition to go on turn your back upon them and go the other way which will generally have the desired effect 
and a rage or a crack of the whip from your attendant will greatly aid it if a puppy is too fast put up a foreleg in his collar or tie a strap tightly round one hind leg just above the hock but neither of these must remain long without changing or you will produce swelling and inflammation apart from the pleasure and satisfaction there is in shooting to dogs of your own breaking there is this advantage that they learn to understand your ways and to know thoroughly your every look and motion while you at the same time perfectly understand them in selecting young spaniels to break if you do not breed your own be most particular in getting them from a good working strain of a sort that a friend of mine designates as savage for work to work spaniels in thick large woods you should go always with them to work them or send someone they are accustomed to work with or they will become wild or slack End quote. a writer in the american field also gives the following good points on this subject i have had an extensive experience in training cockers and have always found them exceedingly tractable and anxious to learn i use the same methods for yard breaking that are commonly used for setters the cocker is a natural retriever and readily fetches to hand my old dog jip i trained with great care and had him completely under my control he would charge at word or sign as far as he could hear or see me and would obey the motion of my hand in sending him in any direction he was obedient to whistle so that when in motion one whistle would stop him and when stopped one whistle would start him in whatever direction i motioned one long whistle would call him to my feet he would follow to heel anywhere when a year old i took him out for woodcock the first time he was ever in cover i had not been on woodcock ground ten minutes before he gave voice i knew that meant birds and immediately gave one short sharp whistle which brought the dog to a stop taking a good position i gave one more whistle when he started quickly giving voice and flushed a woodcock which my friend shot calling to jip to fetch he obeyed instantly bringing the bird in tenderly we hunted about four hours raised nine woodcocks and shot seven jip found them all and retrieved every dead bird never failing to obey me and never flushed a bird until ordered to go on always giving me warning of the presence of a bird by giving voice i had been unfortunate in not living in a partridge country since i was a boy and for that reason have never trained a cocker for partridge hunting still i believe i can take any one of my cockers and hunt partridges as i have woodcocks but my friends who use cockers for partridge hunting usually allow the dog to tree the birds all the experience i have had with cockers on partridges was when a boy and without any trouble i had my little spaniel trained so he would circle about a bird giving voice as he ran gradually drawing the circle smaller until he flushed the bird which would seek refuge in the nearest tree End quote. for fuller and more complete instructions on this subject i would commend to my readers a little book called the spaniel and its training by d bolton herald it is an excellent work and is invaluable to owners of spaniels I would advise anyone about to purchase a cocker to get a puppy and train it for his own use the best worker i ever owned was trained on the street going to and from my shop buy a dog that will mature at about twenty six or twenty eight pounds a cobby dog that stands about fourteen inches at the shoulder with head of medium length good straight legs and hard round feet avoid the long-headed long-bodied and short crooked-legged dog as you would a serpent for it is a physical impossibility for them to do good work also avoid a dog with a light-colored eye for my part i always prefer a bitch as they learn easier are more faithful and never want to roam in quest of sexual pleasures following is the american spaniel club's standard for cocker spaniels general appearance value ten head fifteen eyes five ears ten neck and shoulders ten body fifteen length five legs and feet fifteen coat ten tail five total one hundred a cocker spaniel must not weigh more than twenty eight pounds nor less than eighteen pounds 
general appearance symmetry etc value ten a cocker spaniel should be eminently a well-built graceful and active dog and should show strength without heaviness or clumsiness any of the spaniel colors is allowable but beauty of color and marking must be taken into consideration head value fifteen should be of fair length muzzle cut off square tapering gradually from the eye but not snippy skull rising in a graceful curve from the stop and with the same outline at the occiput the curve line being flatter but still curving at the middle of the skull the head should be narrowest at the eyes and broadest at the set on of ears and viewed from the front the outline between the ears should be a nearly perfect segment of a circle the stop is marked and the groove runs up the skull gradually becoming less apparent till lost about halfway to the occiput this prevents the domed king charles skull and there should not be the heaviness of the large field spaniels but a light graceful well-balanced head jaws level neither undershot nor pig-jawed teeth strong and regular eyes value five round and moderately full they should correspond in color with the coat ears value ten lobular set on low leather fine and not extending beyond the nose well clothed with long silky hair which must be straight or wavy no positive curls or ringlets neck and shoulders value ten neck should be sufficiently long to allow the nose to reach the ground easily muscular and running into well-shaped sloping shoulders body value fifteen ribs should be well sprung chest of fair width and depth body well ribbed back short in the coupling flank free from any tucked up appearance loin strong length value five from tip of nose to root of tail should be about twice the height at shoulder rather more than less legs and feet value fifteen the four legs should be short strong in bone and muscle straight neither bent in nor out at elbow pasterns straight short and strong elbows well let down the hind legs should be strong with well bent stifles hocks straight looked at from behind and near the ground feet should be of good size round turning neither in nor out toes not too spreading the soles should be furnished with hard horny pads and there should be plenty of hair between the toes coat value ten should be abundant soft and silky straight or wavy but without curl chest legs and tail well feathered there should be no top knot or curly hair on top of the head tail value five usually docked carried nearly level with the back at work it is carried lower with a quick nervous action which is characteristic of the breed this ends section twenty the cocker spaniel section twenty one of the american book of the dog this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. The American Book of the Dog, G. O. Shields, Editor, Section 21, The Chesapeake Bay Dog, by George W. Kierstead. For the past dozen years, much has been written pro and con in regard to this truly American dog american at least in name and characteristics and i am inclined to believe in origin strange to say of all that has been written and said scarcely any two writers agree as to the general makeup and appearance of the typical chesapeake on this account it is extremely difficult to handle the subject properly and it is almost dangerous to advance ideas and ask that they be accepted as authority having always stood on the results of my own investigations and experiences on this subject and having met in the press or in the judge's ring representatives from every kennel of chesapeakes in the united states only to see them carry off the field of battle or from the show bench only such empty honors as were left after all higher honors were bestowed upon the strain of chesapeakes which i champion i fully appreciate the fact that a great deal might be quoted 
that has already been written by men to whom I give all due respect, but fear it would be of little benefit to the reader, and it might only confuse the uninitiated. If you will stop for a moment and recall all you have heard and read on the subject of Chesapeake's, I will ask, did not the relator, with two or three exceptions, tell what some friend had seen, heard, or experienced in regard to them, and tell little or nothing of his own observations and experience? I know nothing by experience in regard to Chesapeake Bay Dog's work on the open waters of Chesapeake Bay, and do not intend to discuss the subject from that standpoint. But from the standpoint wherein lies my experience on marshes, lakes, sloughs, and rivers west and north of the Ohio River, I contend that a dog that does good work in this locality can and will do good work on the open waters of the bay, or in any other ducking waters, and I further contend that a dog to do good and satisfactory work in this locality must have marked characteristics such as are, so far as I know, not possessed by any other dog than the Chesapeake. It was owing to this fact that I became interested in the study and breeding of these dogs 15 years ago. During all the subsequent years, I have had the best of opportunities to study their weak and their strong points, as well as their history. In all these years of breeding, I can say I did not breed for profit alone. From the first, I was convinced that I was not laboring in vain but for a noble purpose. My motto was, breed for the advancement of the Chesapeake Bay duck dog and for the benefit of sportsmen. To this I attribute my success, and success surely has been the result of my efforts. There is not today a Chesapeake Bay dog in the West of anything more than local note that does not owe his or her origin to the Sunday Nelly strain of which I have the honor of being the originator. As duck retrievers, these dogs have no superiors. It is a question yet unsettled by public trial as to whether their equals have been produced. There is no breed of dogs whose history extends back so far as that of the Chesapeake's, of which so little is known by the general public, and the origin of which is so closely veiled in mystery. No such breed was known in the United States until near the end of the 18th century. There is no question as to the fact that the breed originated along the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries, and that it derives its name from this fact. From the best authorities obtainable, we learn that about the year 1807, the ship Canton of Baltimore, Maryland, fell in at sea with an English brig in a sinking condition bound from Newfoundland to England. The crew were taken aboard the Canton, also two puppies, a dog and a bitch. The English crew were landed on their native soil and the two puppies purchased from the captain for a guinea apiece and taken to Baltimore. The dog puppy, a dingy red in color, was called Sailor and was given to a Mr. John Mercer of West River. The bitch was black, was called Canton, and was given to Dr. James Stewart of Sparrow Point. These dogs were compactly built not so large as the Newfoundland, hair not long but thick and wavy. They individually attained great reputations as duck retrievers, and it is said of them that they would follow a cripple for miles through ice and a heavy sea, and if successful in a capture, would always bring it back to their owner. The dog, Sailor, became the property of a gentleman of wealth, and was taken to his estate on the east shore of Maryland, where his progeny is still known as the sailor breed. There is no positive proof that there were ever any dogs produced from the union of these two, Sailor and Canton. Neither is there anything to show there was not a production from them. The natural supposition is that there was, and it is to these two dogs that we feel we can give credit for the now famous breed of Chesapeake Bay duck dogs. There is now to be met with a great variety of what are called Chesapeake Bay Duck Dogs, but my opinion is that if the pedigree of some of these were obtainable, you would find that a cross or two has been made on either the Setter or Spaniel, and it is in this way that I account for the different types to be seen. The reason this crossbreeding has been resorted to is that the Chesapeake Bay Dog, with an authenticated pedigree, 
is not to be met with every day, and especially since the close of the late Civil War, which made such devastation in the southern states. While there are a number of dogs used for breeding purposes and their produce sold as Chesapeake Bay dogs, which do not even reproduce themselves, much less transmit the qualities claimed for the Chesapeake Bay dogs, yet there are and have been for years dogs used for breeding the progeny of which can be depended upon to reproduce themselves and transmit this with their other good qualities. And this I consider the best evidence obtainable, that the Chesapeake Bay duck dog does now exist in purity and that it is as distinct a breed as the setter, pointer, or any other breed, though much fewer in numbers. Many breeds of dogs have a tail of mongrels hanging to them, which is in some cases larger than the breed itself. And unhappily, the Chesapeake Bay dog happens to be one of the cases where the tail is trying hard to wag the dog. For years, this promiscuous breeding to which we have attributed the different types of dogs to be seen, which are called Chesapeake Bay dogs, was kept up along the shores of the Chesapeake Bay, and to obtain specimens that would conform to the description of Sailor and Canton was well nigh impossible. Still, they did and do now exist, and the sportsmen of today can thank O.D. Folks, J.J. Turner, and one or two others in the East, and the writer and one other breeder in the West, for the perpetuation and production of the most perfect specimens that are now obtainable. A correspondent of the American field who signs Banshee gives this as his idea of the correct type of this breed. The genuine and true type of the Chesapeake Bay duckling dog should not be taller than a medium-sized setter, though a great deal heavier in the body, short legs, long neck, rather a pointed nose running back into a broad head, reminding one very much of the other with rather small ears set up high on the head, its face having a very quick, bright, and intelligent expression with short straight hair without a wrinkle in it, from one and one-fourth to one and one-half inches long in its longest places, and very short about the head and legs. Under this short straight hair, by opening it, you will find a kind of fur about a half inch long." End quote. The characteristics of the Chesapeake Bay dog that especially commend him to wild fowl shooters are first his good, hard common sense. There is no retriever so cool-headed and quiet as the Chesapeake, and for this reason he does not use up his strength foolishly, going after he knows not what, and many times nothing. You have all seen hot-headed dogs do this frequently. Your Chesapeake has the strength and power to go where he will, and he has the will to go where your duck falls, be it through ice, mud, rice beds, or what it may, he will get there. When he does get there, if the duck proves to be a cripple, he has the stick to to follow the trail until he picks up Mr. Cripple. He also has a nose that does not require him to go chasing all over the marsh in hope of running onto the duck. He goes directly to it and retrieves it. Many men are of the opinion that the Chesapeake depends largely on sight to secure his game. It is a mistaken idea. His nose is equal to that of either the setter or pointer. Dr. James Norris of Baltimore, Maryland, writing of the intelligence and sagacity of a noted dog of this breed, says, There are many wonderful exploits attributed to this famous animal, which pass the supposed bounds of animal instinct and enter the domain of human reason. And although substantiated by living witnesses, I would hesitate to repeat them, lest they might be pronounced, at least, apocryphal. There is one of his performances not only well authenticated, but so frequently imitated by some of his offspring that I will relate it. When retrieving ducks after a successful shot over decoys, he would not only pass the dead, but those that were severely wounded, and pursue those that were only slightly hurt, and that human reason alone would teach that unless immediately pursued would escape. After securing these, he would collect the remainder, deposit them at his master's feet, and quietly resume his position, his eyes barely above the front of the blind, 
gazing as eagerly and intently as the sportsman at the approaching game. End quote. The Chesapeake has a coat, the like of which is possessed by no other known breed. It must be seen to be appreciated. In color, it is dead grass or sedge, a reddish brown or brownish red, not liver color. In length, the hair is from half an inch to an inch and a half, is very dense and wavy, not curly. In the fall of the year, it looks as much like an old faded out buffalo robe as anything one can imagine. Like all other haired animals, the Chesapeake dog takes on a fall or winter coat. With this new coat each fall comes what we shall call a filling coat that in great measure protects the skin from coming in contact with the water. They will come out of the water, give one or two shakes, and I will defy any man to find one of them wet down to the skin, or even take them before they shake and you cannot. This filling coat can be detected best by taking a clip of the coat and looking at the butt end of it. There seems to be something about it, say what you can, but you can't describe it for there is no other dog's coat that looks like it or that acts like it in water. They are intelligent and quick to catch your meaning, and when they do, they never forget. Show them once or twice what you want them to do, and they will never forget it. As companions, they are perfect, for the reason that they are fond of one master and will know no other person. There seems to be no limit to the amount of endurance they possess. For example, I will cite the dog Monday by Sunday out of Nellie. This dog went into the hands of a market shooter on the famous Kankakee Marshes in Indiana at the age of about 15 months. For nine years worked an average of four days out of seven from the time the ducks came in in September until they left when the marshes froze up. His work was done for a man that averaged a thousand ducks every fall. We have an actual record of this dog having retrieved over 11,000 ducks. Yet Monday is no exception to the rule as to the matter of endurance. One of these dogs will last the most ardent duck shooter with ordinary care eight to 10 years. The general utility of this dog is a strong point in their favor, especially where a man keeps but one dog. While I claim they are the best duck retrievers on earth, this is not their only virtue. I consider them the best all-around dog a man can keep about his place. I use my Chesapeakes for jumping pheasants and quails, treeing squirrels, running rabbits, and in fact all sorts of upland shooting, and I know others who do likewise. As coon dogs, they have no equals at the shakeout, as they never turn tail. As guardians of property, they are equal to the mastiff and have not the objectionable features of the bulldog. To substantiate these assertions as to the general utility of these dogs, I deem it but just to quote from a few autograph letters I have received from brother sportsmen in regard to them. Muscatine, Iowa, November 9, 1886. Dear sir, I presume you are always glad to hear of the doings of the Chesapeake, so I write you a word or two about Puppy Jack. He is growing very fast and seems full of life and health, and yet is as dignified and watchful as a mastiff. I took him out hunting with a fine setter bitch a week ago, not expecting to ask him to do any work, but only to get used to the sound of a gun. He watched Nellie bring out one or two ducks, and then we shot three mud hens to try him. Nellie brought two and Jack one. Then we let one of the boys go down to the lake and shoot mud hens at various points out of our sight. Making a circuit, we came to the lake a mile below and shot a mud hen or two to warm him up, and then walked up the bank of the lake, which is full of water lilies, etc. Now we couldn't see the mud hens killed by our companions and didn't know where to look for them. And Nellie made no sign to get any of them, but Jack did not miss one going without a word of command, sometimes 50 yards out into the lake, and in one instance making three trips and bringing a bird each time. This may not be new to you, but I must confess I have never heard of such work in a young dog, and no one here has. He seems to love the water and will, from choice, break the ice along shore to play in the water. 
his magnificent coat being an absolute protection against cold or wet. My children are perfectly delighted with him. My wife never saw so nice a dog. And I, well, I wouldn't look at a hundred dollars of any man's money in exchange for him. He is watchful, plucky, and strong, embodies all I could ask in a Mastiff or a Newfoundland, and has so many other excellent qualities that if he is a fair sample of the breed, and I presume he is, I wonder that anyone would prefer the breeds of single virtues to this omnibus dog. When I ordered him, I thought I was getting a good retriever, but I find that besides retrieving better than any dog I have ever seen, he also excels in virtues not claimed for him. Fergus Falls, Minnesota, September 23, 1885. Dear Sir, I have been in the field every day since receiving the Chesapeake puppy. I received him at Crookston, September 2nd, took him immediately out of the box, fed him, and while sitting on the express office steps with a number of my friends, the puppy saw a piece of paper blowing along the road, and without a word went and got it, laid it down at my feet, and crawled up into my lap. I took him into my wagon, and the same day carried him out in the country, twenty-five miles, returned in two days, and took him out with me shooting mallards with a number of my friends, who wanted to see more of him and the first mallard I shot was in a small, shallow pond of mud and water, not deep enough to allow him to swim. The puppy was at heel when the duck fell, and I did not intend to send him for it alone, but without a word he started out, felt his way timidly at first, reached the duck, which was a monster, took hold of its body first and tried hard to lift it out of the mud and water, but could not. Then he took hold of its wing and tried to carry it, but of course would step on it. He finally became discouraged, laid it down, and commenced to cry. I at once waited out and helped him bring it in, and you never saw a prouder dog in all your life, or perhaps a prouder man. All this was done without a word of command and entirely at his own free will. I would not allow him to do or try to do much work, as he is too young, but he has never refused anything that I have asked, and I can only express my opinion of him by saying he is a dandy. Very intelligent, he is easy to control, and I now have only to point my finger at him to make him down, and on my third trial he would creep behind me on a sneak on ducks. Note by author. This puppy was whelped May 31, 1885, and was less than four months old at the writing of the above letter. Speaking of the courage of the Chesapeake, Mr. Poinier says, Their pluck and courage is indomitable, and the more incessant the shooting, the more fierce and determined they are in their work. And woe unto the dog who gets too near them when they are after a duck. Upon several occasions when shooting late in the season, I have tested their courage when everything was frozen up, but a few open holes in the deep lakes. These holes being kept open by the ducks congregating in such large numbers that the water could not freeze. The shooting at such a place can be imagined. Three and four guns would be kept warm. At such times I have seen one Chesapeake Bay dog do all the retrieving, and every time he brought a duck he had to climb on the ice. Other dogs in the party got scared or froze out and could not be induced to go in. I never saw a Chesapeake refuse to go. It matters not how cold the weather might be. A stiff current with running ice or any obstruction is all the same to them. Quitting is not in their vocabulary. Irish water spaniels and other retrievers have been tried beside them on Chesapeake Bay and invariably have quit. From the above quotations, the reader may infer that the Chesapeake needs little or no training. While this is true to a certain extent, it is just as necessary to subject him to your will as if he were a setter or a pointer. My plan in handling the Chesapeake has been to make him my companion as much as possible. He will naturally take to retrieving as soon as he can run. Allow him to follow his inclination in this matter and indulge him on every possible occasion. Teach him to deliver in hand and thus avoid the possibility of losing winged birds after your dog has brought them to the boat or blind. 
By the time he is four or six months old, he will be doing all sorts of retrieving for you about the house. When four or six months old, if this period comes in the fall, take him to the shooting grounds. It is to be supposed that in his companionship with you, he has meantime learned to love the gun. Shoot your duck and see to it that you are on favorable rather than unfavorable ground for your puppy to see it fall. Go with him for the first one, if he gives you time to do so. If the fall be a favorable one, the chances are you will have no occasion to go. From this time on, if you use judgment in your shooting for a few outings, you will have little or no trouble. It will be but a short time until you find you have only to look for ducks coming and your dog will look after those you knock down. And when he once goes at his work in this way, do not interfere with him by trying to make him come into the blind or get down in the boat out of sight. His coat and color provide for this, and he appears to be aware of the fact. I am a strong believer in natural instincts and insist that to have a dog do his work satisfactorily, he must do it for the love of the sport rather than because he is forced to do it. I have never yet seen a forced retriever that could be depended upon at all times. They are liable to become sulky at times, and when they do, the owner is liable to get in the same mood. Then the sport is over for that day, at least. Companionably handled, the chances are this trouble will be avoided. I would not be understood as saying that all that is necessary is to buy one of these puppies, grow him up to six months, take him to the marsh, and you have a thorough retriever for ten years to come. Far from it. The first six months, it may be ten or twelve months of his life, are to be a continuous period of breaking and training. Not a breaking all jammed into one week or two, but continuous, little by little. And when the six or twelve months are past, you will be surprised to see how much your puppy will do for you and how little trouble he has been. In my opinion, dog breaking is a thing in which no stated rules can be followed. The most necessary thing is, first, fair material on which to work, and then lots of good, hard common sense on the part of the trainer. A few words on breeding may be of interest. First of all, if you wish to be successful, do not attempt crossbreeding. By this I mean do not attempt to improve the breed of Chesapeake's by an infusion of other blood, such as Setter, Spaniel, etc. These experiments have already been made and with the worst possible results. For instance, on the Irish Setter, result, a litter of all black puppies. On the English Setter, result, a litter of all colors but the desired one. On the Irish and English Spaniels, result, dark liver and black, the predominating colors as a rule, large ears and so rattle-headed that nothing could be done with them. A second cross on the half breeds no better results than the first. For my breeding stock, I always select from the litters with a view to producing the color desired. I make it a rule to breed a bitch inclined to white to a dog inclined to black and vice versa. By this I mean a bitch that showed a lighter shade of color at the end of hairs than close to the skin, and a dog whose coat showed as dark or darker at ends than at the skin. I do not think it advisable to mate an extra light-colored bitch with an extra light-colored dog, or an extra dark bitch with an extra dark dog. The happy medium is what I always try to strike as to breeding stock. I have never failed to get good results as to color when these rules were observed. I have known litters thrown in other kennels that contained two and three cream white puppies. I have known of dark livers and blacks. In all these cases, it was no fault of the breeding of either the sire or the dam, but simply the result of improper blending of colors, and color I consider one of the essential points of the Chesapeake. I have known the eyes to be decidedly off color, both too light and too dark, from the same improper cause. Breeding Chesapeake's is just like breeding any other class of dogs. A deal of good, hard, common sense must be used to obtain the best results. To overcome a weak or objectionable feature, 
you must counterbalance it with the opposite feature, and it may take two or three or even more generations to eradicate it. These dogs are not early developers as to form, seldom coming into perfect form and coat under 18 months or two years. On this account, I would advise not breeding under this age. Another advantage to be gained by late breeding is you have time to have your dog fairly well broken, and then if he or she proves a successful sire or dam, you are so much the gainer. The bitch should have entire freedom from the time of service until the puppies are weaned. Chesapeake puppies, as a rule, are hardy and easily raised, there seldom being a frail one among them. At the age of three to five weeks, they should be separated into yards, with not more than two to the yard, as they are savage fighters and are liable to ruin one another. I have known nearly the entire litter to jump on one of their number and literally tear it to pieces. I may say here that if you are ever so fortunate as to own a Chesapeake dog, you will not be likely under any circumstances to be called upon to take his part in a fight, as he will be able to do that himself, unless beset by several big dogs at once. He will generally be found capable of taking care of himself in the field, the marsh, on the road, or in a fight, and woe be to the man that attempts to chastise you or yours in his presence. In the writing of this article, I have tried to avoid anything that might confuse the reader, especially the controversial points in regard to the different types. And lest some may not clearly understand me on this subject, I beg to reaffirm that there is but one true type of Chesapeake Bay duck dog, and he has the thick, heavy, wavy coat. The future of the Chesapeake Bay Dog is somewhat uncertain, and yet I can see no reason why, with the number of good specimens now distributed all over the North and West, this breed should not rapidly increase in numbers and in popularity, especially so since the willing rather than the forced retriever is becoming more and more the choice of sportsmen every day. Standard and Points of Judging the Chesapeake Bay Dog Value Head, including ears, lips, and eyes, 15. Stern, 4. Neck, 6. Symmetry and quality, 6. Shoulders and chest, 15. Coat and texture, 16. Back quarters and stiffles, 15. Color, 8. Legs, elbows, hocks, and feet, 15. Total, 100 points. Head, broad, running to nose, only a trifle pointed, but not at all sharp. Eyes of yellow color, ears small, placed well up on the head, face covered with very short hair. Neck, should only be moderately long and with a firm, strong appearance. Shoulders and chest, shoulders should have full liberty with plenty of show for power and no tendency to restriction of movement. Chest strong and deep, back quarters and stiffles. Should show fully as much, if not more power than four quarters, and be capable of standing prolonged strains. Any tendency to weakness must be avoided. Ducking on the broad waters of the Chesapeake Bay involves at times facing a heavy tide and sea, and in cases of following wounded fowls, a dog is frequently subjected to a long swim. Legs, elbows, hocks, and feet. Legs should be short, showing both bone and muscle, with well-webbed feet of good size. Four legs rather straight and symmetrical. It is to be understood that short legs do not convey the idea of dumpy formation. Elbows well let down and set straight for development of easy movement. Stern should be stout, somewhat long, the straighter the better, and showing only moderate feather. Symmetry and quality. The Chesapeake Bay dog should show a bright, lively, intelligent expression with general outlines good at all points, in fact a dog worthy of notice in any company. Coat and texture. Short and thick, somewhat coarse, with tendency to wave over shoulders, back, and loins where it is longest nowhere over one 
and a quarter to one and a half inches long, that on flanks, legs, and belly shorter, tapering to quite short near the feet. Under all this is a short woolly fur, which should well cover the skin and can readily be observed by pressing aside the outer coat. This coat preserves the dog from the effects of the wet and cold and enables him to stand severe exposure. A shake or two throws off all water and is conducive to speed in swimming. Color, nearly resembling wet sedge grass, though towards spring it becomes lighter by exposure to weather. A small white spot or frill on the breast is admissible. Color is important as the dog in most cases is apt to be outside the blind, consequently too dark is objectionable, the deep liver of the spaniel making much greater contrast. Therefore it is to be avoided. The weight of dogs should be 60 to 70 pounds and bitches 45 to 55 pounds. The height should be about that of a medium-sized setter, but heavier in body and shorter in legs. The foregoing descriptive list and scale of points was drafted by a committee appointed by the American Kennel Club in the winter of 1884 and 85 for judging these dogs. While I do not agree with the committee in some few minor points, in general the list and scale are safe ones to follow. End of section 21. Reading by Tom Mack. Section 22 of the American Book of the Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Jones. The American Book of the Dog. G. O. Shields, Editor. Section 22. The Smooth Coated Fox Terrier by August Belmont, Jr. I have been earnestly and repeatedly requested by the editor of this book to write an article on the Fox Terrier. I declined at first for want of time, and because I felt that someone else might do the work in a more finished manner than I, and would gladly have persisted in this course, but was led to consider it my duty to undertake the task because I represent so important an interest in the breed, and because I desire to do everything possible to promote its growth in public favor. This beautiful species of terrier is, it must be admitted, better and more widely understood and appreciated at his home in England than here in America. On this side of the water his popularity has but just begun, and his early history has been more ably treated by English writers than it is possible for an American to treat it. It will therefore suffice for the purposes of this article to give a general sketch of the Fox Terrier's early history, which at best is somewhat vague a description of its characteristics, as condensed a review as possible of the principal strains, and a brief survey of what we possess here in America on which to found a worthy branch of a now magnificent breed in Great Britain. Terriers corresponding to the present Fox Terrier, both wire-haired and smooth, have undoubtedly existed for several centuries, although they were, as far as any allusion to them can be found in the works of early writers, on sporting matters, classed and spoken of under the general term of terrier, a corrupted word derived from their Latin appellation terrarius, indicating their propensity to hunt underground. The characteristics of the terrier whether of one species or another, were in the main the same as they are today, viz. a natural inclination to hunt and destroy vermin of any kind, pursuing it to its refuge wherever it be within the terrier's power to reach it. This trait, being accompanied by a sprightly and tense nervous nature, keen sense of hearing, quick vision, 
a most unerring nose, and an indomitable gameness. This last quality must not be misunderstood, as it often is when applied to this breed. Bulldog tenacity is not wanted in a dog bred and used for the purposes for which the fox terrier is most popular, and therefore should not be an attribute. Being intended to hunt with and for his master, he should be ready and eager to attack the object of the hunt, entering into its hiding place and indicating the locality by giving tongue or drawing out the game into the open. It is not desirable that he should close with and kill the game, as a bull terrier would do. Of course, the fox terrier will do this eventually, as he should as a last resort, or if urged to by its master. This style of hunting and fighting requires great dash, courage, and dexterity. In trying to succeed in this method of helping to secure the animal hunted, he is often compelled to receive more punishment than if his tactics were purely a light to kill. His nose is keener for general game than that of any other breed of terrier. He was often used by gamekeepers in bygone days, and even by some of them in modern times, to do the work of a spaniel. It is clearly established that in accordance with the special preferences of individual sportsmen in early times for hunting certain animals so they unquestionably selected bred and used in accordance with their size and make up the terriers best suited to each animal hunted from the fox and the otter down to the common rat for the fox therefore a dog about the size and general conformation of the fox terrier of today, weighing from sixteen to eighteen pounds, was undoubtedly employed, and old prints and paintings now and then met with illustrate terriers of this form in a moderately accurate way. As fox hunting came in vogue in England and grew in popularity, we find attached to the kennels terriers which are progenitors of the present fox terrier. They appear to have been bred, however, for use only, and aptitude for their work must have been paramount to beauty, as most old paintings and prints illustrating the bolting of foxes from their earth by dogs represent, as a rule, rather dark and not prettily marked terriers, often with prick ears. Here and there a clue is given by some author or artist to white and pied terriers, both smooth and rough-coated, but there is no such thing as an absolute and exact type traceable in a fox terrier, as is the case with greyhounds and different species of hounds used in the chase for centuries past. It will have to satisfy the fox terrier lover who desires to establish the claim of his pet breed to purity of blood, to say that the best foxhound kennels in the beginning of the century were possessed of good terriers, and are known to have given their breeding the most careful attention, so that when recourse was had to such kennels as the Grove, Belvoir, and Corn to the bill of the present breed of fox terriers upon, terriers were easily found in and about these kennels as true in type as the best of today, although perhaps not so perfect in the special points which breeding purely for the bench shows has since produced. During the early part of the century, the indications are that the terrier which accompanied the earth stopper or the pack was often dark in color. I have myself an old print of 1825 which I found at Oxford ten years ago representing Sir Tatton Sykes' hounds, drawing covert in the lower corner, is depicted the earth-stopper, spade in hand, watching the workings of the hounds with an excellent pale-colored black-and-tan terrier by his side. Good drop ears, straight legs, though apparently standing a little higher from the ground than is desirable at the present time. The history of the fox terrier resolves itself into three periods. The first, dating from about the 16th century to the end of the 18th, 
during which time we have evidence of his existence, along with the rest of the genus terrier, bred in the stable yard, and by gamekeepers as a rural plebeian master. Then the fox terrier graduates, and we read careful descriptions of him, and records of his having been bred with great care, but for work primarily, in connection with well-established and conducted packs of foxhounds in England, ranking as a necessary adjunct of the hunt, down to the middle of the present century, at this time the country was rapidly becoming more open, the pace growing very much faster, and the chase and preservation of the fox much more artificial. In consequence, the little fox terrier's vocation seems to be on the wane and his future in doubt. At the end of this, the second period of his history, we find him suddenly, about 1863, attracting the attention of the general public at the then budding dog shows of Birmingham, Leeds, Manchester, and other Midland and Northern cities. He is immediately taken up by the fancier, and from that time begins the third and great period of his history, with all its modern adjuncts, noble lineage, jealous and active competition among his patrons, research and study of the past for evidences of his royal blood, prominence in the sporting prints of the day, and later, journals and magazines, especially devoted to his interests. An insatiable demand springs up for him from every quarter, resulting in most princely prices being paid, and, last but not least, associations formed by men of means and prominence to intelligently perpetuate and improve his type. The fancier's first care was, naturally enough, directed to the typical kennel terrier of the day, keeping in view symmetry and the accepted features of his anatomy which his vocation and selection in breeding had produced. In the hands of breeders, in riders of good hunters, and the huntsmen and masters of crack packs of hounds, the fox terrier was in no small degree bred to agree in general conformation and type with both hunter and hound. The same hard and continuous work in all sorts of weather being required of all three. The earlier judges at the shows followed this idea, and the fanciers, through the Fox Terrier Club, later adopted a standard which confirms this, and which has been incorporated in the rules of the American Fox Terrier Club, and is today the standard according to which the Fox Terrier is judged at all shows in the United States and Great Britain. Some twelve years ago, a cloddy, shorthorn pattern of terrier found a passing support, but was soon dropped without greatly damaging the breed. Standard and Scale of Points of the American Fox Terrier Club Head and Ears 15 Stern 5 Neck 5 Legs and Feet 20 Shoulders and Chest 15 Coat 10 Back and loin, 10. Symmetry and character, 15. Hind quarters, 5. For a total of 100. Disqualifying points. 1. Nose, white, cherry, or spotted to a considerable extent with either of these colors. 2. Ears, prick, tulip, or rose. 3. Mouth much undershot or much overshot. The skull should be flat and moderately narrow, and gradually decreasing in width to the eyes. Not much should be apparent, but there should be more dip in the profile between the forehead and top jaw than is seen in the case of a greyhound. The cheeks must not be full. The ears should be V-shaped and small, of moderate thickness, and drooping forward close to the cheek, not hanging by the side of the head like a foxhound's. The jaw, upper and under, should be strong and muscular, should be of fair punishing strength, but not so in any way to resemble the greyhound or modern English terrier. 
there should not be much falling away below the eyes. This part of the head should, however, be moderately chiseled out, so as not to go down in a straight slope like a wedge. The nose, toward which the muzzle must gradually taper, should be black. The eyes and the rims should be dark in color, small and rather deep-set, full of fire, life, and intelligence. As early as possible, circular in shape. The teeth should be as nearly as possible level, i.e. the upper teeth on the outside of the lower teeth. The neck should be clean and muscular without throatiness, of fair length, and gradually widening to the shoulders. Shoulders should be long and sloping, well laid fine at the points, and clearly cut at the withers. Chest deep and not broad. Back should be short, straight, and strong, with no appearance of slackness. Loin should be powerful and very slightly arched. The fore ribs should be moderately arched, the back ribs deep and the dog should be well ribbed up. Hind quarters should be strong and muscular, quite free from droop or crouch, the thighs long and powerful, hocks near the ground, the dog standing well up on them like a foxhound, and not straight in the stifle. Stern should be set on rather high, and carried gaily, but not over the back or curled. It should be of good strength, anything approaching a pipe-stopper tail being especially objectionable. Legs viewed in any direction must be straight, showing little or no appearance of ankle in front. They should be strong in bone throughout, short and straight in pastern. Both fore and hind legs should be carried straight forward in traveling, the stifles not turning outward. The elbows should hang perpendicularly to the body, working free of the sides. Feet should be round, compact, and not large, the soles hard and tough, the toes moderately arched, and turned neither in nor out. Coat should be smooth, flat, but hard, dense, and abundant. The belly and underside of the thighs should not be bare. Color white should predominate. Brindle, red, or liver markings are objectionable. Otherwise this point is of little or no importance. Symmetry, size, and character. The dog must present a generally gay, lively, and active appearance. Bone and strength in small compass are essentials, but this must not be taken to mean that a fox terrier should be cloggy or in any way coarse speed and endurance must be looked to as well as power, and the symmetry of the foxhound taken as a model. The terrier, like the hound, must on no account be leggy, nor must he be too short in the leg. He should stand like a cleverly made hunter, covering a lot of ground, yet with a short back, as before stated. He will then attain the highest degree of propelling power together with the greatest length of stride that is compatible with the length of his body. Weight is not a certain criterion of a terrier's fitness for his work, general shape, size, and contour are the main points. And if a dog can gallop and stay and follow his fox up a drain, it matters little what his weight is to a pound or so, though, roughly speaking, it may be said that he should not scale over twenty pounds in show condition. Wire-haired Fox Terrier This variety of the breed should resemble the smooth sort in every respect except the coat, which should be broken. The harder and more wiry the texture of the coat is, the better. On no account should the dog look or feel woolly and there should be no silky hair about the pole or anywhere else. The coat should not be too long, so as to give the dog a shaggy appearance, but at the same time it should show a marked and distinct difference all over from the smooth species. 
The premier honors in the dog classes of the earliest shows were divided, in the main, between the four great terriers, Jock, Trap, Tartar, and Rattler. The first two became celebrated at stud, Jock succeeding principally through the female line, while Trap was successful through both male and female. Both Trap's and Jock's pedigrees are obscure, but their origin, as far as deciphered, points strongly to the Grove Kennels strain of terriers, and while white, with but little markings, it has always claimed the black and tan ran in their veins. The combination of these two great dogs gave to the fancy a host of terriers, which made their mark at stud and on the bench and which figure today in most of the pedigrees of the prize-winning strains. Tyrant, by Old Trap, out of Violet, by Old Jock, was the sire of Chance, who, bred to a daughter of Old Jock, gave to the terrier world Trixie, the dam of Brockenhurst Joe and Champion Olive, son and daughter of the Belgrave Joe, a Belvoir breed terrier, Brockenhurst Joe, who passed his last days in this country, more than any other dog is responsible through his son Brockenhurst Raleigh for the celebrated strain of the Messrs. Clark of Nottingham. It includes, among its enormous list of winners, Result, pronounced by competent judges as the best terrier of modern times. Champion Olive produced Pickle the Second who, while not a show terrier, was the sire of more successful brood bitches than any dog in the annals of fox terrier breeding. Olive was also the dam of Champion Spice, of whom more later. Jock's only descendants in the female line, which command our interest today, was through his grandson Jester the Second, the sire of many a good one. While the strain has rather poor, woolly coats and indifferent heads, it possesses great character, gameness, and excellent bone. Champion Bedlamite, the dam of Bacchanal, now the property of Mr. John A. Logan, Jr., of Youngstown, Ohio, is a daughter of Jester II's son, Joker. Bacchanal possesses probably the truest terrier character of any dog we have on this side of the Atlantic. Tartar, while successful in a measure as a sire, cannot be classed with the first two as a great progenitor of today's breed. Perhaps his best strain is the one which came through his son Trophy, the grandsire of Corinthian, a dog which produced so many good ones that his blood became at one time a very popular and successful one. They were noted for their rapid maturity, but as they advanced in years, tended to grow coarse and thick in the head. Most of their bench honors were acquired during their puppyhood and early maturity. Mr. Fred Hoy's champion valet, however, who is directly of this strain, and is now quite well along in his years, is a marked exception retaining his form wonderfully. His incurable and unaccountable impotence has been a very great loss to American breeders. The Tartars are all game as wildcats. Old Trophy, who passed his last days with Sir Bache Cunard's hounds in Leicestershire, sported but half a jaw, having lost the other half to a badger. Sir Bache told me that this dog remained unconquerably game to his last hour. I owned a lovely bitch, Nellie, whom I brought home in 1876 by Old Tartar, said to have been out of the Honorable T. W. Fitzwilliams Nettle. She bred me some extraordinarily game terriers to Bismarck, a son of the Marquis of Huntley's Bounce, he a son of Old Trap, and the grandsire of the peerless Buffett. She also bred me some good ones to a son of Hogniston Joe and Ferry, the dam of mixture, whom I got from Mr. Murchison in 1878. 
I have no more of this strain, and while not quite as good for the bench as my present prize winners, they were true terriers, and would be invaluable to me today to infuse great character and gameness in my kennels. From a bench show point of view, Tyke was undoubtedly Tartar's best son. He never did very much at stud, and owing to the line coats which appeared in this line of blood, there is a strong suspicion of a cross of bull terriers somewhere. Shovel, a son of Tartar's good son Trump's, is now in California, and possessing as he does an infusion of Belvoir blood, ought to do good service in improving the breed on the Pacific coast. Rattler, the fourth of the early great terriers mentioned above, represented nothing but a brilliant personal career. He was a failure at stud. His antecedents were cloudy, and yet he, for many years, was invincible on the bench. A strain which every breeder today cannot fail to wish to know about, considering its phenomenal success through such dogs as Splinter, and all of his famous sons, headed by Lucifer, and female descendants, headed by the great Vesuvian, and including champion Diana and Diadem, the last two having for some years figured as American matrons, is the Foiler strain. Its origin is principally from the Grove Terriers, Foiler being by Old Grip, a son of Grove Willie, out of Judy, one of Reverend Jack Russell's strain. The characteristics of the strain are excellent heads, legs, and feet. In the latter point, these terriers, as an average, excel all others. They are prone, however, to drooping quarters, hind dew claws, and, if bred in closely, large ears. The foilers are the most difficult of all to handle in breeding, but with care I prefer them to all others. They are well represented in this country by a number of stud dogs. Lucifer, Dusky Trap, and Splogger are direct descendants of the male line from the old dog. Perhaps the most important of all are the Belvoir Terriers. About sixteen years ago, Belgrave Joe began to attract attention as a sire, and from Mr. Luke Tanner's and Mr. Murchison's kennels came a host of winners. These terriers were essentially of the Belvoir kennel strain. Every pedigree today, whether of one family or another, is thoroughly saturated with this blood. Freer from bull cross than any others, it greatly changed the type of the winning terriers when widely introduced, and with this extraordinary ability to stand successful inbreeding, it may be said to have done more to disseminate a good average terrier than any other strain. It brought symmetry, character, and good coats, although more profuse than before, and it was not until the advent of Champion Spice, with his doubtful lineage on his dam's side, that a branch of the Belvoir strain, through him, went all to pieces as regards their jackets. The tremendous opportunities given this very good dog at stud resulted in a very few good ones. Mixture, Brockenhurst Spice, Earl Leicester, and Hysop were about the best. His blood, however, with careful handling, and tempered with that of strains of more fixity of type, helped produce Rachel, First Flight, syrup, raffle, chattox, and a host of others in the second, third, and fourth generations. Spice was brought to America in 1886 by Mr. Kelly of New York at the largest price ever paid by an American exhibitor. His career was very short. After doing but little service in the stud, he lost his life in a fight with one of Mr. Kelly's deer hounds within the year so that what spice blood we have in this country did not come to us directly from him. Earl Lecheser, his kennel companion, was disposed of in the same way by Mr. Kelly's Grecian Greyhound last year. Mixture is in Mr. John E. Thayer's kennels at Lancaster, Massachusetts, where he has done excellent service in the stud. Just at this moment, 
The strain is becoming of special interest. It is the buffer. Through his grandson Buff at one time much thought of, but of recent years little used and often much abused. The buffers were always accused of possessing a cross of beagle, which brought them heavy, listless ears and a want of true character. I must say my own experience with blood akin to it gave me some results of that very sort. Buffer was the son of the Marquis of Huntley's Bounce, and the dog I used with my tartar bitch Nelly, spoken of already in this article, was also a son of his, called Bismarck. Ten years ago, a friend of mine and I also tried inbreeding for three generations. The marked features above alluded to cropped out now and then, although I will acknowledge one dog, a real terrier, was a game big brute and weighed 33 pounds. Buffer produced Buffett, claimed by competent judges to have been the most perfectly built fox terrier that has to their knowledge existed. He sired little of great value outside of his famous son Buff. This white dog, possessing wonderful legs and feet, great character, and symmetry, had a very successful career on the bench, and was extensively used at stud. His gat was only fair, with the exception of two beautiful daughters, Bloom and Blossom. Buff was cursed with periodical attacks of eczema, and this with the fact that careless use of his blood and attempts at inbreeding brought out large ears and bad heads, soon caused his blood to be discarded for the more successful families that followed his period. Certainly what Buff produced for Mr. Lawrence to Jeopardy, and some other bitches in this country, was not good. I had a bitch inbred to him, with which I never succeeded in rearing a fit puppy to escape the stable pail. Messrs. Rutherford had a nice little son of Buff, called Naylor, who got some very neat terriers, such as they were in America at the time he figured on our benches. Mr. Gushing of Boston has, however, today a very useful dog by Buff out of jeopardy. If anyone desires the old dog's blood, I dare say his services might be obtained. True, Buff enters into the Clark strain through Rollick, but it only appears as a small and useful ingredient. Where, however, today we see this blood jump suddenly to the front is through Mrs. Vickery's kennels. It's crossed with the foilers through splinter, in his hands has given us Vesuvian and Venio. The extent to which the latter is being used at stud, and I hear with success, and the fact that I have four young sons of his out of Rachel coming on who are likely, or accidents, to disseminate the blood in this country, makes the study of this fortunate combination interesting. The simplest way is to give an extended pedigree of the cross, and by it will be seen how, through Foiler, on the sire, Vesuvian's side, a little brother of Lucifer's, the blood of Rollick predominates. Buff, on the dam Vanilla's side, appears through an inbred cross. To conclude the subject of the different strains of blood among fox terriers, I have selected the Clark or Brockenhurst Rally strain, because it is the most distinct in type, because it has in a given period produced more high-class bitch winners than any other, and because it furnishes the best example of a most carefully worked out instance of successful inbreeding known to fox terrier history. The Messrs. Clark, two brothers living in Nottingham, founded the family with practically three terriers, one dog, and two bitches. The dog was Brockenhurst Raleigh, an excellent son of Brockenhurst Joe and Moss the Second, a granddaughter of Old White Tyrant. The bitches were Jess, a daughter of Hazelhurst's Grip, he a son of Turk, out of Patch, a granddaughter of Old Trap, and Rollick, a daughter of Buff and Nectar the Second, by Old Foiler. 
Brockenhurst Rally was bred to both Jess and Rollick. The offspring of these two unions were bred together for several generations, and this crossing and recrossing the two precisely the same blood is what produced result, and all the terriers so closely related to him, including Royster, Regent, Reckoner, Rachel, Radiance, Reckon, Rational, Raffle, etc., which for the last six years have held almost undisputed sway on the English benches. It was but last year that they finally succumbed to Mr. Vickery's kennels. Although Russelly Toff, the best puppy of this year, and purchased by Mr. F. Redmond from his breeder Mr. F. W. F. Tomer of Swindon for two hundred guineas, is essentially of the Brockenhurst Rally family. Now and then an outcross was made, such as that to Hysop, the best-fronted son of Spice, from which came Heather Bell and Harmony, respectively, the dams of Rachel and Raffle, and to New Forest, the son of Splinter and Olive the Second, from which cross first flight was the fruit. Reckoner is also credited with one outcross in his grand dam Nell, a bitch of foiler and buff blood. In the main, however, the Clark Terriers trace to Brockenhurst Rally and the two bitches jess and rollick here there appears a complicated multi-page lineage chart the family tree of this breed it is undoubtedly brockenhurst rally's bevor blood as well as the care and intelligence of messer clark's handling which has permitted the inbreeding of these terriers to be so remarkably successful the striking features of the clark terriers are a tendency to uniformity in markings, all black, or black with very little tan markings on the head, predominating. White bodies, of course, or white bodies with black patches accompanying. A high average of well-carried and exceptionally small ears. A smooth outline, their muscles being beautifully distributed and showing no bossiness. Excellent coats, legs, and feet grand ribs and loin and they are from my own experience very game and good workers their peculiarities naturally appear persistently and are domed skulls shoulders not oblique enough and consequently a tendency to stand out at the elbows thereby sometimes in the judging ring throwing away well-deserved prizes before a judge fastidious on the question of narrow and straight fronts Returning to Russelly Toff, a dog I have not seen, but which my kennel manager, Mr. German Hopkins, saw when abroad last spring, and as carefully described to me, I should judge to be a dog with all the best features of the Clark Terriers, and with neither of their prominent faults. That is to say, domed skull or indifferent shoulders. Toff is a beautifully fronted dog. In fact, that would have to be the case for Mr. Redmond to own him, he being uncompromisingly wedded to that most important of all points in a fox terrier. Toff's outcross is, however, right back into the blood the Messrs. Clark drew from. He is by stipendiary, a son of Rachel's son Reckon, out of Shendy, a granddaughter on both sides of Belgrave Joe. His dam is by Regent, out of Rutty. Rutty is by Brockenhurst Joe, Raleigh's sire, out of a granddaughter of Champion Olive, the sister of Brockenhurst Joe. It will thus be seen that there is still reason to expect this great strain to hold its own in the front rank, although, as it is the world over, the latest champion is always the most popular. American breeders, while not having as yet produced a result or a Vesuvian, have really a most excellent collection of terriers to breed from, including practically every strain of consequence. The blood of Jock, Trap, and Tartar first came to us through the importation by Mr. Newbold Morris of a very fair terrier called Gamester in 1877. He produced quite a number of nice puppies at the time, but his blood has now 
quite disappeared from our benches. Nothing very serious was done in getting out high-class terriers until the Messrs. Lawrence of Groton, Massachusetts, and Messrs. Rutherford of Almachy, Warren County, New Jersey, began exhibiting about the year 1882. Mr. Lawrence bought Old Buff and Brockenhurst Joe, and some nice pictures, including Jeopardy and Deacon Rosie, from Mr. J. C. Ten. For three or four years, these terriers and their offspring adorned our benches, but unfortunately, Mr. Lawrence's kennels being far away from the principal breeders of the time, the old dogs received comparatively few outside bitches. When they died, four years ago, Mr. Lawrence, to the great regret of our fanciers, gave up active breeding. Messrs. Rutherford made some very useful importations beginning in 1881, including Old Bowstring by Turk, Swansden by Saracen, Old Champion Royal, and a number of crosses of Buff, among them Naylor by Buff, imported in utero, and later Old Viola, the granddam of their famous bitch Diana. The blood of the earlier importations has given away to the modern strains, with which they have liberally sprinkled their kennels. Diana, Splogger, Raffle, and Cornwall Duchess being the most prominent of their own, while they have availed themselves unstintingly of every stud dog accessible to them. In Swansden, by Saracen, a strain came to us which I have not mentioned, and which possesses some local interest for us, that is to say, the Turk. This dog, at one time quite popular in England, a son of old grip, and with probably a predominance of grove blood in him, got two sons, litter brothers, who were used considerably, Muslim and Saracen. The strain was noted for gameness. Muslim produced a coarse branch, while Saracen's get showed quality. A son of Moslem, Moslem the second, was brought to this country and received much unmerited puffing. He was a fair dog, of rather common mold. Fortunately for American breeders, his moderate career on our benches was short, and our breeders escaped his undesirable blood at stud. Swansden, by Saracen, on the other hand, bred to Brockenhurst Joe, produced Warren Lady, the dam of General Grant, a very credible terrier, in his early maturity. She was also the dam of a lively bitch, Lady Warren Mixture, by Mixture, which Mrs. Rutherford lost through distemper. Barring a delicate constitution, she was quite the prettiest quality bitch bred on this side. Mr. James Mortimer, of the Westminster Kennel Club, Babylon, Long Island, one of our best judges and a very successful breeder, from Swanston's blood got his excellent puppy, Suffolk, risk by raffle shortly after the importation of brockers joe and buff by mr lawrence mr john e thayer of lancaster massachusetts brought out the then famous richmond olive and rabby tyrant at the highest prices at that time paid by american breeders founding with these two terriers his celebrated hillside kennels of fox terriers they can hardly be said to represent a strain, they represent rather a combination of blood with which Mr. George Raber, a very clever breeder in England, had much success. But both Olive and Rabbi Tyrant seem to have failed to produce themselves or any very remarkable terriers on this side of the water. Mr. Thayer later added Mixture, Belgrave Primrose, Reckoner, and Richmond Dazzle to his kennels, amid a large draft from Mr. Fred Hoey's kennels. With this additional blood, Mr. Thayer is bringing out very creditable youngsters. Mr. Fred Hoey, whose kennels are at Hollywood, Long Branch, New Jersey, one of our good judges and a keen and intelligent breeder, has been very successful with a smaller kennel than those named above. From Lorette, a sister of Spice in Olive the Second, the dam of New Forest, 
he bred a lovely bitch mace the second to brockenhurst joe which unfortunately died of distemper after the boston show of eighteen eighty six most of his terriers have come from mr vickery's kennels including his famous valet his sire venetian and some recent importations of the strains closely related to the Suvian's blood mr edward kelly of new york the founder of our fox terrier club and a liberal importer of many good terriers of the belvoir strains has done much for our american fox terrier family of recent years he has not been as active owing to business cares absorbing his leisure the debt american breeders owe him must nevertheless not be forgotten mr clarence rathbone of albany must be counted as one of the faithful of the faithful his beverwick kennels of albany new york contain representatives of every known strain and in the hands of so enthusiastic and tireless a breeder a vast amount of good work is being done which should surely one of these days be crowned with the breeding of some clinkers with my own the blimpton kennels ends the list of our kennels of importance up to within two years since then enthusiastic breeders have started kennels of which much will be heard in the near future mr r s ryan of baltimore has drawn both from our best home kennels and also somewhat from abroad to found his linden kennels messrs granger and vanderpool's regent kennels in baltimore also give great promise active and keen their kennels are destined to be a creditable support to our leading shows a strong and enthusiastic combination has been formed by two young breeders of means mr moses taylor and mr james t burden jr of new york their kennels are known as the wooddale kennels at wooddale near troy on the hudson they spare neither time nor expense and will soon appear on our benches with good strings to compete with the old kennels who must now look to their laurels for all these newly organized kennels are on the right track as far as the blood they possess is concerned mr john a logan jr of youngstown ohio is another of our very best new breeders with his already wide experience with dogs and horses being an excellent sportsman and fond of the best of everything in quadrupeds his oriole kennels will certainly become familiar to every fox terrier lover in the country a very important importation has been made this year by mr h e astor carey of new york a new acquisition to the fancy he brought out first flight new forest best son a dog combining the splinter and spice cross with the clark strain also a full sister of champion rachel and one or two other excellent brood bitches mr carey's kennels cannot fail to meet with success with such blood to begin with on the pacific coast the fancy is represented by such breeders as mr j b martin san francisco california mr c a sumner los angeles california while throughout the country are scattered lovers of the breed a list of some of which i subjoin and all of which are doing their good work mr w t mcaleys philadelphia pennsylvania mr john wren springfield ohio mr lloyd banks new york city mr w h jokel jr new york city mr lewis a biddle philadelphia pennsylvania mr g s kissel morristown new jersey mr warham whitney rochester new york carl heimerley bay ridge long island new york our canadian cousins have for years had an excellent list of active and intelligent fanciers and in their kennels can be found the blood of their own valuable importations of prominent strains from england and from our best kennels in the united states such well-known breeders and exhibitors as mr richard gibson of delaware ontario messrs wheeler and davy of london ontario mr d s booth of brockville ontario and mr j k Macdonald of toronto need no praise from me 
it has frequently been claimed that show terriers are wanting in courage as compared with terriers of former days this is a common cant among sportsmen not interested in bench shows it is true that a terrier not trained for his work will frequently disappoint an owner just as a setter or pointer of the very best strain would disappoint a sportsman in the field if its natural instincts had not been cultivated by training in proof of the claim that there has been no deterioration in fox terriers if properly bred i received permission from mr royal p carroll of new york one of our well-known sportsmen who has just returned from the west to relate a little incident told him by mr beck son of senator beck of kentucky showing what fox terriers are capable of if put to the test mr beck who has a ranch near cheyenne wyoming some years ago purchased some of the blimpton kennels terriers from which he has since bred quite a pack mr beck was out with his terriers one day and ran across a good-sized cinnamon bear which the terriers promptly attacked of course it was out of the question that they should come out better than second best they made a very creditable fight however and were treated to a violent repulse which they succumbed to as reluctantly as the most exacting critic could wish end of section twenty two recording by william jones Section 23 of the American Book of the Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. The American Book of the Dog, G. O. Shields, Editor. Section 23, The Bedlington Terrier, by W. H. Russell. This dog first emerged from prehistoric obscurity in the county of Northumberland in the extreme north of England. A distinct breed of terrier native and peculiar to this district, he was known and appreciated there long before the era of dog shows, and since he has become more widely known and carefully bred, he has, with all his improvements, retained the typical characteristics which we find noted in the earliest descriptions of the best specimens and which mark him off from all other breeds of terriers. The earliest records and traditions we have treat of him as the associate of gypsies, rat catchers, traveling tinkers, and such people to whom he was a friend and guard, or an ally and companion in sport. However humble his patrons at that time may have been, they were of a class who thoroughly understood terrier sport, hunting with these dogs every animal in the country that wore fur. Mr. W. E. Alcock, the present able secretary of the Bedlington Terrier Club, in an article on this breed states that a famous Northumbrian piper, James Allen by name, who was born about 1720 in a gypsy camp in Rothbury Forest near the center of the county, has left testimony which has been published in his biography to the effect that his father and himself kept rough terriers. The father, William Allen, was much famed for his skill as an otter hunter and was much in request among the gentry as a man who could always show them good sport. The dogs that Allen used were called Rodberry, Rothberry terriers, and were the ancestors of the present day Bedlingtons. Some old fanciers claim that Rothberry is the proper name and that ought to have been retained. Two of the elder Allen's favorite dogs were Peachum and Pincher, names appearing among later dogs, and we find the name of Piper, derived from Piper Allen, born by the first Bedlington Terrier, so called. Pedigrees of known dogs of this breed are traced back to 1792 and 1782, but we have no good description of such dogs until those written in the early part of this century. We must remember that 100 years ago, terriers were known only as either rough or smooth, and generally speaking, we may say that the rough sorts were found where the climate and work were the most trying. They therefore come rightly by a reputation for being a tough, plucky, hard-bitten race. Their hard, weather-resisting coats 
enabling them to withstand the greatest amount of wear and tear, whether on land or in water. Although we do not know as much as we would like to about these early Rodberry Terriers, we do know the strain and its geographical situation. We know the character and physique of the Northumbrian man. He is stalwart and robust, seldom corpulent, is clean, thrifty, and plodding, honest and sincere, shrewd and independent. We find similar characteristics in his dogs, and we may depend upon his appreciation of such animals from the fact that the first of all dog shows was held in the Northumbrian city of Newcastle upon Tyne. This was in 1859. Subsequently, more important shows were held in the larger centers of Great Britain, but anyone looking about Newcastle and its neighborhood cannot fail to notice the keen interest taken in sport on every hand. In 1825, one Thomas Ainsley, a mason, who had bred a remarkably good terrier called Young Piper, and from whom many of the best dogs are descended, first gave the breed its present name, after a town some 13 miles north of Newcastle. Its present population is about 14,000, mostly outlying from the original village, which seems to retain its old-time simplicity. We have brief descriptions given in several articles on this terrier of the parents of young Piper. The sire, Anderson's Piper, was a slender-built dog, 15 inches high and weighing only 15 pounds. He was liver-colored, the hair being of a hard, linty texture, ears large hanging close to the cheek, and slightly feathered at the tips. The dam, which was brought from the town of Bedlington in 1820, was black with brindled legs and with a tuft of light-colored hair on the top of her head. She was 13 inches high and weighed 14 pounds. Thus we can see that 70 years ago at least, some of the important characteristics of the modern Bedlingtons were met with in their progenitors. To be a little fanciful, we may imagine that this breed evolved itself, or was developed in adaptation to its circumstances. The coat is less long and heavy than those of the rough terriers farther north, and the build is lighter, with more pace for perhaps mountainous regions, and longer bursts of speed. In fact, we find the miners of the great coal beds in this district using these terriers to run rabbits and seeking pace and therefore long legs in their dogs. When the Bedlingtons were first brought before the public, they were, in the most part, in the hands of these same miners. The demand for speed in coursing had caused the Bedlingtons to be given up in a measure for the Whippet and Greyhound, but he will always be remembered as having been the companion and pride and joy of the Gordy. However, our subject has other fanciers as well, who are more able and ready to show and carefully breed their dogs. Ten years ago, to be sure, the Bedlingtons had been seen and heard out of their home county, but were not much bred elsewhere. Now there are kennels of them all over England, from Devonshire far north into Scotland. The Bedlington Terrier Club has a good list of members well distributed over Great Britain and with two members on this continent. The English Kennel Club Stud Book records prizes given to Bedlingtons at Manchester in 1869, and prize winners are named at the succeeding large shows. On January 1, 1890, a dog show was held at Newcastle upon Tyne, in the same building as the first of all dog shows in 1859. The number of Bedlington entries was 83, the largest known. What crosses helped to produce the Bedlington as we now have him? Whether the otter hound contributed to his pendant ear and peaked skull, and the greyhound his elegant shape is not known. Exactly when and how the present type became inherent in the breed, we can only surmise. The underlying quality of the dog, which has in no wise been affected by any possible crossing in the remote past, is terrier. Everything that can be said in favor of the aboriginal rough terrier from which he is descended may be said of the Bedlington. The two names, Ainsley and Pickett, mark eras overlapping each other in history of our subject. There were known previous to 1825 and subsequently many other fanciers, only less prominent as such. Following are the points of the Bedlington Terrier as defined and adopted 
by the Bedlington Terrier Club. Skull. Narrow but deep and rounded, high at occiput, and covered with a nice silky tuft or top knot. Jaw. Long, tapering, sharp, and muscular. As little stop as possible between the eyes, so as to form nearly a line from the nose end along the joint of the skull to the occiput. The lips close-fitting and no flue. Eyes should be small and well sunk in head. The blues should have a dark eye. The blue and tan ditto with amber shade. Livers, sandies, etc. A light brown eye. Nose large, well angled. Blues and blue and tans should have black noses. Livers and sandies have flesh colored. Teeth. Level or pincer jawed. Ears. Moderately large, well forward, flat to the cheek. Thinly covered and tipped with fine silky hair. They should be filbert shaped. Legs of moderate length, not wide apart, straight and square set, and with good sized feet, which are rather long. Tail, thick at root, tapering to point, slightly feathered on the lower side, nine inches to eleven inches long, and scimitar shaped. Neck and shoulders. Neck long, deep at base, rising well from shoulders, which should be flat. Body. Long and well proportioned, flat ribbed and deep, not wide in chest, slightly arched back, well ribbed up, with light quarters. Coat. Hard with close bottom and not lying flat to sides. Color. Dark blue, blue and tan, liver, liver and tan, sandy, sandy and tan. Height. About 15 to 16 inches. Weight. Dogs about 24 pounds, bitches about 22 pounds. General appearance. He is a light made up, lathy dog, but not shelly. Pickett preferred the silky top knot to be darker than the rest of the coat, but later fanciers prefer the reverse. The muzzle should be rather narrow, but very deep. There should be no cheekiness, but the strong jaw muscles should be there all the same. The ears should hang low, leaving a clear outline of the head. The position and size of the eyes minimize the chance of damage to these organs. When not trimmed for a show, there is no deficiency on the neck of the protected hair needed by a real working terrier. Of the various genuine Bedlington colors, the blue-black has been of late years preferred, the livered colored dogs being but rarely seen at the shows and the other colors hardly at all. But there is at present a movement in England to bring in the livers again, and they, in fact, were in the old days of the fancy the favorites. Beauty is not usually claimed for Bedlingtons, but if we know how to look for it, I think we may see it on them, for if there is beauty in a Scotch deerhound, why not in what is nearly like it in miniature? The obstacle to beauty, I should say, is the coat. This has been greatly improved of late, and now it ought not to be either woolly or long, although hard the hairs should not be straight, but should stand almost on end each one separate and distinct, with a twist of its own, as if inclined to curl. Scattered over the body are hairs harder than the rest of the coat, which as a whole should be crisp to the touch, and neither hard nor silky. The coat should be about one and one-fourth inches long, although it is frequently seen as long as two inches, which, however, is too long, as it more readily carries dirt, and also conceals the animal's elegant contour. To avoid the latter, the old and long hairs are often removed for show purposes by hard combing and even plucking. How far this is justified will be discussed below. The coat from one and one-fourth to one and three-fourths inches long, hard with close bottom and not lying flat to the sides, is certainly an outdoor rural workman's jacket. Flat coats over two inches long on other breeds may be made ornamental, but the ideal coat of the Bedlington is to my mind faultless, all things considered. Hard it resists wet, and yet it is so short that coming from the water shaking himself and rolling on the bank, the dog is quickly dry. My own dogs with the run of a farm and a neighboring stream never need washing, 
and never have to be forbidden any part of the house because of the coat carrying dirt. The feet of any dog on a muddy day will mark a white bedspread, and the tidy American housewife, if there are any dogs about, usually shuts the door to the best parlor. Good specimens of this breed, I speak from personal experience, resemble one another even more mentally than they do physically. There is always the same alert interest in outdoor matters, with the ever-present penchant for hunting and excavating. These energies can, of course, be misdirected, and one's chickens or cats may become the unwilling object of the dog's pursuit, and if not watchful, one may even find the house walls undermined. Young dogs may, however, be easily taught to conduct themselves so as to meet with general approbation, even respecting their owner's flower beds. These dogs are happiest when taken for an outing with their master searching about at a gallop for anything that runs wild. I have seen a Bedlington stop a large snake and prevent its escape until having had his attention attracted the owner came up and relieved the dog of further responsibility. They readily learn to take to water with delight and do not heed cold or heat or length of road. In repose and indoors they usually seem dull, not being carpet nights naturally, and their coats may seem awry, not being shaken out as when at liberty. Seen in the snow of which they are very fond, the coat often looks like a beautiful suit of velvet. They have in good specimens something of the appearance of a thoroughbred racehorse, and when animated show a fiery energy that illumines them. It is this overflowing vitality and sporting instinct in the field that has such a charm for a man who loves what is all about him in nature, as she is found in the field, wood, and stream, and who appreciates a sympathetic canine friend. If the Bedlington is ugly, at least he is not so ugly that after his coat has been cared for, it is considered by his admirers necessary for him to be mutilated before putting on the show bench. The following well-written article, taken from the English St. James Gazette, is interesting as being an apparently unbiased witness, and as showing that some of the best blood has come to this country. The father alluded to is Sentinel, one of the best-headed dogs of his kind. He is described by that unerring judge of the breed, Mr. Charles H. Mason, in his Our Prize Dogs, Volume 1. Sentinel's pluck is testified to in the quotation, Two tall and burly men were shown into my study some time ago. Their names brought to me memories of wild moorland, of rough sport, over bleak salt marshes, but I could not guess their errand. The taller of the pair placed a basket on my table and said with gravity, We wanted a trip to London, so we thought we'd fetch him with us. We never trust one of the breed to no railway man. I then knew that one of the precious strain of terriers was to be mine, and I received the information with sober joy. Then spoke the broader of my visitors, His father's gone to America. We thought you would like a puppy of the old dogs. He was as game as they make them, and we brought you the best for a little present. The tall man unrolled a sheet that seemed to be dotted with characters that took the shape of a big triangular blotch. There's the pedigree and nothing better in England. The pedigree was indeed imposing. I found myself the proud possessor of a Blue Bedlington. Date of birth, July 18th. Marks, none. In the blood of this aristocrat mingled strains of Old Topsy, Heron's Bess, Piper, Tip, Shields Meg, and the records of these and other breedings wound from the base of the triangle to the apex, where was written the name of that heir of the ages who was in the basket. As the big man reverently laid his hands on the lid, he looked like a bishop about to perform a confirmation ceremony, and then the prize came to view. I am bound to say that a more sorry object never went on four legs. He staggered absurdly and hung his head as if he were under a sense of crime. His coat, 
so far from showing a shade of azure, was a mere rugged pelt of dark slate color, and a comic mustache of stiff bristles gave him somewhat the appearance of a barbel. The two giants gazed on the creature, and their look was one of pure rapture. Over two hundred miles the brute had been conveyed, and I knew that no higher honor could be offered to me by my good friends, so I resolved to bestow the utmost care on the scion of Topsy. He looked up at me for a moment, and then came to fawn on me in a reserved sort of way. Then I saw the gleam of his deep-set fiery eye, and somehow the impressions given by the whole carcass changed. The ladies of the house came to see my new friend, and their marked restraint increased my misgivings. The poor blue dog crept after them, one after the other, and seemed to crave forgiveness for his own ill-favored guise. But the feminine mind did not relent, and the polite words of commendation were uttered, I fear, as a matter of form. Then a rollicking bull-terrier puppy entered and proceeded to play. He rolled the blue over and enjoyed the fun very much, until he took the liberty of bestowing a nip. In an instant the ragged youngster was transformed. Without making a sound he fixed his grip and held on. The white puppy showed all the gallantry of his race, but he was soon in sore straits, and the tall man said, Just like the old dog, they're all the same. Better part them. The warriors were lifted up and separated. My vanity was sorely tried during my first public appearance with the blue puppy, but the ugliness wore off week by week. His limbs grew wiry and strong. His tail became so muscular that a tap from it was like the blow of a riding whip, and his head acquired a strange attractiveness. His early youth went pleasantly by, and as his character developed I found he was quiet and teachable, like all of his breed. His gravity deepened as his beauty became apparent, and even in his gallop over the fields he pounded along as if he were merely running for the good of his constitution and not out of light-heartedness. It is odd to see the dog's pride in his feats with vermin, and I fear that when we go into the country with its swarms of rats, his vanity will become excessive. End quote. There is a consensus among writers on the Bedlington that he is of the highest courage, and instances are adduced to show his desperate gameness. It is said when he first became generally known that he was quarrelsome. This has been repeatedly contradicted in print by good authorities. The idea may have arisen from the fact that he was kept by a certain class of men as a fighting dog, and because of his undoubted pluck. However, when not trained by this species of cannibalism, he has been found peaceable when abroad. He has spirit and energy which are most desirable, but they must be properly educated and directed. A brave man may be either a hero or a desperado. Being a dog capable of the strongest attachment to his master, he is likely to be blindly jealous and will bear no rival near the throne. At home he will usually not tolerate the intrusion of strange dogs. This can hardly be called a peculiarity of the Bedlington, dogs not being inclined as a rule to show hospitality to visitors of their own species. Sometimes in America the proud possessor of a well-bred Bedlington may be asked by some earnest inquirer or perhaps curious and utilitarian scoffer, what is he good for? To a true dog lover, his four-footed friend is something like a child in his affections, whether his usefulness is great or not. But the Bedlington can be a necessary part of an establishment. In the first place, he is eminently a man's dog, and although when kept in the house from youth as a pet, he loses his fire and restlessness. If he has had a chance to learn the taste of a sport, he will always be begging his master for a run. He is able to discharge the duties of a larger dog about a country place except in such instances as require bulk. If his size will not permit him to seize and hold an intruder, he can at least give the alarm, which enables his master to look into the matter for himself, and either supplement or restrain his guard as he may see fit. 
he has pace enough to keep up with the ordinary speed of a horse and is small enough to be taken into a vehicle and even given a place on the seat if desired. No rodent, Mephilitus America, mink, raccoon, or fox finds the neighborhood of his home a pleasant visiting place. He searches diligently above and below ground for these pests, and when he finds them, shows no quarter. This usefulness in the writer's experience, living on a forest farm by an Adirondack trout stream. This terrier will also act as an ordinary farm dog, helping with the cattle. I do not hear of terriers being used in shooting in this country, but Bedlikens are seen advertised in English papers as broken to the gun. Anyone breeding these dogs should, of course, be careful to have the parents of pure blood. Such are not difficult to procure now in America, and fair specimens may be obtained at modest prices. Selection in mating should be on the general principle of a sum of excellences in the two parents, a defect in one counterbalanced by a corresponding excellence in the other. That is, two animals, both of which are bad in head, body, or legs, or coat, should not be bred together. The tendency in such a case is to an exaggeration of the fault, whereby symmetry is destroyed and failure becomes sure. The more good qualities each parent possesses, the better, and the descent of being from equally good ancestors, the greater the chance of successful results. This principle being so well known, it will be necessary to speak of but one point more which is especially to be noticed about this breed. The coat should be bred hard. It may be fine, but not soft or silky, except the top knot and ear fringes. Neither should it be coarse or stiff, which indicates other than pure Bedlington breeding. When there is too great a tendency to softness of coat, a liver cross is recommended, and this is one reason why that colored dog should not be neglected. The first Bedlington I ever owned was bought by me in London of a man who kept this breed for hunting rabbits and who cared only for the working qualities, making no note of colors or pedigrees. One day he appeared at my lodgings on his bicycle, followed by three of these terriers, one of which he had caused to be sent from Yorkshire for me. The dog had been taken care of by a gamekeeper, and when I took him to Regent's Park, he ran to right and to left ahead of me, frequently looking back, would be guided by the direction in which I waved my hand. When so commanded, he came in to heel, which showed me that he could have been useful with a gun. He afterward, in New York, learned to retrieve, and if a lady dropped her handkerchief, would, at a sign from me, pick it up and offer it to her. Once I remember a little girl was so surprised by this apparent attention on his part that she said, Thank you, sir, which made the dog appear very human. However, dogs that are sharp at vermin generally do not retrieve well and need careful treatment to be taught. They will pick up an article but nip and drop it and look for something else. All terriers should be trained to run ahead and hunt and to come in to heal when required. If they do not know at least this much, they are likely to be a nuisance. By not punishing a dog when he comes to you, he will learn at a crossword to come to heel, where he can be well controlled and directed. When it is necessary to correct a small dog, run at him suddenly and fiercely. He will usually lie down, then stand over him and scold, but not loudly, perhaps pretending to beat him with a switch. He will then, if he understands, be glad to do as you wish him to do. Never give a command you cannot enforce. Firmness and consistency will train a dog better than to impress him by cruelty, besides developing his intelligence and affection. This is merely the common sense of dog training, which has been ably set forth by well-known writers. These dogs are most hardy. They may be kept where any livestock is kept, provided they have a dry bed, as in a barn in winter, or out of doors in summer. In fact, they are much better if not coddled. They should not be fed much meat unless they have a great deal of exercise. They are usually spare eaters and ought never to look fat. If a dog is active and his nose is moist and cold, he is doing well. 
They will be better if allowed great freedom. Much chaining is, of course, bad. Males, if shut up together, are prone to quarrel. As a rule, Bedlingtons will have few diseases if given plenty of air and exercise with a sufficiency of good food and clean water. It is only when kept confined in numbers that they fall into the hands of the physicians. They may then be treated according to the rules of dogs for their size. To show a Bedlington to advantage, some care is necessary, for he does not display in the ring such animation as he does out of doors at liberty. Therefore, he should be accustomed to the chain and to pleasant associations with it. If made a preliminary to an outing in the fields, he will learn not to consider it an unpleasant bondage, and will not droop as if the chain were used merely for purposes of confinement and punishment. After the first requisites health and well-developed and hard muscles comes the coat. The attention which it is customary to give to this before showing is one detriment to the dog's popularity. There are times when the natural coat is such that the dog needs no trimming to look his best. At other times, as the old hairs do not drop simultaneously, and as some remain irregularly here and there over the dog, light in color and long, they should be removed to give him a neat look. This may be done without objection with a fine tooth comb, but many people think it is fair to remove some hair by plucking. If any mark of such treatment is shown on the skin, disqualification is liable to follow. Honorable handlers will not, of course, cut or alter the color or texture of so much as a single hair. Whatever there is on the dog must be perfectly natural. Some fanciers, on the other hand, consider the least plucking dishonest and hold that if extensively resorted to, it enables a dog with an excessively long coat to compete advantageously with a naturally good and short-coated dog. This is no doubt true and presents the problem commented on as follows in the English Stock Keeper, October 18, 1889. Quote, the disqualifications and severe penalties for trimming that have fallen upon certain kennels again set us thinking of the necessity that exists for laying down clearly the limits of legitimate hairdressing in the rough-coated terriers. It is fair to remove old hairs and nothing more is the reply received when old exhibitors are asked for an opinion. But between you and me, and let us substitute our conscience for the lamp post. Who is to decide upon the age of the hairs that abound in places which are, in the opinion of the judge, not eligible sites for ground game? Of course, gentle reader, the tiny voice of conscience will be heard in your sensitive ears, ringing like a town crier's bell, and when it softly tinkles in the presence of the deaf, and somewhat deft as well, who will discern the moral slip of the finger and the thumb? We are open to conviction in any direction, but our opinion just now is that the present vague condemnation of the art puts a premium on skilled barbarity. Masters of the art will practice undetected and parade the ring with pride while the wretched, but no more guilty, initiate with the clumsy marks on his breast, will walk round in the fear of the judge. In the present stage of the matter, we are inclined to describe the Kennel Club Committee's penalties as being rather harsh, but we should be misunderstood if this opinion were construed into an expression of sympathy with the professional trimmers. Our sympathy is with the honorable and eminent members of the kennel world who have boldly entered the lists to unseat the knaves of the tonsure, while our inexpressible contempt is reserved for the champions of trimming and for those who sneered at the motives of the opponents of trimming." End quote. And also January 3, 1890. Quote, one of the most trying questions during the year that has just begun will be the great trimming puzzle, for it is a puzzle to know how much the kennel club or the judges will stand. The kennel club ought to solve the puzzle, of course. There is no doubt about that. But the committee fold their hands and shrug their shoulders and say, non posumus, we have tried. We did issue a circular asking exhibitors for information. The novices and the numbskulls replied most copiously and by return of post. But the rest, 
who from having been more than five minutes in the fancy knew something proved very bad correspondents the committee think they have done their best they are unable to define trimming interiors sufficiently just and comprehensive for the purposes of disqualification so they say we will ask men to judge these hairy breeds who are acquainted with the peculiar customs of the fancy and then we will ask them to tip us the wink if they see how it has been done this is a very comfortable temporary arrangement some of the judges have taken it to account most seriously and we expect to give our readers accounts of several causes celebre of this description in 1890. The honesty of motive shown here is beyond cavil. Still, as certain modifications of the natural animal are allowed, in the case of some other breeds of dogs, there may be another point of view that is not dishonest either. To win with Bedlingtons under the general run of judges, the coat must be made to look neat and not disguise the dog's good points of shape. If any trace of his improvement is found, scrutineers disregarding the customs of fanciers and judges of this breed think they have the grounds for disgracing both animal and owner, which does not encourage the taking up of this otherwise unexceptionable dog. If the judges would favor what have been called honest-coated dogs, and not be much influenced by the neatness that comes from excessively careful and skillful manipulation, it would tend to stimulate the breeding and showing of dogs with better natural coats. The latest dictum on this subject by the English Bedlington Terrier Club is to this effect. At a meeting of the above club held in Newcastle on January 7, 1880, it was voted unanimously, quote, that trimming Bedlington Terriers, that is, removing superfluous hair, be allowable and acknowledged, as it is not done to deceive, but to smarten the dog and show his shape and general contour, and that the Honorable Secretary be instructed to send a copy of the minutes of the meeting to the Kennel Club Committee, and request them to seriously consider the matter." End quote. By this energetic defense of trimming, the specialty club openly challenged the highest English tribunal, and the result is that we have the Kennel Club's definition of a limit to the practice. For at a meeting held February 4, 1890, it was, after some discussion, voted unanimously, quote, that the committee of the Kennel Club agree with the Bedlington Terrier Club that the removal of superfluous hair is allowable understanding by the words superfluous hair the old or dead coat any removal of the new coat or trimming of the head or ears they consider improper tampering End quote. with this decision it is believed that bedlington men in general will be satisfied but few bedlingtons have been shown in the united states as yet and they have been mostly imported specimens if they were shown in larger numbers so that the type could be more readily seen and appreciated, it would greatly help them in popularity. Now, in the poorly filled classes, they look like survivors of a nearly extinct race. They are not understood. However, there are opportunities afforded each year of showing under excellent judges. New faces appear from time to time on the show benches and testify to an appreciation among some few. If these dogs ever get a favorable start, I do not see why they may not become favorites in certain parts of the United States. They are especially adapted to our rigorous northern climate. They care so little for the luxuries of life that they thrive where some other dogs would not. So far, they have found the most favor in Canada. One of their best known advocates in that country is Mr. W. S. Jackson of Toronto and the blue dogs may be proud of their friend, as people who have had the pleasure of meeting him will understand. There is good Bedlington blood in British America, as far west as Victoria, Vancouver's Island, and as far east as Halifax, Nova Scotia. In the United States, it is scattered about north of the Mason and Dixon's line. End of chapter 23. Recording by Tom Mack.
Section 24 of the American Book of the Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The American Book of the Dog, G. O. Shields, Editor. Section 24 The Irish Terrier by Dr. J. S. Niven. Like all things Hibernian, the history of this dog is somewhat mixed. In fact, very little is known about it. From very old men with whom I talked twenty years ago, some of whom could recollect back sixty years or more, I have learned that terriers of a red or badger color were numerous in the days of their boyhood, and were largely used for all kinds of field sports, both on land and water. From what I could learn, these dogs were at that time of a much larger type than those bred nowadays. It is only within the last few years that any prominence has been given to the Irish Terrier by fanciers. Formerly they were kept for sport alone, and very little attention was paid to breeding for any special type, the object being simply to get good hard workers, which were able to endure a great amount of fatigue and exposure to severe weather. The principal uses to which these dogs were put in olden days were hunting the water rat in rivers, drawing badgers in the mountains, and killing rabbits as they were bolted by ferrets from the warrens. They were also used as watchdogs about the cotter houses of Ireland. About fifteen years ago the breed had become very much degenerated by the admixture of Scotch terriers, which were being largely imported into Ireland as ratters. The gentlemen who were chiefly interested in bringing the same breed of terriers up again to an established type were Messrs. Morton, Erwin, Ridgway, Montgomery, Jameson, Crosby, Smith, and Marks, and later Messrs. Krell, Despard, Graham, Pym, Carey, Waterhouse, and others. In rescuing the breed from utter destruction, these gentlemen used every means within their reach and have been well rewarded. Yet their work has not been done without the national characteristic of contrariness being strongly exhibited. A most bitter and still undecided controversy has been the consequence. The principal cause of all the trouble has been the anomalous decisions of the judges at the various bench shows. The question of size has been the bitterest one between the different factions. There can be no doubt that many of the finest and purest specimens of the breed were of large size, weighing 30 to 40 pounds and even more. But the desire of the most genuine fanciers of this breed has been to reduce the weight to 25 pounds and under. Another vexed question is that of cropping. And this subject had been coming up from time to time until in 1888, when the Irish Terrier Club passed a resolution emphatically condemning the custom. Consequently, the croppers are in high dudgeon, and it will take years yet of careful breeding to get the ears of the Irish Terrier to conform to the uniform drop of those of its contemporary, the Fox Terrier. At present, the anti-croppers have the best of the argument as far as usefulness and cruelty are concerned, but the advocates of cropping have some strong arguments on their side also, as only a small percentage of Irish Terriers as now bred are born with perfect ears and nothing is such an eyesore to a terrier man as a badly carried ear, which judicious cropping does away with in a great measure. The English Kennel Club has also taken this question up, and its latest decree is to the effect that all Irish terriers born after December 31st, 1889, must be shown uncropped at all shows held under their auspices. To show that there are still some of the large specimens, I copy the following from the Whispers of the Stock Keeper which may be attributed to the editor, Mr. Krell. It is one of our pet theories that the Irish Terrier, as he existed in the Emerald Isle, before the cunning hand of the exhibitor had been run over him, was the descendant of the Irish Wolfhound. We still consider a miniature Irish Wolfhound a good description of what we should like the Irish Terrier to be. Look at the picture of that grand old bitch Spuds in Stonehenge. There you have the Wolfhound head and outline. Spuds was a rare type. She had her faults, and we all know them, but her memory is more pleasant to our mind than the sight of the modern prize winners. To call the Irish Terriers of today miniature wolfhounds would be sarcastic. The majority of them are sour-faced, yellow-eyed, black-muzzled, chumpy-headed, and thickly built, 
and with bone enough for a Clydesdale horse. In fact, these overbred creatures are utterly unlike anything else so ugly as themselves. Of course, this is only our own simple and inexperienced opinion, which judges and connoisseurs of the breed are at liberty to dismiss with contempt. They may prefer the thick-legged clodhoppers. We still linger on the memory of the graceful and symmetrical terriers, rather light in build, and with only proportionate bone to carry their weight. Spuds and her kind, though, were already cultivated descendants of the big, rough, and shaggy dogs that the peasants kept for work. These Irish terriers were brimful of the splendid character that is attributed to the breed. There was a world of love in their expressive brown eyes. Their natures were gentle with children and women. In fact, so timid even did they appear that strangers have been misled into thinking them without courage. But what a mistake! The caress inviting and quiet creature in a moment, if a blow were aimed at its master, was transformed into a fury. We could tell some wonderful tales of the tractability, and the prowess, too, of the old sort, but we fear to grow garrulous on a favorite and much-loved theme. Our thoughts were led back to the old sort by the sight of a dog that Mr. Frank Aspinall, the brother of the Kennel Club secretary, lately brought to show us. This was one of them, and a fine wolfhound he would have made if he had continued to grow. He stood as high as a collie and looked to weigh fifty pounds or more. His coat was rough and hard. Each hair was wheaten from the body to the tip, which was red. The undercoat was woolly and dense. The head looked all of ten inches long, rather narrow across the skull, and the muzzle powerful. And when he opened his mouth and showed his graveyard, well, we felt relieved that we were not an Irish landlord. Mr. Aspinall told us his jaw power was enormous, and that he could pull up solid planks and bite through half-inch boards. More joy that we are not a half-inch board. But to return to our Irishman, and by the way, we should say that this dog looked Irish, and we like to see character in a national dog. Mr. Aspinall told us that he purchased him from a Waterford man who said he came from Connemara on the west coast. Mr. Aspinall told us several instances of his staunchness. He has seen him swim a mile in a fast and swollen stream, which was thick with floating logs, and as he swam, turning from one bank to the other, after the rats that shot in and out. The history of the present Irish Terrier may be said to date from 1875, several dogs having that year been exhibited at Belfast, Ireland, the home of Mr. G. Jamison. The first Irish Terriers that were ever exhibited in England were at the Brighton Show in October 1876, Banshee and Spuds, owned by Mr. Jamison, winning first and second. Since then, the class of Irish Terriers has increased so much that they almost equal in numbers the Fox Terrier, and surpass the Scotch Terrier classes, showing how popular the breed has become in a few years. The Irish Terrier Club was formed in Ireland about the beginning of 1879, and since that date the Irish have been well represented, both on the bench and in the public press. Vero Shaw has devoted more attention to this breed than any other modern writer, and little more can be said of it than is found in his works. The information he gives was obtained principally from Mr. G. H. Krell, one of the most enthusiastic admirers of the breed. The Irish Terrier is a true and distinct breed indigenous to Ireland, and no man can trace its origin which is lost in antiquity. Mr. Ridgway of Waterford, whose name is familiar in Irish Terrier circles from having drawn up the first code of points, states that they have been known in Ireland as long as that country has been an island, and I ground my faith in their age and purity on the fact that there exist old manuscripts in Irish, mentioning the existence of the breed at a very remote period. In old pictures representing scenes of Irish life, an Irish Terrier or two are often to be descried. Ballymena and County Wicklow may almost claim to be the birthplaces of the breed. Most of the best specimens hail from Ballymena and the neighborhood, where Mr. Thomas Irwin, of Irish Setter fame, boasts an extensive experience of this breed, and has always kept a few of the right old working sort for sporting purposes. And in County Wicklow, Mr. Murray says, it is well known that the pure breed of Irish Terriers has been carefully kept distinct and highly prized for more than a century. Mr. E. F. Despard, whose name is well known in Irish Terrier circles as a very successful breeder and exhibitor, 
claims an acquaintance of over 40 years with the breed. Mr. George Jamison, too, has known and kept them many years, and up till a little while ago had won more prizes than all the rest of the breeders put together. I mention these proofs of the age of the breed to show those who have lately come to admire them that it is not a made-up composite or mushroom breed. They are part of Ireland's national economy and are worthily embodied in the sportsman's toast, Irish women, Irish horses, and Irish dogs, which means Irish terriers, setters, and spaniels. One's first acquaintance with this prehistoric terrier is apt to be disappointing, except to a really doggy terrier man. That is because there is no meretricious flash about them. But there is that about them which you learn to like. They grow upon you. They supply the want so often expressed for a smart-looking dog with something in him. There is that about their rough and ready appearance, which can only be described as genuine terrier, or more emphatically, terrier character. They are facile princeps the sportsman's terrier, and having never yet been made fashion's darlings, still retain in all its purity their instinctive love of hard work. Their characters do not suit them for ladies' pets, but render them the best dogs out for the man that loves his gun and quiet sport. Amongst the wise old fellows that one comes across in the country, who like a dog with something in him, and a terrier, of course, the Irishman is prime favorite. And they know what they are about, those old fellows, and are sportsmen too, in their own sort of way, when the sun has gone down. This reminds me of a discreditable fact in the history of Irish terriers, that they were not always only the poor man's sentinel, but oftentimes something more, when, by the aid of their marvelous noses and long legs, they, when the shades of night had fallen, provided the pot with that which gave forth the savory smell and imparted a flavor to the spuds. This, however, if it injured their moral principles, certainly sustained their love and capability for rabbiting. In olden times, too, the larger sizes were bred and used for fighting, and there is still a dash of the old fighting blood in their descendants. They dearly love a mill, and though it would be calumny to say that they are quarrelsome, yet it must be admitted that the male portion of the breed are perhaps a little too ready to resent any attempt at interfering with their coats. But are they not Irish? And when did an Irishman shirk a shindy? My dog Sporter is very true to character in this respect. Small dogs, or even those of his own size, he never deigns to notice. But if some large specimen of the genus Canis approaches him, putting on side and airs, Sporter immediately stiffens up visibly. His tail assumes a defiant angle above the horizontal, his ears are cocked forward alertly, and there is an ominous twitching of his upper lips, which says, as plain as looks can speak, Leave me alone, ye spalpeen. Should his warning not be accepted, a scrimmage ensues, which I speedily terminate by whipping him up under my arm by his tail and marching him off. En passant, I recommend this as a very effectual and safe manner of putting a stop to a canine melee. Hitting off Irish terriers when fighting I have found useless. They think the pain comes from their opponent, and this only serves to rouse them to fresh efforts. This description, although written several years ago, is still held to be correct, and nothing need be added to it. All that the Irish terrier breeders now have to bewail, and the Irish always have a grievance of some kind, is the want of judges who will adhere to some one type. I was told not long since, by one of the most prominent exhibitors in England, that all he needed to know before exhibiting at a show, in order to take a prize, was the name of the judge, and that he could then choose from his kennel the dog that would be sure to win. This must be very nearly correct, as I see his name often, and always among the first flight. This is not right, and as the Irish Terrier Club has adopted a standard which is accepted by all the most prominent breeders, it ought to be adhered to. The standard being established, all that is necessary is for judges to abide by it and disqualify all dogs that go over the recognized weight of 24 pounds. If this were done, and the cropping question permanently disposed of, there would then be a bright future for the Irish Terrier and his breeder. The Irish Terrier now stands third or fourth in numbers at all shows in England and Ireland, being outnumbered only by Fox Terriers, Collies, and St. Bernard's. This is a good showing, considering how short a time the modern Irish Terrier has been before the public. The illustrations which accompany this article are for the information of breeders and the public. Nora represents the old type. 
She is built on the lines of the Irish wolfhound, and her weight was 22 pounds when in condition. The same model could have carried very well 30 to 40 pounds, but her day is past, and the Irish Terrier of today is modeled after the second illustration, which represents a dog that weighed about 20 pounds. From his shape and build, it is clearly impossible that a dog of his type would be of any use at much over that weight, being lower on legs and shorter ribbed. If he were heavy, he could not get over the ground as easily as a lighter built dog. Perhaps the best all-round dog that has been before the public lately is Playday, whose death we have lately seen recorded. He was the first uncropped dog that was ever awarded a prize, and was successful under almost all the judges at the English shows. He is proving himself a typical dog, although as an immediate sire he has not made a good record, but his grandsons and granddaughters are coming well to the front. There is one point that cannot be passed over in favor of the Irish Terrier, and that is his ability to adapt himself to any climate or any surroundings. In this respect he is a long way ahead of either the Fox Terrier or the Scotch Terrier. He is daily in request for India, China, and the Antipodes, where the other breeds fail to acclimatize. He is just as happy in the closed-up den of the peasant as he is in the kennel of the millionaire. He is, par excellence, the dog of the people. In this connection, the notes of Mr. Ridgway and Mr. Jamison, both prominent Irish fanciers of the breeding question, are well worthy of study, and are given below, as well as the scale of points which has been adopted by the Irish Terrier Club, and is now accepted by all breeders. Mr. Ridgway says that the Irish Terrier is and has been a pure breed of dogs indigenous to Ireland is a fact undoubted and undisputed by the oldest fanciers and breeders still living, who can well remember the dog fifty or sixty years ago, and at a time before the introduction to this country of the Skye, Yorkshire, or English Bull Terrier, now so fashionable in many parts. No doubt this breed has of late years been allowed to degenerate sadly from want of proper interest having been taken in it. But notwithstanding this, we can still bring forward specimens of our Irish Terriers, such as have been seen at several of our leading Irish shows, which, for usefulness, intelligence, and gameness, as well as general appearance, are second to no breed of Terriers in the kingdom. As a breed, they are peculiarly adapted to the country, being particularly hardy, and able to bear any amount of wet, cold, and hardship without showing the slightest symptoms of fatigue. Their coat also being a hard and wiry one, they can hunt the thickest gorse or furs cover without the slightest inconvenience. As for the capabilities of these dogs for taking the water, and hunting in it as well as on land, I may mention, as one instance, that a gentleman in the adjoining county of Tipperary keeps a pack of these terriers, and has done so for years, with which he will hunt otters as successfully as anyone can with any pack of pure otter hounds. Within the last few years, and since the introduction of dog shows into Ireland, a far greater interest than heretofore has been taken in this breed, and consequently a greater amount of care is evinced now in selecting the proper specimens to breed from so that in a short time we may look forward to see the Irish Terrier just as fashionable and as much sought for in England as the English Fox Terrier is at present. Mr. Jamison says, The Irish Terrier, as his name denotes, is the representative of the Emerald Isle, and especially suitable for his native damp country, being able to stand much more wet, cold, and fatigue than most other terriers. The coat is so hard and flat on the body that water cannot penetrate it, and not being too long does not hinder the dog in cover work. This breed is more used as vermin destroyers than for any other purpose, which principally accounts for breeding for size being neglected. However, within the last 15 years, the breed has been much closer looked after, and at the present time, there are a number of these dogs that in point of show qualities will vie as near perfection as most breeds. There are certain enthusiasts who have been writing this breed up in fancier papers as the only genuine working terrier. This, of course, is nonsense. At the same time, it is a recognized fact that from their peculiar hardy active habits, they at least are deserving of a front rank among working terriers. The Irish Terrier Club has recently been the means of the breed being brought something more prominently before the public but some of the prominent members will require to exercise a little more patience and forbearance, 
or the object of the club will be frustrated the irish terrier club's scale of points and description of the true irish terrier are here given positive points head jaw teeth and eyes value fifteen ears five legs and feet ten neck five shoulders and chest ten back and loin ten hind quarters and stern ten coat fifteen color ten size and symmetry ten total one hundred negative points white nails toes and feet value minus ten much white on chest minus ten ears cropped minus five mouth undershot or cankered minus ten coat shaggy curly or soft minus ten uneven in color minus five total fifty disqualifying points nose cherry or red brindle color head long skull flat and rather narrow between ears getting slightly narrower toward the eyes free from wrinkle stop hardly visible except in profile the jaw must be strong and muscular but not too full in the cheek and of a good punishing length but not so fine as a white english terrier's there should be a slight falling away below the eye so as not to have a greyhound appearance hair on face of the same description as on body but short about a quarter of an inch long in appearance almost smooth and straight a slight beard is the only longish hair and it is only long in comparison with the rest that is permissible and that is characteristic teeth should be strong and level lips not so tight as a bull terrier's but well fitting showing through the hair their black lining nose must be black eyes a dark hazel color small not prominent and full of life fire and intelligence ears when uncut small and v-shaped of moderate thickness set well up on head and dropping forward closely to the cheek the ear must be free of fringe and the hair thereon shorter and generally darker in color than the body neck should be of a fair length and gradually widening towards the shoulders well carried and free of throatiness there is generally a slight sort of frill visible at each side of the neck running nearly to the corner of the ear which is looked on as very characteristic shoulders and chest shoulders must be fine long and sloping well into the back the chest deep and muscular but neither full nor wide back and loin body moderately long back should be strong and straight with no appearance of slackness behind the shoulders the loin broad and powerful and slightly arched ribs fairly sprung rather deep than round and well ribbed back hindquarters well under the dog should be strong and muscular the thighs powerful hocks near the ground stifles not much bent stern generally docked should be free of fringe or feather set on pretty high carried gaily but not over the back or curled feet and legs feet should be strong tolerably round and moderately small toes arched and neither turned out nor in black toenails are preferable and most desirable legs moderately long well set from the shoulders perfectly straight with plenty of bone and muscle the elbows working free clear of the sides pasterns short and straight hardly noticeable both fore and hind legs should be moved straight forward when traveling the stifles not turned outward the legs free of feather and covered like the head with as hard a texture of coat as body but not so long coat hard and wiry free of softness or silkiness not so long as to hide the outlines of the body particularly in the hind quarters straight and flat no shagginess and free of lock or curl color should be whole colored the most preferable being bright red next wheaten yellow and gray brindle disqualifying white sometimes appears on chest and feet it is more objectionable on the latter than on the chest as a speck of white on chest is frequently to be seen in all self-colored breeds size and symmetry weight in show condition from sixteen pounds to twenty four pounds say sixteen pounds to twenty two pounds for bitches and eighteen pounds to twenty four pounds for dogs the most desirable weight is twenty two pounds or under which is a nice stylish and useful size 
the dog must present an active lively lithe and wiry appearance lots of substance at the same time free of clumsiness as speed and endurance as well as power are very essential they must be neither cloddy nor cobby but should be framed on the lines of speed showing a graceful racing outline temperament dogs that are very game are usually surly or snappish the irish terrier as a breed is an exception being remarkably good-tempered notably so with mankind it being admitted however that he is perhaps a little too ready to resent interference on the part of other dogs there is a heedless reckless pluck about the irish terrier which is characteristic and coupled with the headlong dash blind to all consequences with which he rushes at his adversary has earned for the breed the proud epithet of the daredevils when off duty they are characterized by a quiet caress inviting appearance and when one sees them endearingly timidly pushing their heads into their master's hands it is difficult to realize that on occasion at the set on they can prove they have the courage of a lion and will fight on to the last breath in their bodies they develop an extraordinary devotion to and have been known to track their masters almost incredible distances as a matter of information for those interested i give below the names and addresses of a few of the prominent breeders and owners of irish terriers in this country chestnut hill kennels philadelphia pennsylvania j f mcfadden 121 chestnut street philadelphia pennsylvania thomas pulverstaft 47 sands street brooklyn new york f p kirby 135 south 8th street philadelphia pennsylvania e wetmore 343 lexington avenue new york city associated fanciers 140 south 8th street philadelphia pennsylvania ogden golet 608 fifth avenue new york city somerset kennels bernardsville new jersey w j comstock 220 canal street providence rhode island w s clark linden massachusetts h denning 474 sixth avenue new york city p f clancy 440 Second Street, South Boston, Massachusetts. Charles F. Leland, 7 Beck Hall, Cambridge, Massachusetts. W. L. and H. A. Harris, North Wilmington, Massachusetts. Edward Lever, 707 Walnut Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. E. P. Saltonstall, Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts. William A. Dupuy, Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts. Lawrence Timpson, Red Hook, New Jersey, H. A. Allen, Montreal, Canada, and Joseph Lindsay, Montreal, Canada. End of section twenty four. Recording by Colleen McMahon.